I only have one message to give you. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what you call me. I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. Across America and around the world, you're listening to the Hour of the Charm. I'm your host, William Cooper. Tonight's guest is A. Ralph Epperson, author of The Unseen Hand, The New World Order, and producer of several videotapes on the conspiratorial view of history. Don't go away, folks. You don't want to miss one single word of tonight's episode of The Hour of the Time. I'm very pleased, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome tonight to the Hour of the Time a dear friend, a close acquaintance, a, uh, what do you call it, a fellow warrior on the battlefield between the forces of light and darkness, and of course, if you know the truth about it, one thinks uh, one is light when it's really dark, and the other one thinks one is dark when it's really light, and everything is topsy-turvy in this battle. It's difficult to tell who the enemy is. Uh, welcome. Mr. Ralph Epperson. <laughs> what are you saying? Which side do you think I'm on, Bill Cooper? Well, I'm not sure which side <laughs> any of us are on from the one given moment to the next. Uh, and it's, it's difficult. I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, I'm on the side of light, the side of the true light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, but doesn't the other side think that they're the oh, light? I can't disagree. That's what we do. <laughs> that's correct. That's, as you point out, that's correct. Ralph, give us uh, some background. Who are you? Where do you come from? How did you get into this? Uh, what are you doing in this? show, uh, how, how did you get from point A, which is complete, uh, utter disbelief that anything like this could ever be real, to now uh, marching out here on the battlefield with many uh, others who have found that it's not only real, but it's imminent? Well, Bill, I don't have a, a real uh, luster story to tell you, but I'll tell you what, I, what did happen. Uh, I'm a college graduate, I went to the University of Arizona, and after completion of my a bachelor's degree, I went to California, and I thought that I had been educated properly, so I felt quite confident in my future, but I didn't know how to vote in the uh, California elections coming from Arizona, so I decided to join the thing called the Young Republicans. I was young, and I was a quote, a Republican. I walked in the door and told them that I was there to learn uh, how to, uh, to vote properly, and a young man by the name of Jim, and I've written about him in both of my books, came to me and said, Ralph, you not only have to learn that, but you've got to read what he called revisionist history. And I didn't know what that meant. And you were, you were a historian, is that right? Well, not at that time I wasn't. No, I was just a college graduate. So I said, Jim, you're talking to the wrong man. I hate to read. He said, Ralph, you've got to read revisionist history. I don't know what that is. He said, that's my point. So that's what started me. In 1963, I started reading, and I've read, uh, like you have, volumes and volumes to the point where I've got libraries that I can't even count anymore. Uh, but I started reading, and as I read, I discovered the footprints of, uh, of a conspiracy. Uh, I had never heard that there was anything, even laughingly, in college. The, my professors never even said, once that I can remember, uh, there's a group of people who believe that uh, this version of history we're going to teach you is not true. They call themselves revisionists. Uh, that wasn't even laughingly uh, admitted in my college career, so this was all brand new to me. But the, and the interesting about it is, as I read, I found their footprints. For some reason, they've made it available to us, and I just kept reading. I learned in college how to underline uh, my, my books, and I did that, and then I uh, stored them in my library. And uh, the next step was someone said, uh, come and lecture to a class or a Kiwanis club or a Rotary or whatever it was. So I did that next, and then uh, someone recommended I speak to their class in the community college. I did that, and then the next thing was I was teaching part-time in the Northwest and around Portland, uh, Oregon. And that's what got me started, because that's that's then you had to put in writing what you believed in, so that's what I did. But I uh, I decided that since I couldn't explain these things, I would use the uh, the writings of those who could. So whenever I lectured then, as I do today, I use their writings. I don't use my own, and I take them and uh, uh, their material and their information and put it in a lecture form. And then those notes later became the unseen hand. My first book that came out in 1985. So that's about it. That's the, there, there was no knowledge about this at all. I wasn't on the search for it. 
Uh, I just I stumbled into it, and I'm grateful that I did because I know that I'm right. So your friend actually got you to uh, to looking in this direction. That's correct. And you probably didn't know what you were looking for. That's exactly correct. Because in, in 1963, there was very little information on this subject. The first book that I read was the uh, bestseller called uh, the uh, None Dare Call It Treason, as I remember, by John Stormer. That was the first one. And when I read that book, I realized the man was right. It was just, you don't have to hit me uh, with the shovel to make me understand, to see the truth. I read that book and knew he was right. And that's what started it. I read that book first. Now, there, if you're like me and, and many other people, uh, you, at first, you know, I, I said, if anybody came to me and talked about anything, like what listeners hear on this show, uh, I would have said, uh, hey, you're nuts, get away from me, I don't want to talk to you anymore, until I came across something that I absolutely couldn't deny. I mean, it hit me in the face, and this happened to me while I was a member of the Office of Naval Intelligence, and I knew that this information was true, and I also knew that uh, the rest of the world didn't know anything about it. Uh, what was it that, that, that hit you in the face like that? Well, it was just, it was just his, 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 the rendition of what he was explaining. It made sense. It fit. Uh, I didn't like to admit it. I had to come to grips with it. That's the first thing we had to discover. But I realized that this man, uh, John Strummer, and his uh, version of the history was correct. I just knew it. And then I read The Politician by Robert Welch. That got me mad. Uh-huh. When I read that book, I remember... Uh, even today, uh, gritting my teeth in anger when I realized what Dwight Eisenhower had done uh, to the American people and the American fighting men during World War II. And that's probably the book that got me started because when I realized that uh, that uh, Robert Welch was right in his uh, statements about Dwight Eisenhower and that we did not believe those statements to be true, I knew that was on the right track. Uh, now, for me, that was the hardest thing to do, was to confront the reality of what it was that I was learning and be able to look myself in the mirror and admit that I had really been ignorant and basically very stupid most of my life, and then it was time to change that. Yes. Was that difficult for you to... Uh, Bill, there's no question. That is a major obstacle all of us have to face, because it, it, you have to admit that you've been lied to and duped, and that you've accepted it. You didn't question and that's where we all are. We've all got to come to that point, and that's where a lot of us lose because we do not uh, come to that point, and when we do, we won't accept it. We won't admit that we've been lied to and that we've accepted the lie. And folks, uh, I know that many of you out there have uh, have met this head on and dealt with it. I also know that there are many of you out there sitting in your living rooms listening to us who have not and, and may never. And uh, you sort of look on this show when you listen to it as, uh, as in your mind, really knowing that what we're telling you is true, but not willing to admit it to yourself or your neighbors. And so treating it more or less as entertainment. Uh, one of these days, something is going to happen to you, like happened to Ralph and I, and uh, you're going to have to make a decision. You're at the you're at the the Y in the road, and you're going to have to take the left fork or the right fork. And believe me, everybody is going to have to make that choice. Um, and and you better get used to that right now. The more you listen to the show, the easier that choice is going to be. I believe I could be wrong, but I believe that, that that's the way it's going to happen. Well, that's what we all are, Bill. We the, this is it's awful hard to believe that the people that we know uh, as our elected leaders are leading us into trouble. That's hard to believe. The average American doesn't want to believe that. See, the bad guy was always over there in Europe someplace. But when you start thinking the bad guy's in our government and that you voted for him, that, that's a tough decision to uh, deal with, a tough uh, problem. So we've got to face that. I faced it. I came to the grips with it. And I now understand exactly what American history is and where we're going. And where do you think that is, Ralph? Well, I, I decided that after I wrote my book, The Unseen Hand, in 1985, I did not know the motive of this uh, this conspiracy that I had proven to be true in my 20-some years of research for my first book. So I decided to find the evidence of that conspiracy. Where, not only the evidence, but the, the motive. Where were we going? What was the plan? What's our future? And I found it, and I wrote my book called The New World Order in 1990. That's our future. That's where we're going. That's what these people want. They want a new world order, and this, uh, a lot of people think that George Bush coined that phrase. Those of us who study this knows that that phrase goes all the way back. Napoleon talked about it. Hitler talked about it. 
um, a, a lot of people throughout history have talked about it. And there has been throughout history generally a sort of loose-knit plan that they follow. The plan changes with the times and the obstacles they run into. But they've had this goal for literally centuries, maybe thousands of years. That's correct. That's what I tried to prove in my book, The uh, New World Order. This thing that goes back 6,000 years, I found that in their own literature. The one thing that I tried to do, and I'm sure you do the same thing, Bill, is that we can find their footprints in their own material. For some reason, they've made it available to us. It takes a little while to dig it and find it, but it is there. They put their footprints in the sand, as I call it. All we've got to do is find out that out and then go on the trail. It's there. Once you find it, you know where we've been and you know where we're going. That's correct. Uh, when you first began to study this, what was the uh, what, what was your idea then of what was happening? Oh, it was very very limited, very meager. Uh, obviously, I felt that there were people, just people like White Eisner, maybe had a little different version of uh, what we should do, and that he was the one that did these things. And then you start connecting him to uh, to others who had similar views. Uh, then you start to see a trend developing between presidents. Then you start to see a trend developing be behind the, uh, the presidents, meaning the people who put the presidents in office. And once you start connecting that power with the elected official that we see up front, then you start developing the theory of conspiracy. Because the conspiracy, as you know, Bill, and your listeners probably know, by definition, is two or more people working in secret for an evil purpose. And so once you find the, the footprints leading you to the the people behind the power, then you're on the right track. Then you know where you're going. That's correct. Uh, now, I reached a point in my research and in my studies where I had to step back and say, wait a minute, this is ridiculous because I know all these people are involved, uh, but I can't find any instance where they all meet together where they can sit down and plan this. So there has to be something underlying that I didn't understand that connects all these people together and allows them to conspire together without actually going someplace and having a great big convention. But, you see, this is the problem with trying to find out how to <laughs> develop the information on a conspiracy. By definition, they operate in secret. And it's a commonly asked question. I know you get the question as much as I do, is how do you know it's real if it's a conspiracy? That's the problem. But for some reason, and it's, it's something that I know you know, I I know any of your listeners know who've been researching this, they put their footprints in the sand. Now, many times you don't know who they are, but you can find the evidence that they've walked there. You can find the footprint. And once you find it and you, you notice where it's going and where it's been, then you know you're, you're on the, the trail of the conspiracy. But I, I, I'm asked that question constantly. Who are they? And it's a difficult question to answer because they don't want you to know uh, but they do want you to know that they've, they've led you into the particular event and that they're leading us someplace else. That's what the, uh, the truth of the information is, that there is a path. Once you find it, you're on the right track. Not only a path, but when you begin to connect this together, and, uh, if you, if, and I'm sure you did, if you sit down and, and do what I did, and that is uh, try to figure out, well, wait a minute, if, if they're conspiring, uh, how come none of them talk? I mean, why isn't that nobody's talking? Uh, there's got to be something very powerful that keeps them silent, and it can't be money, because if it's money, I can go get, give this guy a little more money, and he'll just tell me everything he knows, but he won't. And uh, what I found is, is, uh, is that the, the, the best cohesive bonds to hold this all together, and what I found was, was that was exactly what it was, is a hidden religion that That's nobody knows anything about. Exactly correct. That's what this is. You've got to understand that this is not money. That's not the motive. Power is not the motive. Greed is not the, the motive. It's bigger than that. In fact, it's all of that plus more. And you, you're correct when you say that it is a religion. This is what motivates these people. It's a different view of religion than, than the traditional uh, Judeo-Christian teachings. This is something that is beyond that. It's bigger than that. It's broader than that. But it is what's, what motivates these people. And it's also what keeps them silent. They take an oath. Uh, as far as I can tell in my research, that they will not reveal the truth of their activities nor the ex extent of their involvement. And that's what we've discovered. You find that everywhere you look. And there are real punishments for those who, who break that oath. Oh, yes. And, of course, there <laughs> we've heard examples of that. Uh, it, there's just one recently up in Italy where was someone inside the Masonic Lodge, the P2 group, apparently broke with it and uh, was found on some bridge in London hanging. 
Uh, it was all that was all symbolic, a ritual, ritualistic uh, murder. Uh, that was the price he paid for apparently breaking with their information. That's happened in the past with other leaders in the in America as well. This is not something that's just uh, European or foreign. It's in, you know, many of the deaths in America, uh, at least several of the ones that we all know about, have been caused by uh, members of these secret societies. Well, now that we've laid some groundwork, Ralph, what was it that you began to find out? Well, I think it's very easy. That's a, a, an interesting question, and of course, that you can't answer that in two or three sentences, but basically, I found out that there was, in America first, let's start with that, all I found was the evidence of their involvement, this conspiracy's involvement, for 200 years in American history. And one of the reasons I know that I'm right is because many of the leaders of the past, people that we know about, uh, Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson and uh, Benjamin Franklin and uh, Woodrow Wilson and uh, Franklin Roosevelt. People like this have all written about this conspiracy during their day. They tried to warn us. Andrew Jackson, uh, another one of these. The tragic part about it, that from, at least from what I know, is that these men didn't put their writings into a book form that we can uh, save for posterity. You can't find a book written by Abraham Lincoln talking about the money power that we know he talks about. So for whatever reason, uh, and it's quite likely these men uh, thought maybe the American people wouldn't believe them, they didn't put their, their overall uh, thoughts in writing in a book form. It's, quite, it's also quite possible, Bill, as you know, that they might have done that, and those books have been destroyed by those involved in the conspiracy. And if that's the case, then, then we're really, uh, it was, those were decisions made against our, our best interest because we can't find that material. Uh, we, we know that instances like that have happened where someone has sat down and either from their re, uh, research or from first-hand knowledge uh, from being a, a member of this group has sat down and written a book and as soon as it was published all the copies were bought up or stolen and except for a few copies that remain hidden in obscure libraries, literally disappeared right. from the public view. And sometimes the authors of those books <laughs> yeah, exactly. disappeared along with, with their life's work. Uh, we, we can find evidence of this conspiracy and warnings from our forefathers sprinkled throughout their letters, uh, their, their writings, uh, um, interviews that were done with them. Uh, all the way from way before the beginning, the actual written beginning, and by written I mean the Declaration of Independence of this country, all the way up to and including the present day, where just recently in his book, Barry Goldwater gave us a warning also, where he says the executive branch of the government has been infiltrated and is in control of a group which intends to destroy the United States of America. <clears throat> and I can go on and on and on. But uh, when, when you first began delving into this, I mean, you told us about a couple of, of books that you read and you began to look at and you began to see the footprints of this conspiracy uh, back in history and up to the present day, uh, and you looked around, what came to mind? Well, it's, I think the first thing, the first step is fear, almost absolute tyranny of uh, fear, because you realize this thing is immense, and that people that you and I have trusted for our lives, uh, with our lives, have been betraying us. And so the first step is fear. Then the second one is, well, what do I do about this? And that's when you turn the corner. Uh, if you decide to do something about it, then you, then you commit yourself to getting involved. And that's generally where people uh, quite often will uh, stop their search. Once they get to that point, once they realize it's real, the next step is, what do I do about it? And that's where a lot of uh, fellow Americans quit. They just stop. This is immense. It's ongoing. And it's something we've all got to be involved with. A lot of them understand that before they will even admit the truth. That to admit the truth means that they must become involved because it makes them responsible. And the way that they get around it is they draw down a curtain and they deny that anything is wrong, that there could possibly be any control of the events of history. And what they'll tell you is everything just happens by accident. Well, no, that's the one that we're taught in schools. And that's the one that they're willing to accept because, like you said, Bill, they, once, once you become concerned, you should become convicted. And if you don't become convicted, the reason is because you don't want to uh, become involved. It's, it, this is a scary process, and once you've got, to, you've got to admit that you were the one that caused the problem because you refused to admit the, uh, the truth or the arguments of those who were trying to point out to you there was something going on. It's very difficult. It's a tough decision, and I don't argue that. I'm faced with it as you are every day of our lives. We find people constantly refusing to read the evidence or look at it because they don't want to admit that it could be very well be true. 
Well, for some of the people out there that are shaking their heads, and I can hear it now because they hear this all the time, <laughs> you know, they talked for a long time, and they didn't give me any proof. What is some of the proof? Well, that's the one thing about it that, that, that I cannot explain is that they've left their footprints in the sand. All you've got to do is start looking. The back of my book, The Unseen Hand, is over 30 pages of footnotes. And these are not sources that you that they're buried or whatever. These are sources that you can read of the, the national magazines of the, of the day, of the period as well. Uh, books written by people involved or books written by historians. It's there. All you've got to do is find it. And so, for whatever reason, it is there you find it and you can find the evidence that this conspiracy exists. Not only evidence, uh, and there's, there's tons of it. And those of you who are steady listeners to this program know that because I've given you uh, references, books, footnotes. I've told you where to go and what to look for. And, uh, and many of you have done it. Many of you have not done it. But what, what really uh, what really got me going was when I began to find admissions in their own writings of what it was that they were doing and who it was that they worshipped and why they were trying to bring this all about that I thought was absolutely incredible until I found out that they don't believe that we have the intelligence to not only catch on to what they're doing, but to ever be able to stop them. Mm -hmm. So they made these admissions uh, with the confidence that even if we find out about it, uh, we're not going to do anything about it because we're all a bunch of stupid cattle anyway. That's, 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 true. that's, true. That, that's another one of the problems is, is dealing with the others. There are people who have been involved who have, uh, have stepped forward. Probably the best example of this, and I'm sure you've talked about this already on your program, is the book written by Carol Quigley, a Ph.D., trained at Harvard. In fact, he got his Ph.D. from Harvard. He uh, wrote a book called Tragedy and Hope in 1968. And he was, in fact, Bill Clinton's mentor. Yes, that's where I was going with that. That's the next <laughs> one. See, let's go back to Carol Quigley, though. Uh, Quigley admitted in his book that he'd been made aware of this conspiracy about 20 years before he wrote it. So he figured 1968 or 66 when he wrote it, uh, 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 20 years minus would put him back to around 1946 at the end of World War II. So Dr. Quigley, with the Harvard uh, PhD and to teaching at Harvard, Princeton, and then later at Georgetown, admitted that he had been aware of this thing for over 20 years. He went on to admit that he'd been actually been made privy, as the word he used, to their own papers for something like two years. So here's a man who apparently was invited into the circle of this conspiracy to uh, write a book about, to research and write the book. He wrote the book. It came out in 1968, 66, forgive me. And as you pointed out, uh, Bill Clinton went to Georgetown to read the book. And that's where Dr. Quigley had an impact on it. Now, you say, how do we know that? We can find that uh, quotation in Bill, Bill Clinton's own writings. He wrote a book called uh, uh, Putting People First, I believe it's called, uh, during the campaign of 1992, I have a copy of that book on pages, I think, 217. Uh, he starts to, uh, he quotes his actual uh, acceptance speech at the Democratic Convention. At the last part of the book, I believe it's on page 231 for the, for the, uh, for the jurist who wants to know where this is, he can read that he says that uh, what got him into politics. Now, he's giving this speech, we've got to understand, at the Democratic Convention, the uh, July something, something, the 16th of 1992, the largest audience of the world that he probably would ever have at one time without interruption, all watching him live give this speech, and in there he tells us that there not only is a conspiracy in the world, but that he supports it. Bill Clinton admitted that you and I, Bill, are right, that there is a conspiracy, and that he was part of it. He said this on national television, it's in his book, and uh, it's very easy to find. Now, this, the next step is, how do we, why do we believe that? I mean, uh, why should we believe that? Because Bill Clinton told us. And we can now know that Bill Clinton knows that, that you and I are right. Let me finish with the last thought. In that speech, he goes on to point out that he was, uh, got his call, as he calls it, to citizenship from John Kennedy, President John Kennedy. And we know that during the summer of 1963, Bill Clinton was in Washington, D.C., uh, at Boys Nation, which is uh, a, uh, the next step after Boys State, apparently he was elected from the state of Arkansas, to go to Boys Nation in Washington, D.C., and John Kennedy came to visit. And there's been a picture released of Bill Clinton shaking the hand of John Kennedy during the summer of 1963. Then he went on to say in his, in his uh, speech that that call, meaning the call to citizenship or public office, was clarified by Dr. Carol Quigley, a professor he had at Georgetown. 
And that's our link. Now, uh, Bill Clinton now knows, he's admitting that, that uh, what Quigley taught him was correct, that he supported it, and that uh, Dr. Quigley was a professor that got him into politics. Well, we know that his link is, is much, uh, much tighter than that. He was, in fact, a Rhodes Scholar. And uh, he did, uh, in fact, go at, on an invitation to Moscow at a time when American citizens were forbidden to go to Moscow. Yeah. And uh, yeah. that was for the purpose of seeing how socialism works up close hand. And uh, I think he learned his lesson well, as we're beginning to see. <laughs> Let's talk briefly about the Rhodes Scholarship Program, because that's where he learned about the Rhodes Program, I believe was at Georgetown University. If they've all heard it from me, let's hear it from you. Okay, well, uh, that's fine. Good. I'm glad you're... See, this is the point. I, I want to thank you, Bill, for what you're doing. You're getting this information out and making it available. Uh, I'll, I'll just repeat it briefly for those who haven't heard it or perhaps are listening tonight for the first time. Dr. Quigley talked about Cecil Rhodes. Now, we in America don't know much about this man because he was a European. Uh, I think he was from England. Uh, uh, Cecil Rhodes went to South Africa uh, during the 1880s to 1900s, early 1900s, to get control of the wealth down there, and he succeeded. In fact, in his book, Dr. Quigley points out that Cecil Rhodes started what we call the Boer War, B-O-E-R, in about 1902, I believe it was. And he goes on to say in this book that the Boer War was intended to, to get control of the gold mines in South Africa. And apparently the Boer uh, were a people that controlled these, I guess. And apparently he was unsuccessful, so he called the English government. They got uh, English troops were sent there. And subsequently, the, uh, the Rhodes and his uh, allies got control of the gold mines in the Boer War. And Quigley admits that this is what happened, that this was done for this power group, the, what, what uh, Quigley called the Anglophile Network. That was, the, that was the reason behind Cecil Rhodes going there. And then Cecil Rhodes took the wealth that he made there to create the Rhodes Scholarship. And the purpose of the Rhodes Scholarship was to teach young people the goal of the founder, which is a one-world socialist government, uh, led by these, this conspiracy. So little Billy Clinton, after he graduated from college in 1968, went to Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship. And that's where he learned about this conspiracy. And we can trace all of these uh, Americans who actually went to uh, England to attend Oxford under the Rhodes Scholarship. We can look back in their administrations and the, the periods where they held office in any uh, branch of the government. We can see that these people, the Rhodes Scholars, have always led us closer to socialism. Um, than, than we would have gone if they had not occupied those positions. It's time to take our break, folks. Don't go away. Don't get out of your seat. We'll be right back after this very brief pause. Hello, folks. This is William Cooper speaking to you now for Swiss America Trading, our sponsor. The ones who have stood behind this program through thick and through thin when no one else would dare, would dare sponsor a program who puts out information like I do over the airwaves to those of you who need it, who understand the importance of it. When WWCR burned to the ground, Swiss American Trading was right there. They didn't run away from this show, even though they knew what that fire meant, and so do all of you. Nope, they went right to work and found us another place to broadcast. And then when WWCR repaired their transmitters and rebuilt, we were right back on the air with Swiss American Trading right there with us. Now, folks, you need that kind of protection. You see, we've had it here on the hour of the time simply because they believe in the message that we are putting out to the world. This is one of, if not the, very last bastions of free speech and truth in media throughout the world. This is the only place where you're ever going to hear the things that we put out over the air on this program. The kind of protection that we've had, you need to protect you from the coming economic trauma. And those of you who have been listening to this program since its inception, or even maybe not that long, you've been able to put two and two together and come up with the real answer. We're facing hard times, folks. There is most likely to be, and I believe wholeheartedly through all my research, a complete world economic collapse. And it's looming in the very near future. All of the plans that we have come across, all of the research that we've done, tell us that they have to either have the New World Order in place by the year 2000 or shortly thereafter. Now, if you want to be one of the ones who survives this in some semblance of a good manner and good order and with your family intact, you need to do something 
about protecting those assets that you've worked for all your life. Call Swiss America Trading now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Talk to the experts there. If you're deriving real worth from this program, if you understand the message that we're putting out to the world, then you owe them at least the chance to explain to you how they can help you protect everything that you've earned in your life against what's coming in the near future. So call Swiss America Trading now. 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Again, for the first 200 callers, you'll receive Harry Figgy's report entitled Tackle the Debt. So call now, 1-800-289-2646. While you're at it, tell them that you listen to this program. Mention my name, William Cooper, and you'll also receive a free newsletter on protecting your future. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. You'll be glad that you did. Well, for those of you who could make out the words to that musical selection through all the static out there, You know that that's talking about lies. And basically, that's what we get, isn't it, Ralph? Lies? That's correct, Bill. That's what what I was taught in college, the accidental view of history. And uh, where where does it take us? It takes us into the truth, which is the conspiratorial view of history. It's taken me 30 years to to accumulate the evidence that that statement's true, that what we have been taught in schools and in our public... uh, arenas today is simply not true. It, what we call history is simply not true. It didn't happen the way we've been taught. Now, what we're doing tonight really is just building up a basis for several other shows that you're going to be the guest here for several nights in a row. And uh, what, what I want to do is make sure that everybody out there understands that, uh, that, that we're not trying to blow smoke at them. Of course, my regular listeners already know that. But there are a lot of, we pick up new listeners all the time. People are just going through the short wave bands and they hear this and they think it's interesting conversation and pretty soon they're hooked. Uh, but they don't believe a word of it. Uh, now, Ralph, how can you assure our listeners out there that uh, that uh, that you're not here to feed them some more lies? Well, that's that's it. of course that's we all are faced with that problem. Those of us in the uh, that live in the uh, uh, you know in the world today are faced with that problem. How do we know that Dan Rad is telling us the truth, or any other of the media? Right. We have that's to, not a very good example. <laughs> I don't take much research to find out that Dan Rad is not telling well, us. Well, see, but, but but the American <laughs> citizen doesn't believe that. I think the American citizen believes that what Dan Rather says is true. So my point is that we've all got to, we're all obligated to, to seek the truth. How do I know that I'm telling the truth? Because great people of the past, like Abraham Lincoln and uh, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, have told us that I'm right. Now we even got proof that Bill Clinton, our current president, confirmed that we're right uh, when he gave that speech in July of 1992. So this is how we know. We're on the right track. Those things that we're telling the American people are true. That, that the events that we've been taught in school did not happen the way that, uh, that they claim. Well, uh, I know that, and you know that. Of course, a lot of the listeners out there know that. Uh, in fact, the truth about the American people is that they believe if Dan Rather didn't say it on TV, that it's not true. <laughs> that's true, too. The conversion is just correct. To the point where when they go to the grocery store and they're looking at products and trying to determine which product to buy, if they haven't seen it on a commercial on television, they're most likely never to buy that that's product. That's correct. For some reason, how did this come about? Well, that's part of the process. We've been conditioned to accept that our leaders uh, would not lie to us. They would tell us the truth, and that's part of the process. Even when we start to question, as we did in the 1992 election, about the liar George Bush, he still got many, many votes. Uh, He got, what, 40-some percent of the vote. So even when they knew that he lied to us about read my lips, they still voted for him. Bill Clinton promised when he married Hillary not to indulge in extramarital affairs. He did. He was elected. Even when they know, we know they lie, we, we still vote for them. Wow. <laughs> uh, but, Ralph, take us back now and, and, and sort of give us some groundwork that, that people out there, if they want to, give us something that they can take and go to the library and look up 
and check this out. Well, that might be a, a real so, something on the ground floor, real basic, real beginning. I think I think this example we've already cited, we've discussed already, Bill, about the uh, the speech by Bill Clinton is an excellent way to begin. We can now know for certain that Bill Clinton knows that there is a conspiracy because he said it with his own words. If you want to check that out, get his book entitled Putting People First. Go to the back of the book, page 217. You'll read his speech that he gave to the American people at the Democratic Convention in July of 1992. In that speech, he talks about Carol Quigley. Go to any library. Uh, if they don't have the book, ask them to get it. Called Tragedy and Hope, written by Carol Quigley, and you will know what Bill Clinton knows. It's that simple. The evidence is there. All you've got to do is find it. But that book is hard. It's difficult to find. I know it's difficult to find. I also know that it's about, uh, what, it's well over a thousand pages. Okay, to make it even easier for you, I'll uh, recommend that you open it up to page 950. That's where Carol Quigley tells you about this international Anglophile network. Those of you that don't want to go to trouble or want to read it documented, uh, you can get my little book it's called The Clinton Conspiracy. I actually photographed the page on which it said. So there's no question I've got the information. That little book that you can get will give you an address at the end. You can read that yourself and you can know for certain that our current president, Bill Clinton, admits that there is a conspiracy and that he supports it. No question about it. Well, what, what about uh, what about farther back in history? Where where can they where can they start to uh, to begin to to find these footprints and follow the thread? Let's go start today because that's that's a conspiracy to the future. I mean, we got to go back and prove that we're where we're at because somebody way back when uh, started this ball rolling. Well, I think a good place to start is going back to the American Revolution. Uh, you can find the evidence of this conspiracy as simply as uh, getting one of your dollar bills out. Uh, the back of the dollar bill, I'm, I'm sure you've talked about this. The Great Seal of the United States is shown there for the first time in, I think it was what, 1935, that appeared publicly. Uh, both sides of it appeared together. Uh, you can get that out, and anyone that's listening right now can get a copy of the dollar bill and flip it over on the back and then ask yourself if you know whether or not what those symbols mean. The eagle, the uh, eye above the pyramid, the pyramid, the Latin phrases. Do you know uh, what those things mean? When you go back into the past, you can find the evidence that our founding fathers knew what it meant. They were the ones that adopted them. And then you do a little research and you can find out why the eagle on the right-hand side has 32 feathers on the right fe uh, wing and 33 feathers on the left. What the number 13, what the symbology of the number 13 is. What does that eye represent on the left side of the great uh, seal? What's this pyramid all about? There are no stone pyramids in America. Yet on the back of our dollar bill, there's a stone pyramid. Why did they write these phrases in Latin when we spoke English at the time of the, the adoption of the great seal? All of these things are there for a reason. And the first question any American sh should ask is why don't you know what those symbols mean in this land of the free and the home of the brave, of the government of the people, by the people, and for the people? How come you don't know what those symbols mean. Well, actually, the, the reverse of the Great Seal of the United States has been available to the public since it was passed uh, and accepted by Congress in 1789, uh, just that nobody ever goes and looks at it. It, it. The seal has never really been cut, and the first time that the general public ever really saw it was when it appeared on the dollar bill. Well, I think, I think that's true for the reverse side, meaning the side with the pyramid. I think the eagle side might very well have been more public. I think there was more discussion about it, but the reverse side, I know, I believe that's correct. It never did appear in public until that was shown, I believe, on the back of the dollar bill in 1935, I think it was. Now, isn't it true that when the Bavarian Illuminati was outlawed and they raided the uh, the, uh, the, the the lodge and uh, uh, found the papers that this same seal was actually the seal of, of uh, Adam Weishaupt's Bavarian Illuminati? Well, if that's true, Bill, I've never seen that. I, if that's true, which it might very well be, I'd, I'd love to know that. I've not found that. Not that I've looked for I've just never heard that. It's quite likely that's where it first originated. Well, it didn't come to my attention until somebody called me up and said, you know that the 1776 on the bottom course of the pyramid uh, doesn't stand for uh, the year that the Declaration of Independence was written, don't you? And I said, no, I thought that that was exactly what it was for. And they said, well, if you'll look into the history of the Adam Weishaupt's Bavarian Illuminati, you'll find that this exact same seal 
was the, was was used by them. Now whether it was the seal of the Bavarian Illuminati or not, I don't know. But I have found in my research that this did appear on the papers um, that, that the Bavarian government actually found when they raided the lodge and, and uh, took the papers after after it was outlawed. Now. Um, we know that Thomas Jefferson was a staunch defender of Adam Weishaupt and the Bavarian Illuminati when they were condemned uh, by the governments uh, of Europe, when, it, when, when they found out that these people really had a plan to topple the kings from their thrones and uh, take over the world. Uh, this was a plan that they had actually written. Well, you go back to, let's go back, people are asking for documentation. Thomas Jefferson's a good source. Uh, we know that he wrote about the, uh, the Illuminati and that he did it in favor. He supported it. I mean, that's all a matter of public record. It's a matter of finding it in his own writings. So you talk about documentation. It's easy to, it's not easy to find, but once you find it, it proves our point that there's something going on in this country and that, that the evidence that it's going on is all around us. And I'm going to tell you, folks, that an awful lot of it is in your own library, especially if you live in a big city or if you have a large university or college library near you, or even just a big city library like the like the Library of New York or if you're near the Library of Congress. Uh, you can find not only the footprints, but the proof absolutely that would convict uh, this group, this pe- these people who are who are bringing this about, these secret uh, uh, cabals, some people call them, you know who they are, if you've been listening to this program, would, would convict them in any court of law, if you could get a court of law to hear it. Now, why can't we get anybody in the legal system to look at this and understand it and acknowledge that this is happening? Well, that, that, that <laughs> if I had the magic answer, answer that question, we save this nation. But don't we have the magic answer to that question? <laughs> don't they take oaths to protect each other? And aren't these people sitting on the benches in our courts? Well, this is one of the problems, of course. We know that the that the, uh, most of the federal judges, I, I, don't, I can't say this for surgery, but I believe that most of the federal judges are appointed by the president, uh, by, at least by his advisors. And if that's true, then the, the, the very uh, powers that put George, uh, Bill Clinton and George Bush and Ronald Reagan in office are the ones selecting our judges. And they don't want this truth to come out. I admit that's true. And uh, we know, from because we have copies of the oaths, I've read the oaths over the air, that if one of their secret group comes into the court and gives the secret sign, then if the judge is indeed a member of that secret organization, he has to rule in favor of that person that's by the oath that they take. That's correct. And this is one of the problems. In fact, I've asked uh, our county attorney who uh, lives in Tucson, uh, came to one of our uh, uh, clubs that I belong to to speak to us, and I asked him that question, whether or not he knew about this. And I have to admit, he, 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 he told us he did not. He did not uh, know about this, and allegedly had never heard this before. I, I'm, I'm not quite convinced I believe that. But I want to go back to... Well, by their, by their own oath, they take an oath of secrecy. By, his, by the oath that he takes, he can never admit it. Yes, that's correct. I want to go back to your comment about the Illuminati bill. Uh, uh-huh. I, I first found them in a book called Proofs of a Conspiracy, written by John... John Robeson. That book was at one time very hard to, to find. I believe there are only like one or two copies in the entire world. Someone made that book available. It's now available to anyone that wants to read it. It was written in 1789 by a member of the Masonic Lodge by the name of John Robeson. John Robeson uh, discovered the Illuminati. He uh, was asked to join the, the Illuminati. He wrote a book about it after he discovered it uh, and what he was up to. He wrote a book about it written in 1789, published it. That book was read by George Washington. George Washington's read, written letters about John Robeson's book entitled Proofs of Conspiracy. Anyone can read that book now because someone cared to make it public. It was public uh, a few years ago, but prior to that date it was buried. It was very hard to find. And this was a first-hand account of someone who actually for a short period of time was a part of this. That's correct. Uh, John uh, Robeson's uh, his, uh, ability to research it was, is without question. James Watt, the inventor of the steam engine at the time, wrote about Professor Robeson and his great academic ability, his research ability. He was a scholar without question in his day, and uh, what, we, what he discovered can be relied upon. He was a fine professor who did a great job of researching this evidence. In the 1898 edition of uh, Albert Mackey's History of Freemasonry, James Watt is listed as one of the sovereign grand commanders. 
of uh, one of the branches of Freemason. I don't, for, I don't remember right off the top of my head which branch it was, but he's listed right in there. Well, it's quite so likely. He, he would know. <laughs> it's quite likely, once again, that, that uh, it was intended for Robeson to write this book. Don't forget, Bill, that this conspiracy wants this stuff out. They want it available. If, if, that's, if what you're saying about uh, James Watt is true, it could well be that he was urged to recommend the book to get people to read it. But uh, in any event, uh, Robeson's scholarship by other sources is without uh, a question. It's almost impeccable. He did a fantastic job and service. But it's quite likely that they wanted this material out. One of the things that I've concluded, and I, I've not found this in writing yet, is that Adam Weishaupt in 17, what, 89, when he was discovered, I believe he's the one that broke the truth. He wanted the Illuminati to be discovered and made illegal so the men would scatter. I, this is my theory that he had, he felt that the, uh, the Illuminati had grown to the point now where it could be powerful. Uh, he was staying at home in his home base in Bavaria. I believe Weishaupt went to the Bavarian government and made it public or at least released information uh, or at least told them where they could find the information so the Illuminati would become public, so they would be forced out and become illegal, so well, the men would scatter, and when they did, they started groups of the Illuminati all over the, United, all over the world, including the United States. Well, we know that that, didn't, that is not really the way it happened, Ralph, uh, simply because the way it was discovered by the Bavarian government was through uh, an act of divine intervention when a messenger was actually struck from his horse by a bolt of lightning, well, and they found the papers in his pouch. I've also read that there were five men who broke from the Illuminati. I don't know which one of those two stories is true, but in one of the books I read, five men broke with the Illuminati and went to the uh, to the heads of the Bavarian government. So I don't know which one is true. If your version is correct, then of course there, there was no way it was not intended. But if my version is correct, that there were five men who broke from it and went to the Bavarian government, I'd be wise. Hops was the one who sent them. Well, there may have been five who broke and went to the Bavarian government after the information was discovered, probably to save their own their own uh, necks because they were they were condemned. And um, that's highly possible. But we do know from the the actual history of Bavaria that this this story of the messenger being hit by lightning off his horse and finding these documents in the pouch uh, is true. That's that's uh, easily verified. But uh, um, and, and it is true that some of the members of the Bavarian Illuminati did uh, talk to the officials when they when they were arrested. Uh, as anybody ever does when they're when they're uh, caught with their pants down, somebody always talks. And that should be a lesson to anybody. Uh, <laughs> well, in any event, but going back to your comment, in any event, the Illuminati did scatter after it was discovered. For, however, by the uh, the Bavarian government, and the uh, it's known that it came to the United States. It's known that it went to various governments of the uh, of uh, Europe. It uh, instigated the French Revolution of 1789. It was a 1798, I guess it was. Uh, that's now been established. John Robeson proved that as well in his book, uh, and the uh, uh, others have done the research to prove that the Illuminati did become powerful enough to cause the French Revolution. So we know that the Illuminati did scatter and became a power in diverse governments and causing revolutions and wars all over the, uh, the period. Well, that's true, and we know that most of the revolutionary groups throughout history stem from not just the Bavarian Illuminati, but from this overall group of those who consider themselves to be illumined and possess the truly mature minds of the world and consider the rest of us to be too stupid to have any process in determining world future events. Uh, how are we going to deal with that? Well, obviously, the only way we can, Bill, and that's my whole purpose, and I'm sure it's yours as well, is to educate. We've got to get people to be aware that that's time-consuming, it's difficult, it's also... Uh, uh, sometimes it can be costly. You have to buy books and tapes and videos and study uh -huh. and read. But education is the only answer so far that I know of. We've got to educate the American people because we are the ones doing these things to ourselves. We are allowing it to happen. We're the ones who vote for these elected officials who are part of this conspiracy. Well, you know, a lot of people think they vote for them, but in truth, the, the vote of the people doesn't have anything to do with who gets elected. Well, I admit, Bill, that they, they put the two candidates out. Uh, they select both of them and make sure that we've, uh, we're told those are the only two options we have. But don't forget, the American people still vote for those two candidates. They don't have to do that. And the way to do that is they've got, once the government knows, the, the security, security knows about this power, uh -huh. uh, I, believe, I believe they'll start, we can alter their choices and we can ultimately end up with, the, with people who will save this nation. 
I think it would save the nation. I think we can take it back. I think we can make it into whatever we want it to be or whatever it was intended in the first place. And I think the, the best way to go about this is with the intention of reinstating the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as the supreme law of the land. We, we know that that's been wrested from us. Is there any doubt in your mind that the Constitution has been uh, thrown in the trash can, so to speak? Well, one of the things that I discovered a few years ago was the evidence that our founding fathers were the one that ones that did that. I'm sure you've talked about this. I'm not the first one to mention I'm sure, in your program. But to Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 proves that our founding fathers intentionally subverted the very document they wrote. And that's very difficult. A lot of people have difficulty in believing that, but the evidence is overwhelming. It's very easy to find anyone that wants to get a copy of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of Regents themselves. It's very easy, very, uh, very provable. Well, it's very hard to get a copy of the Constitution. I mean, a real copy of the Constitution. Anybody can get a copy out of the, the, the World Almanac or, or something like that. But uh, to get a real copy of the Constitution with the real preamble to the, to, the, uh, to the Bill of Rights, there is a preamble to the Bill of Rights that so most Americans have never seen. Uh, there, there are copies of the Constitution that have the, the capital letters where they're supposed to be, but most of them don't. And, of course, you know, in, in the legal sense, that changes the whole meaning. But you're right, that they, that they did sabotage us from the beginning, and they knew they were doing that, and they talked about it in their letters and in their, in their writings to each other. Uh, in the, it's hinted at in the Federalist Papers. Um, uh, ben Franklin, when he came out of the, uh, the convention hall after the Constitutional Convention, after the Constitution had been adopted and signed, he was asked, uh, what have you wrought, Ben? And uh, he replied, a republic, if you can keep it. And, and he was implying just exactly what it says, that uh, probably we would not be smart enough uh, to, to keep the, our creator-endowed rights that the Constitution was there to preserve for us and protect us uh, from usurpation of those rights. Well, yeah, I think you're right, Bill. I, uh, there's quite a bit of evidence that Ben Franklin was part of the, uh, this cabal that you're mentioning. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Wasn't he the master of the nine muses, the yeah. lodge of the nine muses in France? And he was actually the grand master of the first, uh, one of the first Masonic lodges ever established in the United States. But the, the point is that it was well taken that, that uh, we could lose our government if we did not continue to educate ourselves in our or, or, uh, or as the, the Constitution calls it, our posterity, to show them exactly what a, re a republic is and how we should keep it and why we should keep it. That's right. Well, uh, Ralph, you're going to be here again tomorrow night, so it's not going to be a great blow to tell you that we're out of time. Um, and everybody out there, make sure that you're by your radio tomorrow night, because we're going to get into specifics tomorrow night and the night after and the night after that. We're going to get down to the nitty-gritty, and we're going to get into this thing. We're going to jump in with both feet tonight. It was just to sort of get you acquainted with Ralph Epperson and what we're going to be talking about. And, of course, what we're talking about is what I always talk about, but you get to hear it from a different point of view you and a different person, and Ralph Epperson and I don't agree on everything, but you're going to hear his point of view the way he believes it to be, and like always, I caution you not to believe anybody. Don't believe me, don't believe Ralph, don't believe Bill Clinton, especially don't believe Dan Rather, or Flesh Limbaugh, or Tom Valentine, or any of these other people out there, unless you can research it in your own time and verify it. If you can't, if you believe anybody, just because you think that they're truthful, you're always going to be a puppet on the end of somebody's string, and when they pull that string, you're going to dance. Good night, and God bless you all. Across America and around the world, you're listening once again to the Hour of the Time. This is the only hour that ever was or ever will be. This is the most important hour in your entire life. For during this hour, you will decide your future, and thus our collective future. Ralph Epperson, welcome back to the Hour of the Time. Thank you very much, Bill. It's my pleasure. I understand you've got an intriguing subject to discuss with our listeners tonight. That's correct. We're going to talk about the Constitution of the United States. But, Ralph, the Constitution of the United States of America? I mean, doesn't everybody in America understand and know and have a copy of the Constitution? I can't say that. I don't know if they do or do not, but I don't think many people do say it that way. Uh, I would bet my grandmother's underwear that 98% of the American population not only don't have a copy, but probably never read it, unless it was in school during their younger years 
and even then they didn't really understand what it was they read, with the exception of most of the audience of the hour of the time. Those people, I, I would hope, and I appreciate the fact that they have read the Constitution, I think that's magnificent, and perhaps even have a copy that they could get, as we're going to read parts of it ourselves. In fact, we need a copy of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, so uh, if you want to... Uh, uh, those of you who are listening, if you want to get your copy out, please let's do so and get your highlighting pen because we're going to talk about some very disturbing things that I've discovered in the Constitution and the Declaration that should be brought to your attention. If this is not if something new to you, uh, this would be very disturbing. If you've already heard it before, and it'll help to re reinforce it. Please pay attention. This is really something we've all got to understand and consider. Well, um, let's go. Okay. Let's start with the Declaration of Independence. In the second paragraph of the Declaration, that's also dated, by the way, this was, of course, as we all know, July the 4th, 1776, our founding fathers decided to declare their independence from the great, uh, the, the king of Great Britain, England. Uh, and so they were using this document to do so. It was called the Declaration of Independence. At the bottom of the second paragraph, uh, it reads as follows. I'm reading now from my copy that I have in my possession at this moment. It says, The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. So let's start with that now. They're, they're, what they're saying is that King George, the, king, the present king of Great Britain, was creating a tyranny in the United States, in fact, over these states. I went back to an 1820 something, I think it was something around 1800 and some uh, dictionary, and looked up the word tyranny as far back as I could go to 1776, so it was maybe 50, 60 years later. And they defined tyranny as giving one branch of government or one government total power. So our founding fathers were close to the understanding of tyranny by this dictionary definition maybe 50, 60 years later. I also went back to the Federalist Papers and read the quotes of uh, Hamilton, Madison, and Jay. They also understood what tyranny was. It was giving total power to one government or one branch of government. In fact, in those uh, years, they talked about giving too much power to monarchies, which were, at that time, as perhaps you know, the most prevalent form of government around the, uh, the world. Now, so what they're saying is that we are now going to establish that we are doing this because the king was establishing a tyranny over us. And then it went on to say, to prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. And then they listed, I think it's 32 specific complaints that they had against the present king of Great Britain uh, in this uh, arena. They were saying, these are the reasons we are breaking away from the present king. And they listed, I think there's 32 of them. Uh, the only number I want to bring to your attention is the 22nd one. Those of you, at least in my copy, they're somewhat uh, broken up into short uh, one-sentence uh, paragraphs. Some are maybe more than one. But mine is uh, indented, and I can read the 22nd one. It starts by reading, by saying, rather, for suspending our own legislatures. So what they were saying was that King George had dissolved our legislatures, the ones that the founding fathers had created around the very states, and then the, the declaration was on to say, and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. So what they were doing was dissolving our government, our legislatures, creating them all, their, their, their own, and then granting those legislatures, quote, the power to legislate in all cases whatsoever. That's the key phrase I want you to remember. The power to legislate in all cases whatsoever. By definition, giving that government that power is the very definition of tyranny. Our founding fathers were stating that the power to legislate in all cases whatsoever in the hands of the legislature was tyranny. That's why they listed it. We're saying we're going to submit to the to the candid world the following examples of tyranny in the United States. What just for the sake of uh, uh, of, of exploring this, what would be an alternative to that? What would have been the fair thing to do? Uh, what they did in Article One, Section, which we'll cover in a minute. We'll okay. Come in a minute. What I want you to get familiar with at this point is that in 1776, 
Our founding fathers declared that the phrase, the power to legislate in all cases whatsoever, was tyranny, because there is no Magna Carta under the power where they can legislate in all cases whatsoever. Whatever that legislature, that legislative body decides is law, is law. There are no concepts of rights, human rights, and human rights any, under that kind of power. And that's why our founding fathers were separating from King George, the king, as they call it, the present king of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. Now, 11 years later, these same men, basically the same men, wrote the Constitution of the United States. It was later adopted, as you know, in 1789. But it was submitted, I believe, in the first time, 11 years later, in 1786. The Founding Fathers set up three branches of government. Article 1 creates the legislative branch of government. Article 2 creates the executive branch. And Article 3 creates the judicial branch. So we're now going to go to Article 1, where our Founding Fathers created the, the legislative branch of government in a bicameral House and Senate, meaning they have two houses, uh, one House and one Senate, and so they're now going to then grant power to that government in Article 1, Section 8. And you can go to that, if you will, if you've got your copy in front of you. Let's go to Article 1, Section 8. And we'll now read the powers that our founding fathers granted to Congress. Section 8 reads as follows, quote, The Congress shall have power, and then it starts listing 18 specific grants of power to the federal government, to Congress. The first one reads, the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, etc., to pay the debts, etc. The next one is the power to borrow money. This is a condensed form, of course. What we're saying is that our founding fathers tried to limit the power of government to the following specified powers, and they listed 18 of them. Now, we, those of us who have studied the Constitution, maybe incorrectly, have decided to call these various grants of power clauses. So I'm going to refer to Article 1, Section 8, Clause, the meaning the number 17, meaning the 17th of the 18th. We're going to read as follows. Congress shall have the power to, and then this is what it reads, to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever. So in one case, they're saying we're leaving King George because he's doing this, and once we've left King George, we're going to do the same thing. Exactly. <laughs> now, notice, Bill, they use the same identical words. Yes. In one case, the king has dissolved our governments, our legislatures, and created their own with the power to legislate in all cases whatsoever. That was called tyranny. Eleven years later, Congress shall have the power to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever, and now it's not tyranny. Something's wrong. It, to me, is for, it just corroboration that our founding fathers intentionally subverted the very document they wrote. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the Constitution. Now, this is, to further amplify on this, this is also very important, and this is a continuation of this very subject. We've got to find out where they gave this power, because our founding fathers created two separate governments in the United States two distinct, separate Congresses. Congress, there's only one congressman or one Congress, but they have legislative power over two different governments. Let's go back now to Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. To exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such districts not exceeding 10 miles square as made by session of particular states and the acceptance of Congress become the seat of the government of the United States. And we're going to stop right there and pause for a moment. So what they're saying is that Congress shall have the power to legislate in all cases whatsoever over the district known as Washington, D.C. That's right. And, and that government, that Congress in this area, shall be running the government of the United States. That's the second problem. What is the government of the United States? It is the government that Congress is running in Washington, D.C. by itself. Now, let's stop right here just for a minute and examine this. We have been told that the cause of the American Revolution was taxation without representation. But here we see that our founding fathers taxed Washington, D.C. without representation, because the people who live in Washington have no congressman, they have no senator. They do vote for president, 
But they, as far as Congress is concerned, they have no representation. But they are taxed. By whom? Congress. With what power? The power to legislate in all cases whatsoever. So we can see that our founding fathers granted this tyrannical power to Congress over the affairs of Washington, D.C. Now, when Congress tries to interfere in the affairs of Arizona or New Mexico or Alaska or any of the other states, it has very specific powers granted to it under Articles 1, Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 1 through 16, 18, and the Tenth Amendment. Congress has the power to lay and collect taxes, to raise an army, etc. Those are all powers that they only can inter- they only have over the states of the, the 50 states. Those are the powers of the government of the United States of America. But when Congress runs the affairs of Washington, D.C., they call themselves the government of the United States, and they have the power to legislate in all cases whatsoever. Now, just as an adjunct to that, let's examine this thought that Congress tax the people in Washington, D.C. without taxation. In my book... You mean, with, you mean without representation? Forgive me, I'm, I, I misstated that. You're right. The, the, the power to tax taxation without representation, which we have been told was the cause of the American Revolution. Bill, in my book, The Unseen Hand, I try to point out that was not the issue in the, in the, uh, the American Revolution. Of course not. The issue <laughs> was... The, the need to create a central bank that would have the power to create paper money out of nothing and loan it to the government at interest. That's why we fought the issue. This is secondary, but, the, but they were creating a government in Washington that was taxing without representation. So that was not the issue. Now let's continue with our thought. It says, to exercise like authority over all uh, places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. Now, this is not really germane to our discussion, but as long as we're here, let's examine that. Something like over a third of the land in the United States is owned or at least held in the name of the United States government, completely without constitutional authority. Here, they can only build or buy land for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. Just today, I drove from Tucson up north, where you live here, Bill, to do your, this program, and I drove to National Forest. They have no power for National Forest. That's correct. I drove through National Parks. They have no power to create National Parks. The only power they have is to buy land for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. Now, in some states, I mean, in, in some states of the Union, namely this state, Arizona, the state of Hawaii, the, the truth is that most of the land in those two states, and probably in many other states, is actually owned. Uh, by the by, the federal government residing uh, mm-hmm. in Washington D.C. and that is, in fact, not according to the Constitution. By the way, on those national parks, what power does Congress have to legislate or activate, or whatever it is, on those parks? The power to legislate in all cases whatsoever. It's a pure tyrannical government. And those on the national forest, they can tell you what to do and not to do. They have complete power to do that. There is no constitution under that power. And you go on your national parks and try to stand up for your Fifth Amendment rights, there is no, they have no, they're not going to recognize your Fifth Amendment rights because you're not, you're, you're acting on their land with the, where Congress has the power to legislate in all cases whatsoever. Well, let's continue our thought. This is the second okay. second part of this problem. Let's go now now to the 14th Amendment. This is where they pulled the clincher. I like to use the analogy of a fisherman. I'm not a fisherman, but I believe that what you do is you dangle your bait and forget about it. It's only meeting the hook, the bait with the hook in it, until the fish bites it. As soon as he does, then you, you pull it and you snag him and then pull him in. So for 70 years, the fish, the, the bait was dangling. Not many people cared about it until the 14th Amendment. Those of you that have your copy of the Constitution, let's flip over to the 14th Amendment. Let's read this. And by the way, if you don't have a copy of the Constitution, as I've told you before, you really shouldn't be listening to this program unless you just stumbled on it and you don't understand that you really should have a copy of the Constitution. <laughs> but if you've been listening for a while and you still don't have one, turn your radio off and go to bed. It's not the show for you. Go ahead, Ralph. <laughs> I would urge you, in fact, all of us should carry a copy. When you get a copy... Well, how can you be an American and not have a copy of the Constitution? Well, it's just... I mean, it, it is American. 
Oh, okay. What I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say the whole document is written on three by five cards, maybe 15 pages. It's very small. You can get a copy very inexpensively. Let's now go to the 14th Amendment, because this is when they, they pulled the hook, snagged us, and reeled us in. The 14th Amendment was adopted in 1868 after the Civil War, and it reads as follows. We're going to take this, but then the rest of you is read the whole thing all the way through, and then we'll analyze it part by part. Let's do that. It says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Let's just read that uh, now step by step. First of all, they notice that they are now calling us persons. We used to be called people, and I'm not an expert in this particular field, but there is a reason that they, they stopped calling us people. Yes. So we're now called persons. Um, and we goes on to say, all persons born or naturalized in the United States. Now let's stop there and analyze that. What does that mean? Where is the United States? It's only Washington, D.C. That's right. It's not the state of Alaska, not the state of Arizona. It's not the combination of those two states or all the other 50 states. Those are called the small U, United, right? Capital S, States of America. So what we're talking about then is Washington, D.C. All persons born in Washington, D.C. Let's take that step. The second part, which is a person, the first part right here, is a person born there who was born in Washington, D.C., as, as, is ruled by a Congress with the power to legislate in all cases whatsoever, and he's now called a, a citizen of the United States because he was born in Washington, D.C., but they also included a second group of citizens, those who are naturalized in the United States. Now, what is a naturalized citizen? A naturalized citizen is one who renounces his citizenship in another jurisdiction, another foreign state, a foreign nation, whatever. Someone, let's say, from France who comes to America, gives up his French citizenship and becomes a citizen of the United States. Or somebody from Oklahoma. Well, Bill, don't get ahead of me. Or Michigan. Don't get ahead of me, Bill, please. <laughs> let's keep it simple. Let's go back here. What I'm trying to point out is a naturalized citizen is one who voluntarily requests to become a citizen of that government, right? A person from France decides to move to America. He wants to become a citizen of the United States. How does he do that? Voluntarily. Okay? So now we've got two classes of people in Washington, D.C., who are citizens of the United States. Let's go back. It says all persons born in the United States or all persons naturalized in the United States. Now, how did... Are we a naturalized citizen of the United States? Now, before you answer, Bill, I know what you're going to say. Don't, don't, don't get ahead of me here. <laughs> Please be patient. Yes, I'm keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> Let's go back. Did we, American people, we, the American people who live in Michigan, who were not born in Washington, D.C., are we a naturalized citizen of the United States? Yes. How did we do that? Voluntarily by accepting the Social Security card. Now, let's go slow here, Bill. Let's make sure these people understand what we're talking about. There is no law requiring a citizen of the state of Arizona or any other of the 50 states. There's nothing in the Constitution that requires you to get a Social Security card. That's correct. And the reason they can't make you do that is because they have no jurisdiction over you. That's correct. And the reason they have no jurisdiction over you is because you've not given them jurisdiction. At least if you're not born in Washington, D.C., I'm going to take my own case, I was born in Tucson, Arizona. So I was not born in Washington, D.C., therefore I'm not a citizen of the United States, but I am a naturalized citizen of the United States by accepting my Social Security card. And you say, wait a minute, Ralph, I was told I had to get a card, and I'm still waiting for the person who's done that to show me where in law he's required to get a Social Security card. He's not. Why? Because you are not a citizen of the United States. You are a citizen of the state of Arizona, Alabama, Michigan, wherever it is. And you have been tricked into getting a Social Security card because you believe you have to. That's right. Now, let me tell you. How does this happen, Ralph? Well, I'm getting out of here. Let me tell one more little story here. I have a friend of mine 
who just uh, maybe a couple years ago uh, uh, wanted to have another child to add to his family. He now learned this point about being a naturalized citizen subject to the jurisdiction of the federal government. He decided not to have his child in the normal, traditional way through the hospitals. He learned he was uh, he's a Christian, so he and his wife decided to have their child through natural childbirth, not even seeking a doctor, turning the child over in prayer to God. If God wants a healthy child, he'll produce one. They decided to go through this. They learned the Lamaze thing, all the techniques. He learned how to become a midwife himself, to have the child naturally. At the last minute, they had a complication. I don't know what. That's not really pertinent to the story. But in any event, he did debated whether to go to the hospital. He went to the hospital. They delivered the child naturally. Fortunately, both mother and daughter uh, were, are doing fine. Now the child's two or three years old. But they were told they had to get a social security card or they couldn't get their child out of the hospital. That's what they tried to avoid and they weren't able to succeed. Ralph, they did the same thing to us when who was born when we refused to fill out and sign the birth certificate. Yes. They told us we could not take our child home. And uh, I'm telling you right now, uh, that hospital has never seen, <laughs> has never seen a ruckus like I raised on that day. And uh, the outcome of it was we did take her home. Mm. Without. Without. Without signing, without filling out, without any of the things that they required us to do. Mm. Now, it was not easy, and we had no idea what was going to happen. Mm. But we also understood that uh, with, without signing that document, they could not take that child. We knew that. Yes. If we had signed that document and then refused to fill any of it out, then they could. So let's go back now. What, what, you're, what Bill is just saying is further amplification and further proof of what I'm contending here. Let's go back now to the 14th Amendment. It says, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. So now, if you get a social security card, you now have joint citizenship. You're a citizen of the state of Arizona or Michigan or Alabama and the citizen of the United States. Now, what, what Bill is pointing out is that what, what he was asked to do was to place his daughter under the jurisdiction of the government of the United States by signing the, whatever the form was. That's the correct. Certificate. The birth certificate is used as a voluntary acceptance or giving, if you will, of your child to the government so that the government has jurisdiction over that child. You do that voluntarily. Now, Bill, <laughs> Bill did not do it voluntarily. He was able to get his daughter out without the birth certificate. But, but that's only because I've done a lot of study and I, I understood what was happening there. Most people don't. Uh, they have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea what they're doing or giving up when they when they uh, go in and, and uh, sign the documents and uh, take out a social security number. But most people do that through fraud. They're told that they have to get a social security number and they're usually told that by an employer who says, you can't go to work here unless you have a social security number. What people don't understand is they don't have to get a social security number and the employer has no right to make that a condition of employment and if he does, you have the right to sue him. That's correct. So you know, what we've got here, Bill, is we have been tricked and deceived. That's correct. By whom? Our founding fathers and those who wrote the 14th Amendment. But they knew that in the beginning when they talked about this as being the, quote, great experiment, unquote. And they talked in all of their correspondence and their letters. Uh, they knew that we would not be able to keep our sovereignty or keep our creator endowed rights. Uh, under the protection of the Constitution. And they talked about the fact that the people will give it away in exchange for some benefit. Okay. That's exactly right. What you, what you just said is true. Now, let's go back to what Bill just tried to say. I'll say in my language, this is amplification of what Bill said. What he just said was that we have given away our sovereignty over ourselves for a benefit. What benefit? The Social Security uh, provisions later on in our life. They tricked us with a what they what they call the bait and switch. Thing. They've given us this promise of great of taking care of us in our old age if we will give up our sovereignty and citizenship. And, right. citizen. and this has its roots in the common law, where the common law says that anyone who accepts a benefit from someone else gives up their freedom because the person bestowing the benefit has the right. 
to determine how the benefit is going to be used. Yes. Okay, now let's 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 uh, let's take one of the most commonly uh, common challenges to what we just said. They said, wait a minute, wait a minute, Ralph, come on, let's get back to Article 1, Section A. You'll read here that Congress only has these certain powers. It doesn't have this broad power you say it does. And let's go back to Article 1, Section 8, and we'll read just parts, once again, of these grants of power uh, that those who, who claim that this is all constitutional, what they're doing even today is constitutional. And let's go back to the powers that our founding fathers granted in Congress. Uh, like the power to lay and collect taxes, to borrow money, to regulate commerce, to establish naturalization laws on abbreviating these, to coin money, uh, punish uh, uh, counterfeiters, post files, etc. And then it says the uh, it has the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. So they've got the power to make an army and then enforce the army because it's constitutional. So that makes sense. So those who say, wait a minute about this, there must be an error because what our government is doing is constitutional. It's all listed there somehow. I love to ask them this question. If our government operates on specified powers listed 1 through 16, 18, and the 10th Amendment, which we'll cover in a minute, where did Congress get the power to tax us to build a space telescope? We'll take about, talk about that after we get through the break. Okay, you guys keep that thought, remember that, and we'll talk about that as soon as we come back. But right now, it's time to take our break, folks. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this very short pause. Hello, folks. That break didn't take very long, and those of you who are in tune with this show know exactly what I'm going to talk about now. My question to you is this. If you have not yet taken steps to fulfill your responsibility to your family and to yourself by investigating the possibilities that are available to protect your assets, everything that you've worked for all your life, against what we know is coming very shortly in the future, then I want to know, what's holding you up? Why haven't you done this? What is wrong with you? Are you going to be the person sitting on the corner when I walk by, crying your eyes out, saying, somebody's picking on me because I've lost everything that I had because of inflation, economic collapse, depression, all of the things that we're expecting to happen. Now, recently... Mr. Greenspan, and you know who he is if you don't, again, you're listening to the wrong program, testified in front of Congress on C-SPAN. If you were watching it, you heard him say that they could no longer hold inflation in check, that they were expecting, more or less, runaway inflation. And they're expecting it very soon. What happens in inflation? The value of the dollar declines, which means whatever you own loses value, and in order to buy a loaf of bread, you must have more dollars to buy the same loaf of bread that less dollars would have bought a week before. Now, if you understand history, and if you understand the relation of inflation to hard assets, gold and silver, then you know that you should be on the phone right this moment, because I'm going to play some music in just a, just a couple of, of seconds here, and you've got time to do it. You should be on the phone to Swiss America Trading asking for information. You owe it to yourself, and if you're a listener to this show, if you derive real work from the hour of the time, then you owe some loyalty to Swiss America Trading because they pay for this airtime. None of the money goes in my pocket. That's not the purpose of this show. The money they spend pays for this airtime because they believe in the hour of the time. They believe in the message that we're putting out to the world. So get up off your butt right now and call 1-800-289-2646. Don't procrastinate. Don't mess around. I don't want to hear you crying. And if I do, I won't have any sympathy for you. You all know me by now. I'm trying to get you moving. I'm trying to get you prepared. I'm trying to wake up the sheeple, empower the people, and save freedom for the world. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Tell them that you listen to this program, The Hour of the Time. Mention my name, William Cooper. 
and you'll receive a free newsletter on protecting your future. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Folks, by protecting your future, you're helping to protect the future of this radio broadcast, the hour of the time, and freedom for the world. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. And you'll be glad that you did. Before we get back into the program, folks, I want to let you know that Ralph has done an awful lot to help wake the sheep, empower the people, and save freedom for the world, just like I've been doing. And I'm using sort of my my cause to promote his, because we are brothers on the battlefield, and you can be too. Let me just give you some of the, the things that, that Ralph has to offer. He has a uh, 33-page booklet entitled Clinton's Conspiracy. Bill Clinton supports it. The driver shot Kennedy. And folks, you've heard about that on this program, a two-hour video cassette. The Unseen Hand, one of the best primers to get you acquainted with the conspiracy. 488 pages, ladies and gentlemen, of some of the best research that I've ever seen into the conspiratorial history of the world. And then he wrote another book called The New World Order, which you heard me quote extensively during our series on the history schools. That's a 388-page book, and I'm telling you, if you read that book and research the references that he has given, and you still believe Freemasonry is just a fraternal organ existing for the good of the community, then I've got to tell you, you've lost your mind. God exists. There is no other option. 26-page book. The Kennedy Assassination, Conspiracy and Cover-Up, another two-hour uh, video. Vietnam, America's Betrayal and Treason, uh, two videotapes, three hours of lectures, and a 93-page booklet. The Kennedy Assassination in Vietnam, set of three videotapes. You know, a lot of this you've heard on this program. Now, don't get me wrong, folks. Ralph Everson does not agree with everything that I have discovered in my research, and I certainly don't agree with everything that he's discovered. But I'll tell you this. Uh, I think we probably concur and agree on about 90% of what uh, each and the other has uh, uncovered and, and is trying to alert people to. But you know that's not the purpose of this broadcast. The purpose of this broadcast is wake you up, get you to do your own research, to teach you that you can think for yourself, and nobody has to tell you what the truth is if you will just learn that you are the ultimate, the ultimate, penultimate, if you will, power in, in the United States of America, and that you have to learn to think for yourself, and if you can't, you're just a puppet on somebody's string, and when they pull that string, as you've heard me say a million times, you're going to dance. Is that what you want to be? No, of course not. You know, there's a lot of other things. This is a, a pretty extensive catalog here, and you need to get it. Write us with a self-addressed stamped envelope, and we'll send you this catalog. Just 29 cent self-addressed stamped number 10 envelope. Send it to this address, folks. Ralph. Just send it to Ralph. You don't need to remember anything else. Ralph. P.O. Box 536. P.O. Box 536, Tucson, Arizona. For those of you who haven't been out west here, Tucson is spelled T-U-C-S-O-N. Tucson, Arizona, 85702. Once again, Ralph, Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. I'll repeat this toward the end of the program. I'll also put it on the hotline. So if you missed it tonight, you can call the hotline tomorrow and get this address. Now, Ralph has, uh, Ralph Epperson, my good friend, has consented to help out what we're doing here by giving us a small percentage of whatever you order from his catalog. So whenever you order from his catalog, please specify that you're ordering from the offers through the catalog after you get it through the mail uh, from listening to the hour of the time. And that will help us out here. It will help Ralph out. And with this fantastic research that he's done, it's going to do more than help you out, folks. It's going to get you up out of that easy chair, off the couch potato status, and into action to help us save this great nation of ours. Uh, let's get back to what we were talking about, Ralph. Uh, we left off. You were you were a question. That's right. You were posing a question, and the audience out there has been thinking about it. <laughs> let's, let's get right back to it. Let's get back to Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution of the United States. 
and let's let's examine the powers of Congress that they have over the rest of the uh, of the uh, the uh, Union, meaning the states of the 50 states of the United States of America. Those powers are specified in this document. Like I said before, the power to coin money, to establish post offices, uh, uh, promote science, uh, to uh, declare war, raise and support armies, provide and maintain an army, etc., a navy, etc. These are all spelled out. And then the Tenth Amendment says uh, something to the effect that, in fact, I'll feed it, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states or reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people, which means if we didn't give you the power, you don't have it. So those who say, wait a minute, Ralph, I'm sure that when Congress takes this action, it's all constitutional, I'd love to ask them this question. If this is true, where did our founding fathers list the power to tax the American people to build a space telescope? The Hubble Space Telescope orbiting the Earth right now was built with taxpayers' money. Never mind that it doesn't work. (laughs) (laughs) But where did Congress, where did our founding fathers envision such a thing? If you could play Buck Rogers and go back to uh, to the founding of the nation, and when you write the Constitution, say, gentlemen, I'm from your future. I want you to empower Congress to have the power to tax the American people to build a space telescope. They would have said, what? What is a space telescope? You mean space meaning something in the air someplace? If you're going to get something up there, it will fall to the ground. And what is a space telescope? What, can, what is a telescope? You mean something that's going to take pictures? Or look at things? What are you talking about? They would have had no idea. Our founding fathers could never have envisioned such a thing as a space telescope. But ladies and gentlemen, you and I, and we all know, it's there. How did it do it? Under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. It's a constitutional grant of power to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever. They decided they wanted to do it, and they did it. But just for those who who are maybe confused out there, it's the power to legislate in all cases, but only within the geographical boundaries and over those citizens of that area called Washington, D.C., and property that has been deeded and ceded and owned by them constitutionally. Is that correct? Well, except, that's true, except there's one more comma, a naturalized citizen who's given them the power to legislate in all cases whatsoever. Correct. And that's you and I. That's the point I want to make. We have given them our sovereignty to Congress under this grant of power. We have now become a naturalized citizen of that government, and the power they have over us in the, in our state of Arizona, wherever we live, is the power to legislate in all cases whatsoever. That means that they can tax us to build a space telescope because we've given them that power under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. You could list probably 90% of what the federal government's doing today and argue where is that listed in the Article 1, Section 8, the remainder of the the section. Now, we know, and our forefathers argued, that the rights that we have are not rights granted by the Constitution, but are creator-endowed rights. Now, if they're creator-endowed rights, how in the world could we give them up? I mean, how do you give up something that was given to you by God? Well, you can see, we can do that. You can give up your rights to God if you choose. That's what they're saying. Your rights are there, but only you can give them up or your God can take them away. Government has no power to take them away, and they didn't take them away, Bill. You gave them. I don't mean you maybe personally, but let's say you collectively, all of us. We gave up our inalienable rights because we have the power to do that. They belong to us. Well, not really give them. We don't have the power to give them up, but we have another power that was also given to us, or, or uh, was was granted uh, as as not being taken away from us in the Constitution. We have the right to contract. Okay, and and that is in fact really what we're doing. We're okay. contracting those rights away. Okay, I would argue I'm, we're both saying the same thing. You're saying that the right to contract. They've asked us to form a contract with the government. That's right. And when we did that, we thought we yeah. had to form the contract by getting our social security card. Yeah, um, I hope you. I hope you don't misunderstand. I'm not trying to nitpick with you, but there's a lot of people out there that don't understand what we're talking about. And what I'm trying to do is is focus in so that where I might understand it and you understand it, and both of us sitting here know exactly what we're talking about. There's somebody out there shaking their head and saying, what do you say? Okay, let's take the next step about this. Now I'll get into Ross Perot. Okay. Let's talk briefly about this uh, this uh, grant of power that we've given them 
Uh, one of the other things that we've given them is the power to tax us under the income tax. The income tax is voluntary. Have you talked about this in, in the past in your program? Oh, have I talked about it? <laughs> have I talked about it, folks? Let me hear. I want to hear the yell all across. Let's hear the big cheer all across the country. <laughs> Boy, have we okay, talked about okay. it. Let's talk about for those who have never heard this before, or let's reinforce it again so that they make, make it abundantly clear there is no power to tax us directly under the basic Constitution of the United States of America. In fact, the Constitution specifically forbids a direct tax and specifies exactly the taxes that can be levied and exactly how and only how they can be levied. That's absolutely correct. Now, how then do they have the power to tax us on our incomes? Very simple. We get our we get our little W four form and we check United States citizen. Okay. We fill out how many uh, uh, exemptions we have. Social security. Exemptions. And we put down our social security number and we list our dependents and we send this thing in and we have now contracted to pay voluntarily a direct income tax, which is forbidden by the Constitution in any other way. That's correct. Do you understand what I'm trying to point out? There's one more example of this go that for I can think of, and that is the in fact we got one more. Let's talk about the postage stamp. Let's okay. go back now to the to the draft. Now I don't remember this because I was I was not drafted, but when I joined, I joined the reserves years ago. I don't remember going through the ceremony. Maybe you can help me, Bill. I have been. I wasn't told. drafted either. I was I was a stupid. <laughs> okay, okay let's, let's go back to. I hadn't learned yet. Maybe you can remember the, the ceremony you went through, but I have been told I cannot confirm this. That it didn't happen to me. So I don't remember this. But during that ceremony, were you not asked to take one step forward? Absolutely, yes. Okay, what was that for? If you're a United States citizen, you were you were volunteering. That's volunteering. Right. You were volunteering to take one step forward to give them the give the army the jurisdiction over you. First, first thing that I remember is they asked if there was anybody in the room who was not a United States citizen. Yes. Those people, if there were any, were asked to step aside. Yes. Everybody else was asked to take one step forward, raise their right hand, and repeat after me. The purpose of the one step forward is for you to voluntarily give up your sovereignty to the federal government and to the jurisdiction thereof and to this power to them, the government. That's what they do it for. It's a voluntary act. They said voluntary. They even mentioned it. That's great. Now, there's, there's, some, there's something else about this that I've since learned. If they send you a draft notice and say you have to report for a physical and for induction into the United States Military Service on such and such a day because your number is such and such, you must do that. You, there's no way that you can get out of doing that. Whether you're a conscientious objector or what, you have to make that known there. But you must report, you must go through the physical, you must go through the process. But what I've learned is no one at any time ever can force you to sign your name on any document or to raise your hand and take an oath. <laughs> and anyone who refused to resign their name or refused to take the oath was sent home That's right. and was not inducted into the military right. service. And everybody was coming up with these unbelievable excuses and reasons and masquerading as if they were homosexual to try to get out of being drafted when all they had to do was refuse to take the oath and they, they could not have been drafted. So, well, but the point is very clear. Once again, it's the further evidence that I believe our contentions are correct. They are getting you to volunteer to submit yourself to the jurisdiction of the United States government by stepping forward voluntarily. I think it's a tremendous evidence that they are extremely crafty and cunning and slick and tricky <laughs> and uh, that we really aren't exercising the mental powers that we should be when we're dealing with these people. Can I give you we must be on our guard at all the time. That's correct. Let me give you one more example of this that, I, that occurs to me. There might be others that maybe some of your listeners might have that could get in touch with you or somehow. But let's go to number four. Uh, example number four is the use of the postage uh, stamp. The, the, uh, I have been told, in fact, I've, I've done this myself, uh, you can mail mail between the 50 states under what they call non-domestic mail for two cents a half ounce. And I have seen it work repeatedly. Now, by the way, I don't want to make it clear. I'm not recommending you do that or suggest that. But if you want to know more about this, write to me 
at the P.O. Box Bill gave you to Ralph Epperson or just Ralph and say, tell me more about this, the, ma- the mail thing, but let me take one more last step. There is, when you write mail to Washington, D.C., it's called domestic mail, and you have to pay the 29 cents or the half ounce, wherever it is, or the ounce. But if you mail mail inside the United States, the United States of America, the 50 states, it's only two cents, half an ounce, and the post office is accepting this stuff without question, even today. From, like, uh, Tucson, Arizona, to Birmingham, yes. Alabama. Two cents, half an ounce, because it's inside the United States of America. That's it's right. It's not going to a foreign nation, a foreign government called the government of the United States. And it's also called drop mail, isn't it? I don't know about Something that. Something like that. Could be. But if you want to know some details on that, just drop me a note in the P.O. box, and I'll give you some further details. This yeah. is really I've got to warn you, though, it doesn't work all the time. I have been, uh, uh, and, and I did this, by the way, when I lived in Camp Verde, uh, somebody sent me a non-domestic letter with a two-cent stamp on it. When I went to the post office, I found this little yellow slip in my box. I went up and handed it to them, and they said, oh, you have uh, uh, 27 cents postage due. And I looked at it. It was, uh, it was clearly labeled non-domestic mail. It had the, uh, the law clearly stated, and it had a two-cent stamp on it as required by law. And I said, I'm not going to pay 27 cents. I want my mail. And if you refuse to give me my mail, I'm going to sue you for interfering with the delivery of my mail under the law, which is a felony. And this really created quite a consternation because they didn't know what to do. They didn't want to be sued. They didn't want to be charged with a felony. And they didn't want to be liable for interfering with my mail. At the same time, this letter had been intercepted by a postal inspector who had directed them to collect 27 cents. Well, what eventually happened was that I filed suit in small claims court for 27 cents. Mm. And the post office paid me my 27 cents. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a friend of mine, and I will not name him on, on your program, Bill, if you don't mind. That's okay. But, but I have a friend of mine who, who tells me that you he's got the papers that you use, the procedures you use to, to object, as you've done, so maybe not the same procedure, but to guarantee that you get your mail for two cents. So once again, if you want to know about this, drop me a note to P.O. Box. Now, let's talk now about this uh, this uh, uh, individual by the name of Ross Perot running around the United States uh, talking uh, about we the people being the power of this government. If I may, I'd like to start with the example of Ross Perot who spoke in Tucson, uh, Arizona, just about maybe three four weeks ago, something like that. He came to our city. He was advertised as an open speech, so a lot of us went to hear him. After he got through with the amenities of saying how nice it was to be in Tucson, what a great group he looked like, and he was buttering us up for his campaign run maybe in two or three more years, the first words out of his mouth were, we are the boss. That's his lesson. He's telling us we are the boss. And I started to almost cry because I said, Ross, under that kind of... I, I was not able to ask him this question. There was 2,500 of us in the auditorium. Yeah, but we know what you mean. You were thinking that. You wanted to ask him, right? Bet I, if I could have... In fact, I even told you that he was standing up and challenging him, even getting thrown out to make my point. We are not the boss. Let's go back. What is the purpose of the Constitution, Ross Pro? If we are the boss and we decide in all things, who needs a Constitution? What's the purpose of the Constitution? To limit government. Period. That's, that's right. So Ross Perot saying we don't need the Constitution. We shall decide in all things. And let's take the second thing. Ross Perot's advocated during the campaign of 1992 that all of us be given or buy or somehow get a little electronic device. He wants to, if he was president, he'd get on the air and tell us, uh, here's the problem we've got, and here's these uh, suggested solutions, two or three, and you can push a button for which one you want to do, and then when we all decide together, the majority sides, that's what we'll do. That's the way to do it. And which tenet of the Communist Manifesto is that? <laughs> Go ahead, which one? It's, it's the one called One Man, One Vote. One Vote. This is a republic. Democracy is a code word for socialism. And if you want, if you really want one man, one vote, and you want the people to decide everything by a popular vote, you have no idea what a can of worms and what kind of oppression you're going to open up. Because whoever is the majority will get rid of the rest. Whoever uh, wants uh, the greatest number that wants uh, something from the government is going to get it. And whenever that happens, what usually transpires is the majority votes itself everything until there's nothing left and a dictator has to stand up to clean up the mess and take charge. Well, that's, I, I, I there are plenty of examples of that throughout history. 
Uh, two things I'd like to comment about Ross Perot. Uh, number one, I, I would have loved to have asked him this question. He believes that we are the boss. Let me ask him, ask him this question. I live in Tucson, which is part of Pima County, which is probably three-fourths desert and one-fourth uh, uh, you know, houses and buildings and uh, cities. So let's just presume in our little example that during this Ethiopian famine, our government benevolently decided to help these people. Let's just make it 500,000 of them. And they moved them to Pima County because it's similar to terrain, desert, and they gave them water and everything they needed, needed to survive. Yeah, they go from a place where there's no food to a place where there's no water. That makes sense to me. Am <laughs> <laughs> I to ask you why you live in there, Ralph? <laughs> in, my, in my example, they even give them the water, Bill. So come on, they're, they're, these people are now able to survive in uh, Pima County. And let's just say that after five years, they become naturalized citizens, the majority. And let's just say that of the 500,000, 400,000 were adults able to vote, let's say. And they went to the county government and said, listen, we are now the majority in the Pima County, and we want to make cannibalism legal. Ross, what's the answer? We are the people. We are the boss. The majority of the people in Pima County would make cannibalism illegal sure. in Pima County. Sure. Ross, you're the boss. Are we all like blacks? Let's kill them all. Yeah. Ross, what is to prevent that from happening? The Constitution of the United States. That's correct. Why? Because the Constitution says Congress shall pass no law restricting man's rights, his inalienable right to life, liberty, and property. Notice what happened. If we advocate what Ross Perot is advocating and we support him, we've lost the Constitution because we, the people, will start making laws that violate the rights of individuals. Well, he has said on many, many occasions, not just one, but many occasions, that the Constitution is old, it's outdated, it was created over 200 years ago by a bunch of old men who were not acquainted with the problems of the modern day and could not have foreseen these problems and that the system doesn't work mm -hmm. and that we have to completely redo the whole system. He is uh, advocating a constitutional convention to redo the, the supreme law of the land, the Constitution. All of these people are, are leaving out the part that the Constitution is a living document. It can never be too old are outdated, mm -hmm. and the fact that it is not being changed or has not mean, been changed means that the procedure that's set into place whereby we can change it if it's necessary has not been called forth because we don't believe that it's outdated, we don't believe that it needs to be changed, and we don't want anybody messing with it. So who, really, is Ross Perot? Well, <laughs> maybe we'll answer that at first in the program. Let me tell you what we did in Tucson about Ross Perot's appearance at, our, at the University of Arizona Auditorium. Uh, I, uh, this is me, and I did this, uh, Ralph. Uh, I, <laughs> I printed up a flyer, one-page flyer, just very brief. I said, Ross Perot balanced the budget by enforcing the Constitution. And I listed on that sheet of paper the 18 grants of power, actually 17. I deleted Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, and asked Ross Perot to enforce the Constitution and eliminate government, at least parts of it. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Ralph, I want to thank you for being our special guest tonight. Again, folks, send for this uh, catalog. Uh, you've got to read. You have got to. Absolutely. You've got to read The Unseen Hand and his other book, The New World Order, which I have quoted from many times on this program. It is a must for anybody who's trying to understand what's going on in the world today. Send for this catalog, send a self-addressed stamp size number 10 envelope to Ralph. Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. That's Ralph. Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. And whenever you order something out of that catalog, folks, Tell them that you're ordering it from the shows that you heard on the hour of the time, and Ralph would share a small portion of the money that you send in with our efforts here so that we can continue to bring you the information that we do. Good night, and God bless each and every single one of you. Across America and around the world, you're listening to the hour of the time. I'm William Cooper. Tonight, Ralph Epperson, take three. Folks, have we been bamboozled? It's Superman. It's Superman the model for the new group race for the new world order. 
Ralph and I are going to find out as we find out just exactly who these people are in their own words as Ralph Epperson reads from his little magic book that convinces people, yes, there is a conspiracy and these are the people who are carrying it out. Welcome, Ralph, to the Hour of the Time. Well, thanks very much, Joe. It's a real pleasure to be with you and your listeners again today for hour number three of our of our discussion of the New World Order. You've got uh, a little magic book there which you, uh, <laughs> that incriminates a few people, doesn't it? Well, what I've done, Bill, is I've accumulated a series of, uh, of quotes out of various books. I've actually photographed the exact page on my floor machine and photocopier in Tucson. And uh, so I just thought we could go through these one after the other and uh, discuss in their own literature to prove our contentions. These things will prove that what we you and I have been talking about for years. Okay, folks. Now, you heard that. Now, you know what you're supposed to do when you listen to this show. show. You should have a tablet, a paper beside you, a pen or a pencil. And as we go through this, Ralph is going to give the name of the book, the exact page that the information is found upon, and um, he might even give you the paragraph. But he's going to quote from their own words. And uh, we're just going to do a whole hour of this and see if we can't uh, put a noose around somebody's neck. And maybe if all of you out there pull hard enough, uh, we can get rid of the New World Order in short shrift. Uh, Ralph, why don't you go ahead and start? Well, it might be a good place to start uh, with the speech that was given in October, in fact, on October the 27, 1941, by Franklin Roosevelt. As you know, this was just before World War II, uh, which started shortly after uh, the Pearl Harbor event in uh, December of 1941. So Roosevelt went on nationwide radio to tell us about the New World Order. I want to read this quote, just about two paragraphs. Hitler has often focused, and let's identify Hitler as meaning the head of the German government who was starting World War II. Hitler has often protested that his plans for conquest do not extend across the Atlantic Oceans, but his submarines and raiders prove otherwise, and so does the entire design of his New World Order. I have in my possession a secret map made by Germany but in Germany, rather, by Hitler's government, by the planners of the New World Order. And your government has in its possession another document, a document made in Germany by Hitler's government. It is a detailed plan which, for obvious reasons, the Nazis do not wish to publicize just yet, but which they are ready to impose a little later on a dominated world if Hitler wins. And then this is the key. It, this plan, it is a plan of Hitler to abolish all existing religions. Now, where did you find that quote, Ralph? That quote is in a book called The Bible Speeches of the Day, published in uh, New York City. Um, it's in November 15, 1941, volume 8, uh, page number 3. Now, you talked about New World Order there. Hitler talked about the New World Order? Yes, exactly. You mean that's not something that George Bush just made up off the top of his head to get the American people to go, to, go along with Desert Storm? No. No, he's talking here about the same identical New World Order that George Bush wants. The New World Order is out to abolish all existing religions. So what Mr. Roosevelt was telling us is actually accurate. And I want you to know in one simple sentence that the, the New World Order of Adolf Hitler is no different than the New World Order of, of George Bush. And wow, you're the only one besides me who's ever made that statement. <laughs> all you people out there who, uh, who thought that uh, Bill Cooper wasn't quite leveling with you, now you've heard it from somebody else. And, and it's the truth. Go ahead, Ralph. Well, Roosevelt's right on target. He's telling us the truth. Uh, the New World Order is out to destroy all organized religions. Now, this is a quote from Morals and Dogma, page 734. Morals and Dogma now is kind of like the, uh, it's the book they give to new recruits in the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, or at least they used to, didn't they? That's, that's, that is a contention made uh, that the book is no longer being given to the Masons of the 14th degree. I was in the Masonic Lodge building in Tucson. I'm, I want to share with you, I'm not a Mason, never been a Mason, but I went there one day to do some research. I couldn't find Mackey's Encyclopedia at the University of Arizona, so I went in, I called the uh, Lodge. That's because I got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, maybe so. I might be where it was. So I went to, uh, to uh, in 1985, went to the uh, Scottish Rite uh, Temple, as they called it, in Tucson. I called ahead and asked if I could come in and look for Mackey's. They said yes. So when I got in there, I uh, I did some reading, and the, a couple of masons came in the room to wonder who I was and why I was curious, and I didn't want to tell them. <laughs> I just said I was curious. I just want to know more about masonry. 
So they asked why, and I said, I'm just doing uh, reading and researching on the study of Masonic Masonry. At that time, in 1985, he went behind the counter and showed me a copy of the Morals and Dogma that they said they gave to every Mason at the 14th degree. Now, Rex Hutchins has written a book called A Bridge to Life, and in there he says that they no longer give this book to the Masons at the 14th degree. Now, you can take whichever choice of uh, position you choose. Uh, well, I believe, it may be that, the, that certain lodges did and certain lodges didn't, or, or maybe all of them did at one time, and now maybe only a few lodges do. Uh, independent lodges do have a lot of leeway to act independently as long as they don't violate the Constitution of the Scottish Rite of, of Freemasonry or the Constitution of their lodge. Well, let's talk about who the author was. Well, I know you told your listeners who the author of the book Morals and Dogma was, oh, and yes. significant he was, but just for those who maybe have never heard this before, uh, Morals and Dogma was written in 1871 by Albert Pike. And Albert Pike was the sovereign grand commander of Freemasonry from 1869, I believe, to 1891. For some 32 years of his life, this was the number one Mason in the world, Albert Pike. So this book can be relied upon as being authentic. It was published by the 33rd Degree Council in Washington, D.C. This is their book. There's no question about the authenticity of what I'm about to read to you. It's on page 734 of Morals and Dogma. There is in nature one most potent force, by means whereof a single man who could possess himself of it could revolutionize and change the face of the world. This force was known to the ancients. It was adored in the secret rites of the temple, under the hieroglyphic figure of Baphomet, or the Hermaphrodite ghost of Mendes. It is the serpent devouring his own tail. Let's talk about the secret rites of the temple. That is the Masons, and then they trace their issue back, as you know, and we'll prove as we continue through this, all the way back to the very beginning of time. The early ancient temples of the sun worship, etc. He said is a, uh, a, a worship from the hieroglyphic figure of Baphomet. Baphomet, I've seen drawings of him, is a drawing of a goat-headed uh, devil. He's, uh, as they said here, he's Hermit. I can have pronounce this word, Hermoth. Hermaphrodite. Yes, that means he's both male and female. This is the androgynous god of old that took the form of the goat or the ram when uh, the sun was in the house of the goat or the ram and uh, was worshipped actually in the main, uh, uh, the most famous place where, where this god was worshipped was in Mendes at the temple of Mendes. And Baphomet surfaces later, I'm sure when you get to that, in the Legend of the Knights Tempers, which, folks, we've proven on this show time and time again, is no legend at all. Okay, then lastly, he said, if this force is the serpent devouring its own tail. So we're talking here once again about the, the, the serpent and the serpent worship that's worldwide, 6,000 years old. The next thing I wanted to bring to your attention is the uh, Holy Bible that I have, a copy of, uh, it was given to me by a fellow who got one himself, uh, he's not a mason, he used to tell me he was not, but I have a, a, in front of me a copy of the, the cover of this Bible, and there's a picture of uh, what appears to be Jesus confounding the uh, priests or the Sadducees, whoever it was, in the temple, and then down the lower right-hand corner there's a star with one point down. It's a five-pointed star, and the one point is pointing down, and two points are pointing up. Now, this is the symbol of the Eastern Star, uh, but this Bible is indeed a Masonic Bible, and the, the cover of it, I saw, Bill, in your, uh, in your uh, library, you have a copy of the same Bible. On your particular copy, it's a uh, square of the compass. Apparently, this particular Bible was intended to be given to women in the Eastern Star, because the Eastern Star uh, uh, is shown on the cover upside down. Now, I want to talk about what it means when the star is one point down and two points up, I have a copy of a book that I only have in front of me is the uh, cover of it. It's a copy of a book called History of Freemasonry and Concordant Orders. The book was published in 1891 by the uh, by the board, uh, written by a board of editors, and published by the Fraternity Publishing Company in London, England, in 1891. Why don't you give the uh, the name of that uh, a book just one more time, just to make sure everybody gets a chance to write out. My readers uh, like to check us out, and, sure. and I encourage them. In fact, our uh, our uh, rule on this show is not to believe anything that anybody says or anything that anybody reads, no matter who wrote it, unless you can check it out for yourself. So. Most of our listeners do that. Good. The name of the book is called History of Freemasonry and Concordant Orders. It was published 
Uh, in fact, it says, History of the Ancient and Honorable Fraternity of Free and Accepted Freemasons and Concurrent Orders Illustrated, written by a board of editors. Uh, Boston and New York, USA, the Fraternity Publishing Company, London, England, 1891. Now, this book, uh, the, uh, on page uh, Roman numeral 3, meaning III, it shows the board of editors. There's probably 70 names, I believe, all of which are high-ranking 32nd uh, or 33rd degree masons. Each one is listed by name, his degree, and where he comes from. So this book is a compilation of the writings of maybe 70 different high-ranking masons. Well, 70 is, is also a significant number when you look at the makeup of the priesthood of the Temple of Solomon and also the Mormon Church. That's correct. Right. Now, let's go here now to page 49 of that book. Uh, Bill, you'll have to trust me, but if you want to look at this as well, you can confirm it. And here on this page 49 of this book, there's the caption on the top is the divine plan. We have a drawing of the two stars, one with the traditional one point up and the two points down. And then you reverse it over and you show two points up and one point down. And lo and behold, we see... Inside the drawing of the uh, one star, one the star with the one point down is the drawing of a goat. The beard is his uh, the lower point. His two ears are the two right angles, and his uh, two horns are the two points looking up. It's hard to describe, of course, the drawing of a star. And this is, in fact, the goat of Mendes. Exactly. There's no question. Or Baphomet. Baphomet is right here on page 49 of this book that we just described. I'm going to read you a short paragraph on page 49. It reads as follows. This star represents God. All that is pure, virtuous, and good when represented with one point upward. So when the point goes up, meaning the two points are down, Mm -hmm. the traditional version that we see everywhere around the world, that represents God with a capital G, uh, with uh, all that is pure, virtuous, and good. And then it says, but when turned with one point down, it represents evil. All that is opposed to the good, pure, and virtuous, in fine, it represents the goat of Mendes. And this is the symbol of the female, or women's branch of Freemasonry, called the Order of the Eastern Star. Yes. And you just read that, and I've witnessed this, that this came right out of a book written and published by Freemasons. Yes. In other words, they are admitting that when the, part, the star is turned over and one point down, it, quote, is opposed to the good, pure, and virtuous, in fine, it represents the goat of Mendes. So here we have a documented evidence that the Eastern Star is one point down, and it means the Goat of Mendes. The Goat of Mendes is, as you just read, Baphomet, and you name it. It's also absolute proof, I should say more absolute proof, piled upon all the other absolute proof that we put out to you, that Freemasons are, are liars. They've been lying to us all the time. And uh, uh, now, most Freemasons on the lower level of this pyramidal structure of organization are just a bunch of fools who join something that they know nothing about, thinking that they're going to get benefits out of this, and they do, material benefits. The spiritual, however, is a vacuum, and uh, they're held there uh, by the, uh, the these uh, supposed brotherhood friendships and uh, dedication to the order and the material benefits they get through their interaction in business with their with their fellow Masons. Uh, and there are real rewards. If a, judge, if a Mason, Masonic judge is sitting on the, on the bench and uh, you go into court and you're a Mason and the person facing you in that court is not a Freemason, then you won your case before before anybody even opens their mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, continue, Ralph. This is really interesting. I hope you're all taking notes and I hope you look these uh, publications up and I hope you verify everything that you're hearing here and everything that you've heard in the past and, of course, we'll hear in the future. Okay. The next thing, uh, these are all that pretty much at random, Bill. We just didn't see them, so put them in alphabetical order, so they're, they're nothing to do with any consistent plan. That's okay. We're just reading one after the other to document the case that what Bill has been saying and what I've been saying about the Masons and what they're involved with is legitimate. We can read it from your own material. Now, this particular quote comes from page 786 of Morals and Dogma. Page 786 of Morals and Dogma. It's going to talk about the colors represented in the hall inside the lodge. The hall, uh, in this degree, uh, this is probably later on, in one of the later degrees, I don't have the, name, the, the entire title here. It says, in this degree, the columns are white with black and red. The hangings are black and over that crimson. 
The colors black, white, and crimson, meaning red, appear in the clothing, and the key and balance are among the symbols. So here we have an admission that black and red and white are the three major colors of the Masonic Lodge. I want you to build in your mind, and all your listeners in your mind, picture the Nazi flag that we saw during World War II. It was a, it was a red uh, flag with a white circle in it, uh, representing probably about oh, maybe two thirds of the uh, of the flag, and then inside that was the black swastika. That's correct. And now the the white circle, of course, represents the sun. The swastika is a sun symbol, which we'll also confirm later. But the three colors in the Nazi flag were red, black, and white. And here we learn that in seven eight, on page seven eighty six of the Masonic Lodge, the colors black, white, and red are, are represented throughout the lodge, throughout the temple, uh, everywhere. Now, I have something to add to that. I have an 1898 edition of Mackey's uh, History of Freemasonry. And it's seven volumes, of which I have six of the volumes. Volume two is missing. By the way, if any of you can find uh, a volume two of uh, any 1890 edition of, of Albert Mackey's uh, History of Freemasonry, um, I'd be willing to purchase that from you. Uh, because that's the only volume that I'm lacking. But in this uh, in this set uh, of uh, the history of Freemasonry, published by Albert Mackey, uh, who is the ultimate historian for Freemasonry, uh, they have a section on crosses. Now, the thing that's really significant here is only one cross is listed, and they devote eight pages of this history of Freemasonry to this one cross, and that cross is the swastika, and they attribute an Aryan origin to it, and in this eight pages, and elsewhere in the history of Freemasonry, and also in the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, and many of their other books, they admit that they are an Aryan organization based upon the fact that the Aryan race is superior to all others, they are racist, and the swastika is their symbol. Now, I just found in this particular case, I agree with what you I know about the swastika, and we'll maybe even find some of the references to it later on in our readings today. Uh, but the, here we're talking about the colors black, red, and white. You see those three colors around the world as being the colors of many of the communist and socialist flags around the world. Black, red, and white. It's very common. I thought that might was kind of interesting. The Masons admit those are their three colors. Now, this is from a, a, a book entitled The Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manny P. Hall. Manny P. Hall is uh, a 33rd degree Mason. When he died a few years ago, the Masons acknowledged him as being one of the great, uh, quote, philosophers, which means writers and researchers in their terms, of uh, Freemasonry. This is on page 100 of his book entitled The Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manly P. Hall. Because this shows, it shows the world just how important Masonry is. You and I have been taught by the uh, Masons that they're nothing more than a group who meets on Thursday nights or wherever night they meet. And they, uh, they, uh, they put clown costumes on and uh, have burn centers, etc. We're just a fraternal organization existing for the good of your community. <laughs> okay, if you believe that, you really are, sheeple. <laughs> well, let's, let's read what they say, how powerful they are. Listen to this. This is page 100 of the Lost Keys of Freemasonry. Quote, Masonry is an ordainer of kings. And what's an ordainer of a king? That's the man that puts him on the throne. That's correct. Masonry is an ordainer of kings. Its hand has shaped the destinies of worlds. So this is not a little lodge on Thursday night. It's not out there to build burn centers and hospitals for the infirm children. This is an ordainer of kings, and its hand has shaped the destinies of worlds. That's power. We're just a fraternal organization existing for the good of your community. <laughs> now let's read this one. This is another book by Manny P. Hall that further talks about the power of the Masonic Lodge. This is a book called What the Ancient Wisdom Expects of Its Disciples. I'll repeat it again. What the Ancient Wisdom Expects of Its Disciples, written by Manny P. Hall. This is on page 58. Listen to this quote. The ancient initiates are the invisible powers behind the thrones of earth, and men are but marionettes dancing while the invisible ones pull the strings. We see the dancer, but the mastermind that does the work remains concealed by the cloak of silence. 
Does that sound like a lodge that meets on Thursday night? Not to me, it doesn't. Not at all. <laughs> now, folks, with bearing that in mind and understanding that Walt Disney was a member of this secret college, this hidden fraternity, go watch Pinocchio again. Go watch Pinocchio again and understand that when he was just the wooden puppet made by his master or father, Geppetto, that he was you. And he received the gift of the morning star, Lucifer. And listen to that song again, When You Wish Upon a Star. And then watch what happens to Pinocchio as he becomes an initiate of the hidden order. And this is what your children are being indoctrinated in. And then go back and look at a whole bunch of the other things that Walt Disney put out that your children are watching. And uh, understand, read the new biography that's out on Walt Disney, which I haven't read yet, but I've, I've derived all this information from my own research. Uh, he was uh, instrumental in the intelligence community. Every time they held a, a top-level secret scientific meeting where they discussed the exploration of space, representatives of Walt Disney Studios attended, and I can prove that and document it. But go ahead. I just want to show you how insidious these people are. Go ahead, Ralph. I'd like to, if I may, Bill, reread that quote. I want you to see exactly what, what, they're, what they're saying and also what they think of us, the average American. The person who sits by and believes the Masons are a group of uh, men who meet on there's nice. The ancient initiates. Now, the Masons acknowledge, as you know, Bill, and I know as well, they acknowledge their history back to the ancient initiation ceremonies of the ancient pyramids, etc. So the ancient initiates, meaning them as well, current, from them now to current, Absolutely. are the invisible powers behind the thrones of Earth. So the ancient initiates are behind the government that you and I see on the surface. And men are but marionettes. Who's that? Who's they, who are they talking about? They're talking about you and I. We are marionettes dancing while the invisible ones pull the strings. Bah. <laughs> bah. He said, we see the dancer, but the mastermind that does the work remains concealed by the cloak of silence. Now, folks, don't feel bad, because most of my life I was in the same situation that a lot of you find yourself in now, just learning about this and saying, gee, how could I be so dumb? How could, how could I be so blind? How could they be doing this to me and to everyone else? Uh, we all, we all have to face that somewhere in our life. We all have to recognize that we've been very stupid, very ignorant, very apathetic, and we have to uh, face that fault within ourselves and, and make a vow to change that and change it right now and never let it happen again. This is the purpose of this show, is to wake the sheeple, empower the people, give you powerful tools, show you that you have everything within yourself that it takes to turn this around. You don't need Trojan horse leaders. You don't need to look for some knight in shining armor riding up on a white horse to save you. If you're one of those people, then you're doomed because there aren't any people who are going to come and save you. You have to save yourself. Wake the sheeple. Empower the people. And once that's done, then we together can save freedom for the world. Ralph is one of the great warriors out here on the battlefield standing with me fighting this battle that many of you never even knew uh, was, was going on. Okay, let's keep going. This is not written by a, a Mason, but it's written by one who knows about the Mason. This is the book entitled The Externalization of the Hierarchy by Alice Bailey. Now, I do not know when this book was published. It doesn't say, as far as I can tell, but I believe, Bill, you probably confirmed. I think she wore around 1920, something that name Yeah, and she used to publish a newspaper called the, 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 uh, Lucifer. Yeah. And uh, she was, at one time, the head of Lucifer's Trust. But, uh, yeah, on the front end, we'll cover it right now. The, uh, on the bottom of this cover, the book, that I have, the, 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 what they call the frontispiece piece, Xerox, for this book that I've got in my hand, it says that this was published by the Lucis, L-U-C-I-S, published company in uh, New York, uh, United Nations Plaza in New York, and also the Lucis Press Limited in London. And the word Lucis is Latin for Lucifer. They used to call the publishing company the Lucifer Publishing Company. That's correct, until uh, a lot of people came down around their ears about that, and their offices were and still are in the United Nations building in New York. 
Okay, so this book is published by uh, the Lucif Lucis uh, <laughs> Publishing Company out of New York and London. This is page 670 of the book entitled The Externalization of the Hierarchy. If I may, let's just lay this groundwork down. What she's trying to do by this book is bring them out. She says the externalization, meaning make them visible. Yes, she wants to bring the hidden college out into the open. And a lot of people have talked about this. And in fact, even the man who, who, uh, who uh, was uh, President Clinton's mentor, uh, Carol uh, Quigley, Quigley, who wrote uh, Tragedy and Hope, said that the only thing he disagreed about their plan, and he was in, in concert with their plan to take over the world, the only thing he disagreed with is that they were doing it in secret. Yes, exactly. Okay, now here's page 670, just one quick paragraph. It's uh, I think one sentence, one long sentence long. The one thing which humanity needs today is the realization that there is a plan which is definitely working out through all world happenings, and that all that has occurred in man's historical past, past and all that has happened lately is assuredly in line with that plan. That's correct. And I might want to uh, remind you all that one of the greatest backers who, who really gave Bo Bryce his financial start was a man named Paul Fisher, who was a very highly degreed Freemason, who wrote a book also called The Plan. And in his book, he outlined a plan for putting in a new government in the United States of America, which would be a scientific government. Do away with our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, and change the whole form of government throughout the world. You've got to wake up. You must wake up. If you don't, then why don't you just reach down and put the chains on your own ankles and save everybody a lot of trouble? Well, going back to Alice Bailey, she's saying that everything that's happened, the major events of the past, are in accordance with the plan run by these initiatives. That's correct. And you can, you can trace this plan and people talking about this plan all the way back to the ancient Egyptian temples of initiation in ancient Cairo. Now we just learned that. The ancient initiates are involved with this plan. So we're seeing once again these people trace their own history back to the very beginnings of time. That's correct. And the Masons accept that as well. They claim that they trace their history back to this ancient mystery religion. Now this is from the book entitled the, uh, the uh, let's see, this is from uh, the, uh, Mary, I'm sorry, no, no, Rex Hudson's book called The Bridge to Light. This is page 150. This book, we, this is not talking about the eagle. Uh, as you know, Bill, the eagle is the national symbol of America. It's on the right-hand side of the back of the dollar bill. Uh, by the way, those of you that have the ability to uh, magnify that uh, that eagle or draw it on the back of our great seal might find it of some interest if you can count the feathers. On the right wing, there's 32, and on the left wing, there's 33. And I know people say that's some sure <laughs> coincidence or the artist made a mistake. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a coincidence. Uh, 32 degrees is the highest number of degrees in the, in, uh, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, and the 33rd degree is the meritorious degree. Uh, given for work toward the furtherance of the great plan. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly what that degree is awarded yeah. for, and that's what Bo Grice is working for now, if he hasn't already achieved it, uh, because he said at Freedom Call 90 in Las Vegas at the Showbo Hotel when he introduced himself that he was, and I quote, a 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite. Okay. Unquote. Let's go back to the Eagle. This is on page 150 of the book entitled The uh, Bridge to Light, written by Rex Hutchins. The, this emblem, meaning the eagle, is of great antiquity, figuring in the symbolic inventory of the Egyptians as the sun. As wisdom is attained through reason, the eagle is also symbolic of reason. Page 150 of Rex Lutz's book. Okay, hold that thought, because we've got to take our break now. Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back after this very short pause. Well, Ralph, this is a memorable series, and I'm sure that our listeners are not going to forget your guest appearance on the Hour of the Time for five nights in a row <laughs> for uh, quite a while, uh, because uh, you're really bringing to their ears some verification of a lot of the things that I've been telling them for many months, over a year now. And uh, you had, you didn't get any of this from me, did you? No, no. This is, once again, though, we're reading this from their own literature. You, you can't argue with the sources. These are from... 
These are their legitimate books that they published, they tell us, they acknowledge. Uh, in fact, Rex Hutchins himself gave me this copy of the book. I made him do something. By the way, it's interesting. Rex, Rex's book was published when he was a 32nd degree. After he published this book, the, the 33rd degree council published his book, uh, I've been told that Rex became a 33rd degree mason. So Rex has now been illuminated. He lives in Tucson, by the way. The interesting guest, if you never gave him to do it, I don't think he will. I want to apologize to you all out there for that little coughing fit. I breathed when I should have swallowed when I took a drink of coffee. Um, so please forgive me. Okay, let's continue with another quote from Rex's book uh, entitled The Bridge to Light. On page 142, he continues to discuss the uh, eagle as a symbol of the, of the Masons and of the ancient initiates. He says the eagle, on page 142, the eagle also represented the great Egyptian sun god, Amon Ra. It is a symbol of the infinite supreme reason or I intelligence. So here we see once again a connection back of the eagle, back very back to the very beginning worship of Amon Ra, the sun god. And there's also this thought about the uh, intelligence reason. Uh, th th this is throughout their literature. You can find it constantly references of the of the eagle back to the sun guy, etc. Well, this is connected with their with their Luciferian philosophy that man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive God and was set free from this bondage by uh, Lucifer through his agent Satan with the gift of intellect, primordial knowing, and that's what that's all about. They believe that Satan told them the truth that man surely will not die if he eats of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and will in fact himself become God. That's correct. And that's the promise of all these these mystery religions and even of the Mormon church. That's correct. Okay, now we're going back to the book entitled What the Ancient Wisdom Expects of Its Disciples by Manly P. Hall, page one uh, page twenty three. Here's what he said. In the remote past the gods pearl, small G gods, walked with man. These they labored with, preparing them to carry on the work of the gods. They left the keys of their great wisdom, which was the knowledge of good and evil. So here, once again, we're back to the Garden of Eden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's where it all starts. And all of you people out there who all your life have been sitting around saying religion is a joke, it doesn't mean anything. Let me tell you something. It may be a joke to you. You may be an atheist. You may not even believe in God. But it's the people who hold the power the power to make nations rise and fall, the power to make armies march at their beck, to, to chop off your head if they want to in the dead of night, if they believe it, then it's not a bunch of bunk, folks. It's something that you need to understand and know. And from my own personal point of view, if you don't believe in God, you have no protection from what's coming whatsoever. Okay, now, once again, we're going to continue with this thought. i got a couple of quotes, I guess, on this good and evil. This is from page 844 of Morals and Dogma. Another, uh, this is written by Albert Pike, another great Masonic writer. Here's what he's got. Now, he's reading this particular quote is in parenthesis, um, in quotation. So I'll read that first, and then we'll continue. Quote, Ye shall be like the Elohim, knowing good and evil. That's in quotes in italics. That thought, had the serpent of Genesis said, and the tree of knowledge became the tree of death. Notice what he said. Mm -hmm. that, Lucifer, that God gave us the tree of, of uh, the knowledge of good and evil and told us not to eat from there because if we did, we would become as God. Well, he said if we did, we would surely die yes. and would become as God knowing good and the difference between good and evil. So what, what God was doing was saying to mankind in the Garden of Eden, I am going to teach you what is right and wrong. You are not to decide, because when you do, as we know, you mess it up. Like Adolf Hitler decided he knew what was good and evil. Yeah. So what we're saying here is that the, the purpose of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Bible was to, to allow man to be free, but under the guidance and of the truth of the Bible, the truth meaning the moral absolutes. So here we now have this tree now becoming the tree of death. That's correct. For 6,000 years, going back now, this is a continuation of the quote on page 844 of Moses Dogma. For 6,000 years, the martyrs of knowledge, who are those? That's us. Toil and die at the foot of this tree, that it may again become the tree of life. So what they're saying is that they're hoping that after 6,000 years, they will allow this tree, us, to decide for ourselves what is right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And it will no longer be the tree of death, but the tree of life. 
And there's another distinction here that that is the basis for all of the misinterpretation of this by these people is that God said, if you eat of the fruit of the tree of life, you shall surely die and become as gods, and that you will know the difference between good and mm-hmm. evil. Now, he didn't say man will become God. He said man will be as God in the fact that he will know the difference between good and evil. He didn't say that man was going to become God, and he said the promise is that you will surely die. Now, the promise of Satan uh, to Adam and Eve was that you will not die, and you will become gods. And that's what these people believe. And it is false. It is a lie. And, um, well, if you don't believe me, just watch Shirley MacLaine as she grows old and dies while she's insisting that she's God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember that in her movie that they showed on television. She stands by the edge of the lake or the river or ocean or just with her arms outstretched, shouting, I am God. Yes. I love to ask those people that believe that. I say, listen, I'll tell you what you do. Why don't you get all of you together that believe that, and next Thursday morning, create a new universe. Do it all together. All of you can create anything. Yeah, right. Make a new universe. In fact, we'll move the other, move the other one over and make, make a new one. Let's continue now, once again, with this thought about good and evil. This is from page 169 of Morals and Dogma, written by Albert Pike. He says, the true use of knowledge is to distinguish good from evil. So once again, we are to use our mind to decide for ourselves what is good and evil. That's, That's what right. Now we're we'll just continuing somewhat at random. This is from the book entitled The Secret Destiny of America, written by Manny P. Hall. This is on, the, uh, on page 14 of the book in the very beginning. It says, we're talking here about the Great Seal of the United States. The design on the reverse of the Great Seal. Let's carefully uh, point out what that is. The reverse side is the one with the pyramid in the eye and the uh, phrases, and you accept us, and nobles for us, of course. He says, the design on the reverse of the Great Seal is even more definitely related to the order of the quest. The pyramid and the all-seeing eye represent the universal house surmounted by the radiant symbol of the great architect of the universe. That's right. And, re- and notice, folks, he said the order of the quest. Where have you heard that before? Mm-hmm. If you read my book, I mean, I make, it, I make the point that the people behind this call themselves... Uh, uh, the, the members of the order of the quest. Okay. So the order of Amongst the, other things. So they were the ones that brought, brought America up, uh, created, actually created America. That's they were right. the ones who set this nation up, according to Manly P. Hall. Notice, by the way, the title of his book. It's called The Secret Destiny of America. Mm-hmm. You say, wait a minute, this is what well, you mean, Secret Destiny? This is the land of the free, you know, the we the people, by the people, for the people? <laughs> no, no. You mean we're not determining our, our own future? Yeah. It's, it's, it's already been determined for us? That's what many of you all say. That's and exactly yet, the truth. <laughs> and we Americans stand by and allow this to go by unnoticed. It is bizarre. Here's, he's telling us we have a secret destiny. He knows what it is. He knows who's bringing it to us. We've already seen they, they, they're mocking us by calling us men or marionettes. We see the dancer, but we don't see the one pulling the strings, meaning on us. And we allow this. And then when you and I come along and try to point it out, we're the ones brought under uh, under. Uh, <laughs> well, right, but they mock us all the time because they think we're too stupid to figure it out. Oliver Stone and uh, Fletcher Prouty were mocking us in the movie JFK when you ask the question, who killed Kennedy? And then uh, back off and show us the Washington Monument, which answers the question. Uh, they mock us when they put the eternal flame, which is the symbol of their God, the fire, the sun, the light, Lucifer, on the grave of our fallen president. And we can go on and on and on and on. They've been throwing it on our face uh, for centuries. And we're just now beginning, some of us are, are not sheep anymore. Uh, and we're, we're, we're just now beginning to put all the pieces of the puzzle together and uh, wake up to our own potentials and our own powers and uh, that's what we want to do we want to wake you up we want to empower you we want to show you the the reality compared to the fantasy world that you've been living in all your life and we want you to get out here on the battlefield with Ralph and I and many other real patriots not Trojan horses uh, whom you've been following for most of your lives Okay, once again, now we're going to continue with our subject of the Great Seal. This is once again written from The Secret Destiny of America. This particular quote is on pages 177 and 178 of The Secret Destiny of America, written by Mary Palmer Hall, 33rd Degree Mason. But if this design 
on the obverse side. Now, the obverse side is the one with the ear, the pyramid, and the uh, I'm sorry, the obverse side is the one with the, the eagle. eagle. The right. reverse is the pyramid. That's correct. So we'll go back. If the design on the obverse side, meaning the eagle side of the seal, is stamped with the signature of the order of the quest, the design on the reverse is even more definitely related to the old mysteries. Absolutely. So that's what we got to understand. That the eagle is only a symbol of the sun god. What's this pyramid all about? What's the eye all about? Why the Latin phrases? He's saying that side has far more significance to our secret destiny than does the eagle side. It certainly does. And for those of you who have attended any of my workshops or lectures, I have shown you what the uh, the uh, order of the trapezoid uh, works out to in a formula, uh, which in the New Age movement is called the pyramid. Under the pyramid, uh, when something is created, its opposite is always cre is created at the same time. So the semblance of really creating this country under God, which they didn't, it was not the God that you thought it was, it was really the God which they worship, Lucifer, um, created the exact opposite, uh, which you have to see this worked out, but um, it, it's, it's on my tape, uh, the Atlanta, Georgia tape, which is seven hours long. Uh, for those of you who are interested, send for an info pack, and we'll send you information on that. And by the way, while I'm at it, send us a self-addressed or stamped envelope, a number 10 size self-addressed stamped envelope to this address, Ralph, R-A-L-P-H. We're just going to make it easy on you. P.O. Box 536. That's Ralph, Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona. 85702. For those of you who don't know much about Arizona, Tucson is spelled T-U-C-S-O-N. Again, send it to Ralph, Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. I'll try to repeat this again before the end of the program, but it will be on the hotline number. Uh, if you missed it, call the hotline and you can get this address. Send for this catalog. Uh, Ralph has written some wonderful books. The Unseen Hand, The New World Order. He has produced a lot of videotapes. They're all in here. He has graciously consented to give us a small percent of whatever uh, you purchase to help us in, in our research and to keep this radio show going uh, and, and just generally help out here with the, with the finances that we need. So when you order products from Ralph Epperson, you will also be helping out the hour of the time in the Citizens Agency Joint Intelligence. So please do that. Let's go, Ralph. I know you've got a lot of other stuff. We're going to keep going, right. This is once again from page 181 of The Secret Destiny of America by Manny Palmer Hall. He said, quote, there is only one possible origin for these symbols. He's talking about the symbols in the great seal of the United States. And that is the secret society's pearl which came to this country 150 years before the Revolutionary War. Now, let's stop right there. I've got two paragraphs, two quotes to read on this particular page, but let's just stop right there. If you take 1776 mm -hmm. minus 150, you're back to around the early 1600s, 1626, mm -hmm. when our, the pilgrims came to this country. That's correct. So what he's saying, we can argue all day about the, about the pilgrims, but what he's saying is that even if we can see those were decent, God-fearing men, at the same time they came, the secret societies came to America for what purpose? To create a secret destiny in the United States. And they're the ones who designed the great seal of the United States. Let me continue with the second part of that quote on page 181 of the secret destiny of America. He said, the great seal was directly inspired by these orders of the human quest. And that it set forth the purpose for this nation as that purpose was seen and known to the founding fathers, who were the ones who put the great seal together in 1782. Can you start to understand what we're talking about, Bill? I'm sure you know what I you know. Oh, yes. Yeah. Back I know when Columbus uh, set sail and discovered America, he had three ships, the, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. He bore on the sails of his ships the device of the Knights Templars, the red Maltese cross, and that was the symbol of the Knights Templars. He also planted a Templar flag on the beach of the first beach that he landed on as as the symbol of the society that, that he represented. He also represented, we know, the uh, Order of the Quest called the Order of the Golden Fleece or the Jason Society, and uh, and, and we found historical connections with between him and Sir Francis Bacon and many other people. By the way, you mentioned the Jason Society. I, yes. I do not know this. This is my interpretation of that name. Mm -hmm. uh, in June and December of each year, the sun appears to start to come back 
from its uh, journey to the south. Mm -hmm. uh, June to December, June 22nd to the 25th of December, of uh, the 25th of June, and the 22nd to the 25th of uh, December. If you take the months between those various dates, July, August, September, October, November, you get J-A-S-O-N. Mm -hmm. So Jason, then, I believe, I, mean, I don't know, this is my, my own opinion, stands for the six months, or the actual five months, July, August, September, October, November, J-A-S-O-N, for the five months when the sun is in its hierarchy coming back to mankind. That's correct. And if you didn't have so much stuff there to go through, and if you weren't the guest, I, I could spend a, a few hours yeah. just on the meaning of the uh, of, of Jason and the search for the Golden Fleece. This is all it has to do with the call to the secret societies and the search for the ultimate... Well, I'm not going to go into it. That's, that's another program. Go ahead, <laughs> okay. if, if I get started, I won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing about this, Bill, and I, I, I know you know this as well as I do. This material is so overwhelming. It's everywhere around us. It's not one book or two. It's hundreds and literally thousands of research. It's there. All we got to do is find it. That's right, and it's more interesting than any trip to Disneyland, than any novel that anybody could possibly ever write. And I just can't understand when I see somebody sitting down, reading a novel, learning nothing, filling their head with, with junk, uh, and they could be really researching the real history of the world and what really makes things work. And this is so interesting and so exciting. And, and then have the knowledge that it takes to take us out of their control where we can have some real say in our own destiny and determine the future of the world. And it just makes me sick that, that people don't understand this. They think that the fantasy book they're reading is, is, uh, is really good. They don't understand that nobody in this world has an imagination that can beat the real situation yes, exactly. in the world. <laughs> That's true. That's true. The next uh, quote I want to re re uh, refer to is from a book entitled The Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom, written by Benjamin Cream. Benjamin Cream is, as you know, Bill, running around the United States and I think probably Europe as well, talking about the appearance of the man that he calls the Christ, Lord Maitreya. And uh, this is a book that talks about Lord Maitreya and his, quote, reappearance, unquote. I want to read now from pages 28 and 29. Here's what he says. In every age, teachers have come forth from the spirit spiritual center to enable mankind to take its next evolutionary step. All perfect men in their time, all sons of men who became sons of God for having revealed their innate divinity. They are the custodians of a plan for the evolution of humanity and the kingdoms of nature. This plan works out through the agency of the esoteric, meaning concealed, hierarchy of masters, who substand all world events and constitute the invisible because unknown governments of the planet. So here he's saying, once again, there's a plan at work. Who's behind it? These ancient initiatives who have come forth to save us uh, and save mankind. Now, when he talks about the sons of God, he's really talking about the sons of light, and the light is Lucifer, and their God is Lucifer. And when they talk about God, they are not talking about the God that Christians and the followers of the prophet Muhammad and many other people in this earth consider to be God. That's correct. Okay, once again now, let's now uh, uh, start examining who this uh, hierarchy is. On page 181 of his book, entitled The Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom, Benjamin Cream says this, Marxism, meaning communism, Karl Marx, is not only a narrow economic theory, it is to do with the basis... I'm sorry, it's the basic. Let me start with it. Marxism is not only a narrow economic theory, it is to do with the basic laws of mankind's nature and interrelationship. Man is one. That essentially is what Marx is saying. Here's a man praising Karl Marx. And I'll tell you why in a minute. He's saying that this hierarchy is based on communism, Marxism. And I'm going to prove that again in a few more facts in the next book. On page 180 of the same book, The Reappearance of the Christ, he says this. Uh, here he's answering a question asked of him by someone interviewing him. He says, the author, the uh, questioner says, the interviewer says to Mr. Cream, you mentioned that Marx was working for the hierarchy. Now, who's the hierarchy? The group leading this, uh, this plan. That's correct. That's the leaders of the secret societies, plural, who are bringing about the new world order. And here's Mr. Cream's answer, quote, page 180 of the reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom. He says, quote, Marx was indeed 
a member of the hierarchy. So here he's admitting that Karl Marx is inside the inner circle of those planning our future in this new world order, this uh, secret uh, teaching, you name it. Now, Senator, Senator Joseph McCarthy was actually right in what he felt was happening to this country and that we'd been infiltrated and were being destroyed from within. He just didn't know what to call it, did he? That's correct. Well, Joseph McCarthy, was as long as he was talking down in the Communist Party and saying there are communists that work in America, he was praised as a great American hero. Mm -hmm. you, anyone that does that, if you attack Angela Davis and Ben, and ben or what's his name, Gus Hall, you're a great American. But the problem with McCarthy is he looks up and saw the connection between the government people and these communists. And that's when he got into trouble. He looked up. Don't look up. Look down. Well, that was his whole purpose, was to say that these people not only exist, and their goal is to create a worldwide communist government, but they're in our government, and I know who they are. That's right. And they, that's when they had to be destroyed. My cover is in my book, The Unseen well, so I think that's the real reason James Forrestal committed suicide, because he was initiated into the 33rd degree of Freemasonry, and then began to find out who the others were and what they were doing. And then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, he didn't really commit suicide, folks. He was thrown out that window. Yes, I believe that's true. I cover that in my book as well. Let's talk about that briefly. Of course, Saul was indeed right in the middle of this thing. You're right. right. He was an international banker, had become the first Secretary of Defense. He apparently, during the meetings at Yalta, Potsdam, and Turan, started to see what was going on in this world. And you're right, Bill. I commend you for saying that. He started to figure out, and within days of that, he was keeping diaries, by the way. That's right. He was fired by Truman. Yes, fired by Truman, and then picked off the streets of Washington, D.C., and taken to Bethesda and labeled, quote, insane, unquote. That's right. And then... And they, and they had no authority to do that, by No, way. there's no authority. They, they, they have no authority whatsoever. No. They confined him to the middle ward of Bethesda uh, Naval Hospital. Same place, by the way, where they took Richard Nixon. Yeah. And, uh... Nixon, by the way, mentioned that if he, if he went to Bethesda, he'd never come out alive. I remember that when he had his pleurisy in his leg. That's right. And uh, when he finally held a press conference at Bethesda, he, he told the members of the press corps there, he said, if it weren't for you guys, I'd be dead. That's his exact words. Okay, let's, I'm going to skip by the next few quotes because I think that uh, we'll, we probably are getting close to the end of this week's program. Well, if we have time, we'll get into this thing about Hiram and Biff and, and, uh, and some of these... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I, I had to cut you off here, but we're going we're gonna to be back tomorrow. Can you be back tomorrow? Yeah, I'll be back tomorrow. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, we've got to go, folks. Uh, don't forget, send a self address stamp number 10 envelope to Ralph, Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. Once again, Ralph, Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. If you order anything from the catalog, folks, please specify that you listen to the hour of the time so that uh, we will get a small percentage to help us with our efforts and keep this show going. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being such good listeners out there. Remember, take these references that we get you, give you and look them up. Good night, and God bless you all. You are listening to the hour of the time. I'm William Cooper. Tonight, the fourth evening with Mr. A. Ralph Epperson. And the Empire Strikes Back. That's what we're doing, Bill. We're striking back at the Empire. <laughs> we're going to continue with what we were doing last night, folks. And uh, we're going to continue to do it on Monday night. And that Monday night will be the last night with uh, Ralph Epperson. And uh, I really hope that you've all enjoyed his visit with us. Of course, he's going to be here one more night, Monday night. I want to urge you to send for his catalog. Send a number 10 self-addressed stamped envelope to Ralph, Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. I'm going to repeat this during the program, but one more for right now. Ralph, Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. Of course, you know that it's on the hotline in case you didn't have time to write it down during this program. And uh, those of you out there who do not have a pad of paper and a pencil or a pen by your side while you listen to the hour of the time, shame on you. 
Ralph, let's go. What goodies have you got for us tonight? Well, what we're doing, Bill, for those who haven't heard the first uh, three programs, is we're just reading a random sampling of quotes uh, from the books written by the people involved in this conspiracy we're talking about. We're using their own material to prove that you and I have been, what we've been saying for years is right. And they admit it all in their own words, don't they? That's correct. That's what we're trying to do is document the case from their own literature so that when we say things, we know what we're talking about because we've used their own information. That's correct. Right. That's the best way to do it. And for those of you who listen to this program, you know I like to do that an awful, awful lot. That's one way, you know, this is this story is so incredible that that's one way we can survive. If, if, who knows, Ralph Epperson, I'm nobody, but the thing that we're reading is somebody. The people that are writing the books that we're quoting from are the ones directly involved in what we've been talking about for years. That's correct. And so when we quote them, they are their experts. They're telling us the truth. Most people don't read this kind of material. Probably 95% of people have never heard of Rex Hutchins or Manly P. Hall or, or Albert Pike. But you and I know who they are because we dared to open up their material to find out what they're saying. That's, That's right. You said something that I think is, is very, very sad. Most people don't read this material, but I'll go farther than that. Since the invention and the, uh, the depositing of television set in the home of Americans, it's it's become uh, true now that most people not only don't read this stuff, but they don't read at all. Well, that's why I produce on that catalog that you're recommending your listeners to get a copy of. I've got <laughs> probably 40 hours of lectures on there for you can watch, plug it in and watch it on the TV set. So Charlie Couch Potato can sit down and watch the videos that will do the same job the books will do. That's right, and I've done the same thing. In fact, the only reason that I ever began producing videos is I learned from going around the country and talking to people they don't read. No. But you give them a videotape, they can plug into their television set and they'll watch that. That's a sad state of affairs because the sum total of all of the knowledge that humanity has learned throughout the thousands of years of its history is in books. No. It's not on videotape. Yeah, not yet. No. You get sound bites on videotape. You don't have knowledge on videotape. No. We're working on it. Well, we have knowledge, we have knowledge on videotapes that you and I produce. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, if I now, I want to now prove that the Masons are out to destroy religion. Religion, uh, family, and uh, nationalism, etc. I'm going to use their own material once again to do this. And uh, let's talk, Bill. I know your listeners maybe have already heard this. And once again, we're speaking not only to reinforce what they've already learned, but also to introduce the new people who are listening tonight. Doesn't hurt for them to hear it again. Okay, let's talk. Many times, if necessary. Let's talk about the uh, the ritual that the Mason goes through. Uh, and the, the individual known as Hiram or Hiram of Beth in, the, uh, in their own uh, lodges, the Masonic lodges. Now, uh, Masons, I want to make this clear, and I know you've done it as well. I'm not a Mason. I've never been a Mason, uh, but I have read their material. This book is written by Rex Hutchins, who at the time he wrote it was the 32nd degree Mason. Later became a 33rd. His book was published by the Supreme Council of 33rd degree, the Mother Council of the World. They're the, they're the, the group that leads, I believe, in their own literature, the Masons worldwide. They are the mother council. They published Rex Hutchins' books. I've got the book in front of me. It's entitled The Bridge to Light by Rex Hutchins. Now, let's briefly just talk briefly about Hiram and who he was, Hiram of Beth. There are two or maybe three brief mentions of him in the Old Testament about him building Solomon's temple. There is a King Hiram and a Hiram of Beth that appear to be two individuals in the Bible that are both mentioned. That's right. The king was the king of Tyre, and Hiram was sent by the king of Tyre at the request of King Solomon to furnish a master builder for his efforts to build a temple. The temple, right. Now, the, the, from those two brief mentions, two or three brief mentions of the Hiram of Beth in the Bible, the Masons have built an elaborate ceremony. You know that. That's correct. And, it, it's, and they've taken not only what the Bible says, but have actually distorted what the Bible says about Hiram of Beth. They created a history that doesn't exist. Exactly. Plus, they built a ritual in, in, in uh, myth on a known character in the Bible. That's right. Because so, as you found out, and I know, the Hiram of Beth they're talking about in their ceremonies has really absolutely nothing to do with the real Hiram of Beth, who was the master builder who helped build the Temple of Solomon. Yeah. 
During that, uh, during the the, uh, the the building of that temple, Hiram of Brick was called a master mason, and according to the masons. That means that he was the one in charge of all the apprentice masons. And the Masonic ritual teaches us that the, high, the master masons had secrets that enabled them to go from country to country without a uh, passport or without uh, being stopped at borders. And the apprentice masons did not have those secrets, and they were somewhat confined to the working in a particular country. So according to the, the legend, once again, built on the basis of the true knowledge of Hiram in the Bible, they built this legend about Hiram of Bith. And I'm going to now start reading from that. Briefly, what happened, what we're going to do is we're going to examine what happened to Hiram of Bith in the writings of Rex Hutchins. Hiram was a master mason. The apprentice masons wanted his knowledge, the secrets that he contained, he uh, uh, had uh, for their own purposes. And Hiram of Bith refused to give them the secrets of the uh, of being the Master Mason. So in, in, in their ritual, in their, uh, their myth, Armadip tries to leave the building, the, the temple, when it's nearly completed, and uh, he leaves through one gate first. He's accosted by what they call three ruffians, one of the first of the three ruffians. Their ruffian hits him or beats him. He, he survives that attack. Armadip goes out another gate of the temple. There once again is met by ruffian number two. He goes back to the temple, goes out to the third uh, gate, refuses in all three uh, uh, incidents to reveal the truth of the uh, secrets, and in the third, at the after the third uh, accosting, he's actually killed. Agreed? Yes, but it's extremely important that, that we make it clear exactly what these wounds were. He was struck in the throat, so I was in the back of the chest area, and then in the head. Okay, what we're going to read, we're going to, we're going to document what that is. I'm, okay. I'm just laying the foundation works so they know when I, when I talk about accosted by, at the south gate of the temple, they know what I'm talking about. I'm okay. Not what. Now, this is from page 66 of, uh, of the Rex Hutchins' book entitled The Bridge to Life. Hiram, the Hiram we're talking about, is first accosted at the south gate of the temple where the instrument of the attack is the rule, R-U-L-E, rule. In Greek, the word for a rule, whether, in a, whether a measuring instrument or a code of conduct, is canon. Thus we see the bureaucracy of the early church establishing the canon law to regulate conduct. This law was to be obeyed with unquestioned loyalty. Hence, it is an apt symbol of the suppression of freedom of speech, which might question the divinity and justice of these laws. Therefore, Hiram, with the rule, is struck where the organs of speech are, like you pointed out. Now, let's examine what he just said. Who struck him? It wasn't a man. It was the church, right? That's correct. And it was the church struck Hiram of Beth because it taught laws that he, was, uh, that he could not question. That's correct. Remember, folks, that these people use symbology. That is their language, and that's what Ralph is revealing to you here in this story. Go ahead, Ralph. So the church is what... The, the first <laughs> the first accoster of Heimerbiff is not a man, it is the church. That's and right. he's talking about a capital C church. So when they're, when this ritual was written, they're talking about the Catholic Church. That was the main church of the time. And according to the story, the Catholic Church taught law, canon law, meaning rule, that according to him had to be obeyed with unquestioned loyalty. Now let's just examine that for a minute, Bill. I used to be a Catholic, and I know that the, law, the reason I'm out is because I questioned their authority. And I was free to leave the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in Rex Hutchins' book can I find any challenge to the law that we cannot question called government. He is not upset when government really forces their law on us, and if you object, you go directly to jail. The Catholic Church has no authority to force you to be a Catholic. That's right. But the government has the power to force you to be a Democrat or, a, or be a democracy or to give to welfare or to foreign aid or whatever else you have. And he's not critical of that. No. And in my book, I pointed out the hypocrisy of that. The, the, he's wrong. The Catholic Church has no authority to force anyone to believe in what the Catholic Church believes in. That's and right. that's millions of people all over the world are either coming in or going out of the Catholic Church daily. So Rex Hutchins shows his ignorance, in my opinion, because what he's saying is, if you want to talk about unquestioned loyalty, let's talk about government, but he doesn't do that. And that is what's wrong here. But let's go back now. So now we see that the Catholic Church is what killed Hiram of Beth. 
because it taught him laws that he had to obey, and that destroyed, quote, his freedom of speech, unquote. He was not able to question the laws taught by the Catholic Church. According to him. That's correct. Okay. okay, now we're going to go to the second gate. The instrument of attack at the west gate of the temple was the square. Now, the square is a piece of metal, as you know, joined at a right angle that you see on the back of the cars of the mason. It's the square and the compass. We'll talk about the compass later. The square is a piece, two pieces of metal joined together to form a right angle you can draw straight lines with. And that's what Bogreis is talking about when he stands up in front of a lecture hall and says, when I raise my arm to the square. You all think that he's talking about when he to took his oath of allegiance to the Constitution. It's not, folks. That's not what he means at all. Go ahead, Ralph. Okay. So this is, in fact, he goes on to say, the square is an implement formed of two rigid pieces of metal at right angles to each other. Now here he's going to explain that the second individual who beats up Heimerbiff is not a man either. If this square represents the merger of civil and religious power intending to control man's emotions, telling him not only what he can do, but also what he can believe. Despotism, which history tells us results from this unholy merger of earthly powers, seeks to rule by dividing friends and relatives that none may unite against the tyranny. Thus, I am struck near the heart, the traditional seat of the affections. Now, notice what he's saying here. He's saying that we should be allowed to exercise our emotions, our affections, without restraint of government or church. But what? that's not really what they want at all. That's not what they believe in. They don't believe in the emotions. They believe in the supreme power of reason, according to their own but, writing. But he's saying, though, that because you and I as Christians and the Catholic Church and other churches teach the controlling of your emotions, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not commit rape, thou shalt not beat thy neighbor over the, uh, the head over his head. We are restricted by a God-given morality. And he's saying that this God-given morality is a restriction of mankind because we can't enjoy our affections, our emotions. Notice what's happening in America today. Young people are suddenly raping with random numbers. I mean, abandoned. It's happening all over. Why? Because they are being taught to enjoy their emotions with no restraints. And notice the quandary that puts the young student. He's taught in sex education that he has these physical emotions, these affections, and that there's nothing wrong with expressing them. So he grabs the little pom-pom girl, takes her in the bushes, and rapes her, and then the governor comes along and throws him in jail. He said, wait a minute, I was taught in the government school that I was to enjoy my emotions and my affections without restraint. I did so, and now you're jailing me. They're another branch of government. Mm -hmm. And he can't figure that out. And that's what Rex Hutchins is talking about here. And that was my point, is these people are hypocrites. Sure they are. They're liars and hypocrites. But go ahead. Rex Hutchins is not, he's questioning the right of us to, to punish rapists or murderers. Why? Because people are not free to enjoy their emotions, according to him. And let's go on to this. And in their initiation, when they are initiated into the first three degrees, there are three different ceremonies, one of which the initiate raises his hand to the square, which is placed upon the Masonic Bible, and takes the oath of allegiance to the order. That's correct. Let's go back to what the second attack, then, is really government. Now, by the way, let's talk about this, and I'm sure your listeners, <laughs> I don't think a lot of people really think about this. I had a discussion tonight with a student, a young man, a student. Well, a lot of people don't think about anything. <laughs> but my listeners do. Okay. I asked him why, whether he wanted, he believed it was important for us to punish someone who murdered somebody. He had no answer. He never thought about that before. Uh -huh. I said, where do we get the authority, do you believe, to punish somebody? Yeah, I don't know. I never thought about that. He never thought about that. But he wants it enforced. I said, well, would you would you want me to be punished if I killed your wife? Well, sure I would. You have no right to do that. I said, wait a minute. That is a decision on your part. Where did that come from? I don't know. Why do we punish murderers? Because God commanded us to do that. That's right. We don't have to decide whether it's right or wrong. God told us to punish murderers and rapists and thieves and etc. 
But here he's saying government... No, let's go back. The reason we punish is because we have a religious view of man's right to his life, liberty, and property. And that came from God of the Bible. So here he's saying, we create, you and I create government to protect our rights to life, liberty, and property. And he says that's a merger of civil and religious power, intending to control man's emotions. Of course it is. That's what the purpose of the law is. If there's no control of man's emotions, we are then living according to the law of the jungle. And if I'm stronger than you, I'm perfectly within my rights of putting an axe in your forehead and taking anything I want from you. Because you, have, you, you are being told you can enjoy your your emotions, and if it gives you pleasure to smash me in there with an axe, you can do so. That's, right. That's what this is all about. Now, notice this. And these people sure. really believe this, folks, until it's them that get hit in the head with the axe, and then all of a sudden, it's wrong. Notice what I'm doing. I'm reading Rex Hutchins' book, right. published by the 33rd Degree Council in Washington, D.C., they published this book. This is written. It's in my. I'm writing, reading from it myself right now. And that's the highest council of Freemasonry exactly. in the world, not just in this country, but in the world. That is the Supreme Council. This is absolutely mind-boggling. But this is what these people are teaching in their churches. Let's finish the last part now. The third is the third attack. The setting mall, M A U L. The setting mall is the little hammer they use when you beat, you know, Masons. That's, that's the brick in the mortar. Right. And it's also intended to chisel away a hammer. You know, these people believe in uh, masonry, which means stonework. They have a hammer that they use to, to cut the stone in the desired shape. But in real reality, it has absolutely nothing to do with the real operative Freemasonry yeah. of making buildings out of stone. No, it's right. It, it's making a temple out of you and I. Yeah. I'm fitting up to fit the temple. That's right. We have become the stone. They have become the workers on us. Let's finish this now. The third part of Mr. Hutchinson's interpretation of this ritual of the attack of uh, Ar- Biff. The setting mall, meaning this hammer, an instrument of brute force, is a fitting symbol of the blind, unreasoning mob. Who's that? Those who believe we should punish murderers. That's us, folks. That's us. That's all of us. And they want to shackle us. We're the blind, unreasoning mob. Why? Because we say punish that guy who just killed 27 people. No, wait a minute. You can't do that because he was enjoying his emotions, you see. (laughs) This is what... You know, Bill, you and I are laughing, but this is serious business. This you is know, what we're, we're laughing because we understand it. And to us, it's, it's this is a, this is a strange, almost insane uh, philosophy. And, and it is funny to me that anyone would ever believe such claptrap. It, it's also, and I want all you Freemasons, and I know there are a lot of Freemasons who listen to this program. I want you to understand that when you go, when you go to your Masonic temple. You're not learning what you think you're learning. If you really want to learn, if you really want to get some truth, go to Ralph Epperson. Come to me. Listen to this program. When you go to the temple, you're being misled. You're being led around by a ring in your nose. You're being lied to. And unless you reach the highest degrees, and even then, unless they can trust that you believe in the same God and the same philosophy that they do, you're never going to know the truth. You're never going to know anything. For the whole structure of pyramidal organization of Freemasonry and the other sacred societies, this is not the only one, ladies and gentlemen, and you know that if you listen to this program. The whole reason for that structure is to keep you in the dark and form a basis of power built upon your oath to protect the fellow members and the brothers and give them aid and comfort and, and on all of the other things that you've sworn to, um, upon pain of death, this is what gives them the power to destroy this country, as they are doing, as you're hearing, as we've proven in their own words. And we're going to continue right now. Let's continue on with this third attack on Hyman Biff. It, meaning, according to the receptions on page 66, it, meaning this blind, unreasoning mob, Fears the force of the intellect, what does that mean? Man's mind, man's reason, and seeks the destruction of the products of the mind. What does that say? We're saying you, we don't want you to think that killing is desirable. We, this blind, unreasoning mob, feel it's wrong for you to think that way. Well, they twist it around, and what they will tell you is that we suppress knowledge 
and wisdom, and thus the ability of man to evolve, which is all a total lie. That's really not what they what they really mean at all. And and this will be proven in their own words as we go along. But just so you'll know, that's their defense of this. That's what they claim that we do. In, in reality, we have nothing against knowledge. In fact, if you've been listening to this program, you know I live to learn more every day. I, I'm always striving to learn. And most people who are intelligent and understand uh, the reason that they need to do that will we'll do the same thing. Okay. So the last sentence that I'm going to read from page 66 is this one. He says, Hiram is killed at the east gate by a blow to the head, the seat of the intellect. So what he's saying here is that we, the church, we, the religion, we, the government, based on the fact that God taught us to punish murderers and, so, and create government to do that, are wrong. We have killed Hieroglyph. And later on, I don't have it here maybe, but someplace else in maybe we'll stumble onto that. They claim that Hiram does not represent a man, but all of mankind. So now, uh, I'll probably wait on that. I'm going to point out that they committed themselves to the murdering of the murderers of, of mankind. He's, not, he's also the symbol for, for who they claim. Everyone in history who was persecuted, Galileo, um, uh, Jacques de Millet was burned at the stake. And, and there have been times in history, folks, when the persecution by the church and the king uh, and the, uh, the uneducated mob has brought about the death of brilliant men. But that's not the case today, mm-hmm. nor has it always been the case, nor will it always be the case. But these are the excuses they use for why we cannot rule ourselves, why we should not have any say in anything, and why they want to destroy the church, the state, and the mob, and of course the mob is us. They want to establish their own one world religion, which will change according to the needs of man. They will establish their own one world government, a, a what they call a benevolent despotism, which is going to be uh, a one world totalitarian socialist government, and they want to subject all of humanity, save them, to slavery, perpetual, forever slavery so that we can never challenge them in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Next, the next page I want to read from uh, Mr. Hutchins' book is page 73. Just one sentence from uh, page 73 of the book entitled The Bridge to Life. He says, The Master Hiram, meaning Hiram of Beth, the Master Mason, is the symbol of intelligence, liberty, and truth. And the assassins are the symbols of tyranny, ignorance, and intolerance or fanaticism. So here he's saying, when, when, they, when these Masons talk about liberty, they're talking about liberty from what they perceive is the tyranny of the God who tells us don't do certain things. See, you're not free if God restricts your freedom. Why does God restrict our freedom to murder? Why does God restrict our freedom to steal? Well, they believe that these things are learning experiences. If they rape someone, then it's a learning experience. <laughs> if they kill someone, it's a learning experience. They don't even believe that anyone should be subjected to prison, much less being executed for for murdering their fellow man. And uh, that's... Uh, well, go ahead. Uh, well, would you it's, it's unbelievable. I don't know how these people can believe that they could live with other men with no restrictions upon anybody whatsoever. Alistair Crowley. His motto was, "Do unto what." I've got that quote. Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That's what he wanted to bring into the world. Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. I would like to have seen what he would say if someone decided to do as thou wilt upon him. Well, I I, I know, Bill. You know that is that shows, in my opinion, the the stupidity of these men. Oh, yes. And they, they claim that they're so brilliant yes. that, that they have the only truly mature minds, and yet they are so stupid in their philosophy to think that the world would be a better place under that kind of law. I found a quote from Her- Ernest Hemingway that says, I know only what is good is that which gives pleasure, and that which is evil is that which gives no pleasure. Some of that effect. That's right. And so I love to, I would love to have asked him, he's dead now, but I'd love to say, Mr. Hemingway, let's presume that someone believed in what you just said, and they have a gun in their hand, and they walk up to you, Ernest Hemingway, and say, Mr. Hemingway, it will give me pleasure, therefore be a moral act, for me to shoot you. And I'll really enjoy this. What would Hemingway say? 
Oh, uh, by all means, if it gives you pleasure, please choose me. Exactly. <laughs> please choose me. Bill, I know, you know, you and I are laughing, but I'm telling you, this is the way these people think. We're not oh, joking. I know. <laughs> in, in one of the oaths they take, in one of the highest degrees, they pledge, they pledge not to seduce the wife or daughter of a fellow mason. But in, in that pledge... It leaves open the fact that they can seduce any other woman in the world that they want to, as long as it's not the daughter or the wife of a fellow Mason, provided that they know that they're a daughter or a wife of a fellow Mason. Which means that if they don't know that it's the daughter or wife of a fellow Mason, it's okay to go ahead exactly. and seduce that woman. I mean, these people are absolutely out of their mind. I want, you, I want to make one more point, Bill, about what you just said. Every Mason in this country has taken that precise oath. That's correct. Every one of them. The Christian Mason has taken that oath. The Buddhist, the Hindu. That they're giving them permission to commit adultery with their non their non-member wives. It is ludicrous. And that's not all. They truly believe, they truly believe that they have the right to rip you off any time that they can rip you off, in any way that they can rip you off, because, simply because, you're not one of them. As, as, as a, a, a Mason father of a friend of mine told him when he asked his father why they were persecuting a businessman in the town who was not a Freemason, the Freemasons were actually running this guy out of business. His father looked at his son and said this, Son, if you are not one of us, you are nothing. Can you imagine that? Well, they... they can you imagine that hearing that from your father? Or saying that to your own son? Well, I know that you, you, you feel that, that you and I... I'm not a parent, but I know you are, Bill, and I know you know what that means, how stupid that is to say. But that is precisely what they believe over and over again in their own literature. They teach them that they are the superior masters of the rest of mankind. That's right. It is, this whole thing, and you know, it's almost inconceivable for, the, for us to understand that the average mind can comprehend this. So that's what we're trying to do is bring it to your attention. Keep that thought, folks. It's time for our break. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this very short pause. Well, folks, how do you like tonight's program? How do you like this series with Mr. Epperson? We're going to try to get a lot more people as guests on the hour of the time who can continue to help you open your eyes and discover what the real world is all about. Remember, wake the sheeple, empower the people, save freedom for the world, not just for this country, but the entire world. That's our mission. Now, we couldn't do this without the help of some very, very good people who own a company that handles investments of hard, non-confiscatable, non-reportable assets that can help you protect what you've worked all your life for. I'm talking about Swiss America trading. I want you to call them right now. 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Talk to the experts there and ask them to explain to you the advantages of putting at least some of your assets into gold or silver or platinum or any of the other hard assets in their various forms and ask them to tell you what is the advantage of coin over bullion? What is the advantage over stock over bullion or over coin? Talk to these people. They know what they're talking about, folks. And if you've listened to the programs that we've done on these subjects on the hour of the time, then you've got a head start. Now, remember, you don't have to do what they suggest. You don't even have to invest with them. But if you believe in this program, the hour of the time, because they sponsor this program and make it possible, you owe them the opportunity to at least explain to you what they have to offer. You also have a responsibility to yourself and to your family to protect your assets against the coming economic collapse. So call now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. For the first 200 callers, you'll receive Harry Figgy's book, or report, I should say, entitled Tackle the Debt. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. 
1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. While you're at it, mention my name, William Cooper, and you'll also receive a free newsletter on protecting your future. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Remember, it's Swiss America Trading who make these programs possible, who allow us to bring Ralph Epperson into your home to visit with you personally and tell you what he knows about the real world. By helping protect your future, folks, you're also protecting the future of this broadcast, the hour of the time, and freedom for the world. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646, and you'll be glad that you did. A long time ago and far, far away, this is the battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. There was a warrior named A. Ralph Epperson, and tonight he's right here with us talking to you. I was there, and that's me. <laughs> By the way, uh, thank you very much, Bill. I want to thank you for, once again for inviting me on to the program. This is very kind. It's a great opportunity to make this stuff, uh, this information material, uh, material public. Uh, we've got to do this because I agree with you. There's something going on, and we've got to figure it out to put a stop to it. That's correct. It's my pleasure, Ralph. We've been friends for a long time. As you know, we very seldom get a chance to be together like this and to uh, talk to so many people. Usually we're talking to a room full of people or a stadium full of people or a theater full of people. But right now, at this moment, you may not realize it, Ralph, but you're talking to approximately 10 million listeners worldwide in every country, in every city, on every country continent in this world, we are reaching out, talking to people, and you are delivering a message that is so important, and that's why they tune in to this show. Well, I, I hope that they realize that uh, this, this problem is not just local, it's not just confined to America, this is indeed a worldwide problem, because if America is going to fall into this, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, ancient mystery religion, it's going to be worldwide, because we're the key to it. Oh, they've heard that from me many, many times. If America falls, you all fall. The faith of the world hinges upon the American people's ability to keep their creator endowed rights and restore the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as the supreme law of the land. If we are not successful in doing this, then the world is going to disintegrate into a state of chaos, racial wars, and even, I believe, an atomic war which will kill billions of people all across this planet. So keep your eyes on America and listen to people like A. Ralph Epperson. Okay, let's uh, take the next step, which is another giant leap. But uh, once again, <laughs> we're trying to bring you the materials from your own literature, Masons who have written on the subject, and we can we know are qualified to write for the Masonic Lodge, experts that have been approved by their own uh, the Grand Lodge, the uh, the thirty uh, third degree in Washington D.C. I want to now go to page eight nineteen of Morals and Dogma, written by Albert Pike. And what this is for the this particular quote is for the Mason who's listening. Now, Mason, you're not going to like this, but I'm going to tell you that you are being lied to inside the lodge. And I'm going to tell you that Albert Pike is going to tell you that personally. He's going to speak to you on page 819. He's going to tell you that they're intentionally lying to you. They're keeping the truth of the secrets of the uh, symbols from you intentionally. I want to read now from page 819 of Morals and Dogma. Any Mason who's listening worldwide can get a copy of this book and open it up to page 819 and read the second paragraph, which I'm now about to read. Quote, the blue degrees, which as you and your listeners, Bill, I'm sure know, is are the first three degrees of the Masonic Lodge. The blue degrees are but the outer court or portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate. But he is, the initiate, is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Their true explication, which means understanding, is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry. That's right. And I get letters from master masons all the time. The highest they've ever obtained is the third degree. And they write me letters telling me that I'm wrong, that they know all about Freemasonry, and what I'm telling couldn't possibly be the truth. 
Well, I hope that all you Master Masons are living, are living, yes, living, <laughs> and I hope that you're listening uh, to, to what you're hearing tonight. And if you would get into your own books, the books written by Masons, for Masons, published by Masonic Publishing Companies, and open your mind, open your eyes, open your brain, and quit being so stupid you wouldn't have to be told by us what it is that you're a part of. You are really a part of the worship of Lucifer. The sun, the light, well, Lucifer. Let's, let's take that next, Bill. That's, that's not pleasant either, but let's take Not that pleasant, but that is your God. You've been conned, you've been lied to, and I get letters from Master Mason telling me that Freemasonry is really a Christian organization. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk. I, I want to now prove the assertion that you just made that Lucifer is the God inside the church. Go for it. We're going to now read page 321, page 321 of Morals and Darga. The second paragraph, quote, <laughs> I know this is difficult, this is not pleasant, but let's lay, let's lay down the foundation for the non-Mason. Uh, during the rituals, the first three degrees, what they call the Blue Lodge, the Mason is asked by the Grand Master in charge of the meeting, the President, we call him, they call him Grand Master, what do you seek, S-E-E-K, what are you looking for, what do you seek? And the Mason responds in the first degree, light, L-I-G-H-C, in the second degree, more light, and in the third degree, further light. Now, to my knowledge, I cannot find inside the ritual what they describe, what the meaning of light is. What does it mean? I've seen it called the truth, and that's about as far as they go. So the Mason is asking for light without a true explanation of what it means in the ritual. Mason, who those of you that are Masons know that what I just said is true. You know you were asked, what do you see? And you personally responded, light, more light, and further light. And they are, in fact, hoodwinked when they are asked this question. And hoodwinked, and that's where hoodwinked came from, which means to pull the wool over your eyes or fool you. They are blindfolded, and when they are asked what it is they seek, if they reply the light, then the hoodwink is removed from their head, and they are, in fact, given light. Now, they take this to mean exactly the physical... Uh, act of removing the hoodwink and receiving the light in the room. When in truth, that's not what it means at all. Now we're going to prove that, Bill. This is, please, Mason, I trust that you will write this page down, get your copy. I'm going to read you two quotes from Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma, the first of which is on page 321. 321. Open the book up and read along with me the second paragraph. Reads, quote, as follows, Lucifer, the light bearer, Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light? Doubt it not. Where does this light come from, Bill? Inside the Messiah Lodge. They just told you. That's right. Doubt it not, he said. Which yeah. means Lucifer is the light. It comes from Lucifer. Now, let's confirm that on page 324. 324 of Morals Bible, Mr. Pike repeats what he just said. He says they're talking about a belief in a devil, the fallen Lucifer or light bearer. That's correct. Now he confirms that Lucifer is the light bearer. You, as a Mason, have just asked for light from Lucifer. And who is Lucifer? The Satan, the devil in the Bible. And he confirms it himself in his own book, in his own writing. That's true. Now I want to give you one more quote about Lucifer being the key to the uh, Masonic lies and the light bearer from another book written by a master mate, well I think this is the 33rd, like Albert Pike, another 33rd degree Mason. This is the book called The Lost Keys of Freemasonry on page 48. Albert uh, Manley P. Hall was a 33rd degree Mason who died a couple years ago, and when he did, the Masons acknowledged him as one of the greatest philosopher writers of all time in Masonry. Let's now read page 48 of The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. By the way, I want to point this out because there are people who have come to me and say, wait a minute, that book was not published by the Masons. That's correct. It was not published by the Masons, but it was written by a 33rd degree Mason. I have in my possession a copy of the Royal Arch Magazine several years ago that, that said this, was, this book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, was on the recommended reading list for all Masons. 
So even though it wasn't published by them, it's recommended by them. And if those who want to see that, I have a copy that I'll send it to you. You can read it with your own eyes. This book is recommended reading for all Masons. Mason, if you're listening to me right now, write this down, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, and read with me along on page 48. Quote, When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of the living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. So how many mysteries are there? There's only one. And the mystery we just repeated is that Lucifer is the light bearer. Now let's read what Manly P. Hall says about Lucifer. Quote, page 48. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy. That's right. I hope you listeners understand what it is we're doing and the great risk we're taking by doing this. I have been personally threatened and I have been told that if I don't shut up about Freemasons and specifically about Freemasons acting in leadership capacities in the patriotic community, that somebody's going to get hurt and that somebody's going to be me. I'm going to tell you right now, if anything ever happens to A. Ralph Epperson or me, you take our dead bodies and lay them on the steps of the Masonic Temple in Washington, D.C., and then burn it to the ground. <laughs> Go ahead, Ralph. Okay. I want to now read from 567 of Morals and Dogma. Once again, another quote to talk about this uh, um, being Lucifer, known as the light bearer. Uh, let's go back now to our recollections of what we read about in the Bible. I didn't quote the Bible, but let's just talk about the Garden of Eden, where God told man that you can eat of any fruit of the uh, of the tree. And anything that I gave you is yours, except the, the knowledge of the good and evil. That reserves to me. I will tell you how to live your life. And when you do, you will live in, in paradise. If you will listen to my laws and my rules about not killing and not raping and not looting and not stealing and not cutting their neighbor's goods, etc., all laid out, you can live in their paradise. No, the Masons say those laws are tyranny because they restrict our freedom. And they have reversed it. I want to read now from page 567. But before you do, I want to say something. If the world were really like that, if everybody really obeyed those laws, we would, in fact, really be living in paradise. I, there's no question about it. Why? Because we'd be free. You're yeah. totally free. That's right. No one would live in fear. No one would be hurt or injured. No one would be sad. Everybody would be living with enough and, and, and with their own property and in happiness without fear of their neighbor or anyone yeah. else. Okay, now let's go to page 567 of Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike. Quote, To prevent the light from escaping at once, the demons forbade Adam to eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Bill, according to Albert Pike, who's the demon? The demon is the God that, that, uh, that, that created mankind, Pink. according to them. Yes. Now, according to their own story and their own philosophy, the Creator, God, the God of the Bible, is the devil, the bad one. Okay. Well, well, we're going to continue reading that. And they claim that Lucifer is the light, the good one, who, who gives man the freedom by encouraging them mm -hmm. to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. But if you understand who came first, you know that Lucifer is not God. Mm -hmm. Lucifer is the great deceiver, the liar, the manipulator, who has hold of the souls of these people who are lost in the pit of Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. Let's go back and read the whole thing in, its con in all of it together. It's one long sentence. Let's listen. To prevent the light from escaping at once, the demons, meaning the triune God, the God of the Bible, forbade Adam to eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, by which he would have known the empire of light and that of darkness. He obeyed, an angel of light induced him to transgress. And notice what he said. Mm -hmm. The book of Genesis says the serpent appeared to Eve and Adam and uh, induced them to transgress. The devil induced them to transgress by violating God's law about not knowing yourself what is right and wrong. That's correct. The God of the Bible is a demon... And Lucifer is an angel of light. Once again, Mason, you remember that you personally asked for light from the... You did not know you were asking for light from the light bear. It's now been confirmed three times by Albert Pike in his book entitled Morals and Dogma. Isn't this absolutely amazing? 
that these people are so easily conned and they go through their whole life sometimes believing that they belong to a Christian organization just because somebody opened a Masonic Bible and placed it up on their altar inside their Masonic temple. Yeah. And, and, but if you go to India and walk into a Masonic temple, what do you see on their altar? The Bhagavad Gita. Mm-hmm. It's it's the uh, it's the uh, the the Buddhist uh, the Hindu uh, text. Whatever those people believe is what you're going to find on the on the altar. So the Freemason who says that Freemasonry is a Christian organization is fooling. It is really a part of it. He's fooling himself as well as as others as well as being fooled. Now, now Bill Bill is making a statement based on the evidence that we have just given you. I'm reading from their own literature, published by the Masonic Lodge. There's no question about this. <laughs> if any Mason doubts me, check it out like you've been pleading with them. Open up the book, Moral's Dumb, and read it yourself. That's right. I'm not making this up. It sounds like it, and then you say, oh, you Masons worship Lucifer. Oh, that's impossible. No, we just showed you in your own literature. Okay, now let's go to a book called Clausen's Commentaries on Morals and Dogma, also published by the 33rd Degree Council in Washington, D.C. Henry Clausen used to be the successor uh, to Albert Pike maybe five or six men later. I mean, he was more modern. He's the more, like he was just replaced a year or two ago. He was the sovereign grand commander of all three nations for, for several uh, terms, I believe. Yeah, quite true. I don't, I don't know if they have terms or not, because I think they lived for... Well, they must have terms, because I noticed the same uh, name is listed for several years in a row. Uh, well, it may be for life. Maybe it's because they were appointed when they died, and they're listed for several years. But in Mackey's uh, History of Freemasonry, uh, you see Klaus's name covering several years as the, as the sovereign grand commander of all Freemasonry okay, of the Scottish Rite. On page 75 of his book entitled Clausen's Commentaries on Morals and Dogma, meaning the book Morals and Dogma, Clausen now, the successor to Albert Pike, is writing. He says this on page 75. The true knowledge of the one supreme deity is given, meaning given inside the Messiah's life. Mm-hmm. Notice, <laughs> they're not teaching about the God of the Bible. They just call him a demon. Yes. So who are they teaching about? Who is the one supreme deity? Lucifer. Lucifer. You know, Mason, I can only beg of you, if you're listening, please check this out. What are you involved with? If this is new to you, I beg of you, open up your literature, read these books, these citations we're giving you, check it out, and then get out. Wouldn't you agree, Bill? Save yourself, because I'm telling you right now, there's going to be a, a big battle sometime in the future. Uh, if we can't solve this problem through legal, lawful means, then we're going to have to resort to the last legal, lawful mean that we have, which is outlined in the Declaration of Independence, which is to take up a gun and take our freedoms back and our country back. The per- the purpose of this program is to try to prevent that because I don't want to see it happen. But if it happens, uh, all of you people who have been oppressing us for so long and, and, and distorting the truth and taking our creator and our rights away from us, and the, you are the same people who have manipulated us into wars and created the wars and, and done all of the terrible things that I can trace throughout history, you're going to pay a terrible price when the people finally go to wreak their revenge upon your head. And it's coming. There is no way to prevent it unless I'm successful and Ralph is successful and others are successful in waking the people, empowering the people, and being able to do this before it comes to that. But what what kind of odds will you give me that that's going to happen? Well, you know, Bill, I, I'm like you. I don't like to think about that. I'm trying to educate my well, whole... You have to think about it. Uh, okay. you got to stop it. That's the well, problem. Okay. <laughs> Bill, you can think about that. I'm thinking about education. My whole life has been dedicated, or at least my last 30 years of my life, been dedicated to producing materials that people can rely on. Good, legitimately, well-researched, well-proven, well-documented stuff you can read and know that's true. And I've tried to make that available. I'm hoping that everyone listening today... Well, just take the time to look at the catalog. But the purpose of that, and you know this as well as I do, is you know that if people don't discover this and learn it and act upon it, there's going to be blood running in the streets of this country. Well, Bill, once again, I'm not going to say that. You can say that. Well, that's a cop-out. That's, that's a cop-out. You know it, and I know it, because you know that's going to happen if people don't wake up. We're either going to be slaves, and they're going to kill millions of us, to wreak their revenge on us to have their one world totalitarian socialist state. And that's what happens whenever socialism takes over anywhere. People are sent to labor camps. They're sent to death camps. They are executed by the millions. You know that. 
We all know that. I'm not going to. I'm not here to advocate violence or. Uh, well, you see, that's the cop out. You're afraid that if you acknowledge that that's going to happen, if we don't stop it, that you're ad- advocating violence, and that's not the case. What we are advocating is that people wake up and stop this before it happens, and that's not advocating violence. Okay, right. That's bringing them to their senses to prevent the violence. That's what I'm all about. Okay. I, I hope that people are trying to get a, a sense of urgency from both of us. We're not talking about these things happening 47 generations now. And in fact, in my book, I, I found out what their date was. I made it public in 1985. That's eight years ago. I found out what their target date is. It's the year 2000. That's that right. doesn't give us much more time. I found out the same date in my own research and put that in my book before Ralph Epperson and I ever met or we had either read each other's books. Mm-hmm. And we were amazed that we had discovered the same the same thing. Okay, now let's go to the externalization of the hierarchy. Once again, by Alice Bailey, the uh, new age of... Uh, uh, she's almost amazed that she could see me qualify. Let's read from page 511 of her book uh, called The Externalization Hierarchy. She's going to talk about masonry. She says, the three main channels through which the preparation for the new age, and Bill, I'm sure your listeners know what that is. Those of you that don't know, we're talking about the New World Order. It's also called the New Age in certain circles. The Masons call it the New World Order. We're talking about the change of our civilization. It's called the New Age or the New World Order. So the three main channels through which the preparation for this coming New World Order is going on might be regarded as the Church, the Masonic Fraternity, and the Educational Field. The Masonic movement will meet the needs of those who can and should wield power. Wait a minute. (laughs) Who says learn these Masons are Luciferians, and she's telling us that they're the ones who should, who can and should wield power. That's correct. If you you look at the the organizations that that most of the people who are leading our government, our Congress, and even in your cities and states, you'll find that they belong to the Lord. Okay, the major the power. She goes on to say, it, meaning the Masonic movement, is the custodian of the law. It is the home of the mysteries and the seat of initiation. It holds in its symbolism the ritual of deity, capital D, deity, and the way of salvation is pictorially preserved in its work. The methods of deity are demonstrated in its temples, and under the all-seeing eye, the work can go forward. Well, by deity, they mean the process of apotheosis, whereby man himself yeah. becomes God. It is a far more occult organization than can be realized. Now, Mason, did you hear that? <laughs> Mason, someone just told you your group is far more occult than you can imagine and intended to be the training school for the coming advanced occultists. The word occult means that which is secret and confined and restricted to a certain group of people. Can you understand what she just said? Oh, absolutely. Masonry is leading us to the new world order. In addition to education and the uh, what was the new age, I guess those three channels, the church, meaning the in this case she's talking about a lot of That's good, right. good Christian pastors, etc. Uh, fundamentalists were leading us this way unknowingly. Okay, here's uh, once again another comment about the secrets inside the lodge, written by Albert Pike on page 772 of Morals and Dogma. He says, if you desire to find and to gain admission to the sanctuary, meaning the inner works of the lodge, we have said enough to show you the way. If you do not, it is useless for us to say more, as it has been useless to say so much. Mason, he's telling you, <laughs> read the book, figure it out, and then get out. That's what this is all about. We've got to get out of them. Uh, those of you that are Mason have got to get out. That's right. We're running out of time. Folks, I want to make something very clear to you. Sitting here and educating you about the New World Order and what's coming and ignoring the fact, ignoring the fact that what this is going to culminate in, if we're not able to stop it, is bloodshed and violence, is absolute stupidity. And I will, won't be a part of that. So uh, I'm not advocating violence. You all know that. The purpose of this program is to wake everybody up so that no violence will occur. However, I'm going to tell you, if we're unsuccessful, millions and millions of people are going to die. They're going to be enslaved. They're going to be put in slave labor camps. And if you want to see how these people really were go back and look at Russia, the Soviet Union, right after the Bolshevik Revolution, look at what Hitler brought into reality in the world, and remember that these are the exact same people, 
and understand that if you want to live a good life and have a good future, we've all got to get together, wake up, and put these people under lock and key where they belong and make the future of the world a good one, living according to the laws set before us by God that can ensure a safe, secure life for all of us. A world without morals is a terrible, terrible, terrible place. Good night, and God bless you all. We'll be back with Ralph Epperson again Monday night. Wherever you are, whoever you are, you are listening to the only hour that ever was or ever will be. This is the most important hour in your entire life, for during this hour, you will decide your future and thus our collective future. This is the hour of the time, and I'm William Cooper. Tonight is the fifth and final episode of our visit with Mr. A. Ralph Epperson. Don't even think of getting up out of your chair, folks. You don't want to miss one single moment of tonight's episode of the Hour of the Time. Well, Ralph, this is your last night with us. I want to welcome you once again and uh, say that, uh, you know, just in case I get all wrapped up in this a little bit later and forget that we're... We're extremely pleased and happy that you were able to come and spend these five nights with us. And uh, I have certainly uh, enjoyed seeing you again and talking with you. And uh, I know that many of our listeners out there have had their eyes opened. You've confirmed an awful lot of what they've learned during our Mystery Babylon series here on the Hour of the Time and our other episodes. And you've uh, even imparted to, uh, to all of us some things that we had not heard and did not know. And tonight, I'm sure that you're going to uh, not let us down uh, with, with, with what you brought to, uh, to pass out to the world and all of our uh, wonderful listeners out there tonight. Well, thank you very much, Phil. It's been my, I can assure you it's been my pleasure. I hope that it has been informative and that people will want to take action on what we're trying to say. I hope that they will, you know, send for a copy of the catalog you'll be describing later today. Get involved with some good quality material that you can rely on. Get it out. Get, make it available to your friends and neighbors and family. And get people aware of just what's happening in this world. We're trying to identify that, Bill and I both, as to what's going on. Let me give that address right now, just uh, just in case we get all wrapped up and forget about it later. Uh, I'm going to make a point not to, though. Uh, make sure that you send a self-addressed stamped number 10 envelope to Ralph, Post Office Box 536. Tucson, Arizona, 85702. Ask for his catalog of materials that you need, and his books, his videotapes. Uh, this is wonderful stuff, folks, and I cannot tell you, uh, I cannot express to you enough how much you need to read his two books, The Unseen Hand and The New World Order, both of which I've quoted from extensively uh, on this program. So write to Ralph, Post Office Box 536. Tucson, Arizona, 85702. That's Ralph, Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. And every time you order something from his catalog, say you heard about him first on the hour of the time, and he's agreed to share a small percentage of, uh, of the, uh, the money that he derives from his products with the hour of the time to help us continue to keep this broadcast going. Let's get right into it, Ralph. What did you bring for us tonight? Well, once again, and this is night number five in the final night, but what we're doing and have been doing for the last four nights is just reading a series of random quotes that I found in the literature of those who are inside the Masonic Lodge and or the New Age religion. <clears throat> These are the people that, that have written the books that are certified experts in their field. Like we're talking about books by Albert Pike and Rex Hutchins and Albert Mackey, people that are qualified, certified experts inside the Masonic Lodge, and people like Alice Bailey and Benjamin Green who are inside the New Age movement, certified, qualified experts. So we're just taking these at no particular sequence, they're just random thoughts. We're trying to document the, uh, the, the material by giving you the name of the book and where it is, what page it's on. And we're just doing this with no intent to, intent to keep it in sequence or anything else. We're just doing it pretty much at random. I'd like to now continue our study, or at least parts of our study, of uh, parts of uh, Morals and Dogma. I'd like to go to page 820. This is kind of interesting. Uh, uh, Albert Pike, who wrote the book, the past, one of the past sovereign grand commanders, meaning the number one mason of all time uh, during his uh, 32 years as uh, uh, president, they call him sovereign grand commander, wrote a book called Morals and Dogma. This is contained on page 820. He's talking about Jacques de Marais. Uh, Jacques de Molay was the head of the Knights Templar back around 1300. 
Uh, and he's now going to talk about him. He was the, the Masons do connect themselves back to the Knights Templar. As Jacques de Molay was executed by the Catholic Church for uh, for sins and crimes against the government and the church. Burned at the stake on March the 11th in the year 1313. Okay, very good. Jacques de Molay, before his execution, the chief of the doomed order, organized and instituted what afterward came to be called Scottish Masonry. So they're saying that uh, Jacques de Molay founded the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. He said the uh, pipe was on. The legend of Osiris, Osiris the Sun God, we've talked about him, I'm sure Bill's talked about him in great detail. Many hours. The legend of Osiris was revived and adopted to symbolize the destruction of the order. The Pope and the King soon after perished in a strange and sudden, sudden manner, which is very true. As Jacques de Molay was, was on the, uh, the stick, uh, stake being burned, he prophesied or predicted, whatever you want to call it, that the Pope and the King both would die within certain specified periods of time, and indeed that happened. Well, the, the legend goes that he uh, invited the Pope and the King to appear with him before God uh, in, at a certain specified time in the future after he was dead and uh, an answer for, for their crimes. And uh, the truth is that this is a legend invented by Freemasonry and the Knights nice Templars in particular. The witnesses who were there that, that uh, witnessed the burning of Jacques de Molay say that, that this never, in fact, happened. Okay. I agree with you. Anyway, this is a quote from Albert Price book. He goes on and I'll continue. The order, meaning the Knights nice Templar, disappeared at once. Its estates and wealth were confiscated, and it seemed to have ceased to exist. Nevertheless, it lived under other names and governed, hold on, governed by unknown chiefs, revealing itself only to those who, in passing through a series of degrees, had proven themselves worthy to be entrusted with the dangerous circuit. Secret. That was a bit of a lighting, so uh, <laughs> I think. Mean, let me reread that last sentence. As soon as this rumble is true. The thunder came at an appropriate, auspicious <laughs> moment. <laughs> That's another one of these coincidences, isn't it? Okay, so let's go to the last part. These secret chiefs have, I'm sorry, the initiates have been going, going through a series of degrees, and those who have have proven themselves worthy to be entrusted with the dangerous secret. So here we see that the Masons are controlled by someone that they don't even know controls them. This organized, unknown chief, Pearl. And, but there are people inside the lodge who do know who those men are. That's what that's all about. Okay, let's continue with our study. Here's a page uh, two. But that was, uh, let, me, let me just expand upon that. was the legend, the old legend of the nine hidden supervisors. You'll find it in the, in the legend of the origin of the, uh, of the uh, Order of the Rose of Cross. Uh, you find it sprinkled throughout the history of all of the secret societies. Uh, when you get to your research of who is at the top controlling this, you always come to nine unknown men. Mm-hmm. And uh, later on, an, on another program, I'm going to reveal to you where this really comes from and who these men are from the writings of, of, of the Freemasons because they have written about it and they have revealed uh, the origin of this. Uh, go ahead, Ralph. Okay, now we're going uh, to continue in Morals and Dogma on page 287. Uh, he's talking about the light and, the, and what it means. And this is a quote from Albert Pike. You see, my brother, what is the meaning of Masonic light? You see why the east of the lodge, where the initial letter of the name of the deity overhangs the master. It is the place of light. Light, as contradistinguished from darkness, is good, as contradistinguished from evil. And it is that light, the true knowledge of deity, the eternal good, for which Masons in all ages have sought. Still, Masonry marches steadily onward towards that light that shines in the great distance, the light of that day when evil, overcome and vanquished, shall fade away and disappear forever. And light and life be the one law of the universe and its eternal harmony. Did you understand what you said? Yes, I understand perfectly. And you know what the what the initial of the God is. Well, they got the G. Letter. The letter G, which symbolizes gnosis, gnosis, our knowledge, knowledge, which refers back to the gift of intellect by Satan to Adam and Eve in the in the Garden uh, of Eden. 
And I want you to also know, so we've already read quotes that Albert Pike admits that the that the, uh, the Lucifer, the light bearer, is a god of good, and that the god of the Bible is the evil. So here he's saying that the light of the day, when evil overcome and van- vanquished, shall fade away. He's talking about the day when religion will be destroyed. That's correct. And the belief in God will be destroyed. And when Lucifer, the victor, will again reappear as the ruler of the heavens. That's correct. After a period of 6,000 years, which, by the way, is the year 2000. That's correct. So what we've got here is, once again, another admission that Lucifer is the light bearer and that he's coming. Now, this is, uh, I don't have these, uh, the citation from this before. I think I'll just shift this one by. Let's not go to this one. Here's a, once again uh, the admission that we need light by the uh, by uh, Benjamin Crean, oh, I'm sorry, Alice Bailey, in her book entitled The Externalization of the Hierarchy. She says, Light with which to see the new vision is needed by all. That means you and I, Bill. Once again, another quote from uh, from uh, Benjamin, uh, I'm sorry, from Manny P. Hall in his book entitled What the Ancient Wisdom Expects of Its Disciples. He was going to say this on page 26. It was these serpent kings who founded the mystery schools, which later appeared as the Egyptian and Brahmin mysteries. Oh, there goes another quote of light. And once again, right at the right time, we're talking about serpents and mysteries. The serpent was their symbol. They were the true sons of light. Bill, in my view, I'm sure you've done it years as well, we, I show you examples of this worship of this serpent. It's worldwide. Yeah. It's 6,000 years old. It's in every culture. It's in every religion. It's worldwide and everywhere. So he's talking about these mystery schools are the founder of all of that. Mm-hmm. And the serpent is the symbol in, in most cultures uh, with, the, with the priest class, the symbol of wisdom. Or the intellect. Okay, now let's continue with another. And, co- and I might add that, yeah. that in the ancient mysteries and in the ancient societies, those who were the keepers or the guardians of the secrets of the ages, the highest initiates, wore the symbol of the serpent on their forehead. Yes. Well, you can see that in the Egyptian hieroglyphics. That's that correct. And you only see it that, but you see it. We were talking a, a few minutes ago during one of the breaks about the uh, of the head of Medusa, mm-hmm. uh, crowned with the serpents, and uh, and I'm checking on that to find out. But you find this serpent worship everywhere. It's everywhere around the world. It is a concealed worship of Lucifer called the ancient mystery religion, worldwide, 6,000 years old in every culture. This now continues on the uh, book entitled Externalization of the Hierarchy, written by Alice Bailey. She talks about the three great planetary centers. I'll just read the cover the two, and then the third is the most important. She talks about Shambhala, the holy city, the hierarchy, meaning the New Jerusalem, and number three, humanity, and our ruler will become Lucifer, son of the morning, the prodigal son. And there we have once again an admission that Lucifer is going to rule this world. Uh, I'll go back to the one we have over there. Uh, we go down as well, and these next three. We jumped ahead to cover a few of these comics quotes on this one. Uh, here's a quote, a mission by Albert Pike, that they, that they trace their history back. This is on page 624 of Moore's Dogma. Masonry is identical with the ancient mysteries, and we certainly have seen what the ancient mysteries were. Yes. Uh, the, the religious worship of Lucifer worldwide. Uh, we've read these quotes here. Isn't it funny that they keep talking about the light, and they need the light, and they're giving the light, and they're bringing the light into the world, but they keep even their own members in total darkness. Well, that's well, they, that's intentional. That's true. They do indeed teach it. Those the next few quotes I've got to show you that's true. The average Mason who's listening right now has no idea what we're talking about. You know, this is amazing. As we go along, you're you're looking for something, and I'm thinking of it, and I talk about it, and then you quote for it. And we didn't prepare this or rehearse it or anything. Uh, it's, it's, that's that's just the way it goes. We have, in our own separate research, found the exact same keys to this mystery. That's right. Page 781, Morals and Dogma. Albert Pike says, If you reflect, my brother, you will no doubt suspect that some secret meaning was concealed in these words. And there was only, once again, one secret meaning, and that meaning was found on page 321. 
of moral murder. Here we go, continue to show you based on you're being lied to, you're being deceived, you're being concealed, a face being concealed. This is on page 218 of Morals and Dogma, written by Albert Pike. It is for each individual Mason to discover the secret, the secret, once again, the secret of Masonry, by reflection upon its symbols in a wise consideration and analysis of what is said and done in the work. Masonry does not inculcate her truth, meaning I don't indoctrinate. She states them once and briefly, or hints them, perhaps darkly, or interposes a cloud between them and eyes that should be dazzled by them. Seek, and ye shall find knowledge and truth. And then on page 219, he continues with that thought. He says, This right, meaning the Scottish right, raises a corner of the veil, considering the mysteries, even in the degree of a prince, for it there declares that masonry is a worship. And the veil is the veil of Isis. Exactly. Or the veil of the concealed mysteries. In other words, we're, we're, we're veiling the truth from you. Well, that is, that is the symbol. That's what Isis symbolizes. Mm-hmm. Remember, Osiris is the doctrine, Isis is the church. The veil is what hides the mystery behind which is Lucifer. Mm-hmm. And remember what was written on the scale, No man hath me ever unveiled. Hmm. Oh, I see. Okay, here we go once again. This is now in the Lost Keys of Freemasonry to show the Mason that he's being lied to as well. Here he says, The initiated brother realizes on page uh, 13 and 14 of the Lost Keys of Freemasonry, Masonry, written by Albert, I'm sorry, by uh, Manny P. Hall. The initiated brother realizes that his so called symbols and rituals are merely blinds fabricated by the wise to perpetuate ideas incomprehensible to the average individual. He also realizes that few Masons of today know or appreciate the mystic meaning concealed within these rituals. Mason, he's talking to you. You are being lied to. The truth is being concealed from you. It's time for you to figure that out and then get out. I, uh, uh, Bill, I'm going to have to ask you to help me with this one. I'm going to show you a, a drawing that's on page 252 of Morals Dogma. I know you've seen this drawing as well, but I hope you'll confirm for me that I'm showing you a picture of what appears to be two kings uh, in a circle. This is on page 252 of Rex Hutchins' book entitled The More... Uh, yeah, uh, Rich hey, we just did a program on this not too long ago. The circle is the snake eating its tail, which symbolizes the magic circle or the temple of the sun, which you can see in Stonehenge. It also makes up the outer courtyard of the of the uh, of Vatican. Inside, you can see the symbol of the generative force, the androgynous god, the, the symbols for male and female, uh, the uh, the triangle and the inverted triangle. It also signifies uh, as above, so below. The microcosm, uh, which is man, is compared to the universe. Um, and, and well, go ahead, take it from there. <laughs> and, and at the bottom, you can see. The actual symbol of the, uh, the, uh, the the pyramid, the temple of initiation, with the capstone in place without the eye, it is in fact a symbol of the rising sun, the new world order coming into being. Go ahead, take it from there. Well, I just here's a generative force, the penis of Osiris. Uh, I could go on and on and on. This thing is full of symbology. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing I wanted to bring to your attention, just we're talking here about concealing evidence. Uh, this is a it's really an oblong shape, not a circle, but it does have a snake biting its own. Around, as Bill uh, correctly pointed mm-hmm. out. But it's the same symbol. There appears to be a, a drawing of a king or a god who's wearing a crown, and then there seems to be a reflection of him in the bottom part of the drawing. It's cut in half. That's correct. Right. That's, that's Isis and Osiris. Uh, Osiris is the symbol of the sun. Isis is the symbol of the water or the Nile. That's why everywhere that you see an obelisk, you'll see a reflective pool. It is... Osiris, the doctrine, Isis, the church, reflecting the pure light of knowledge of her master. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is also signifies the androgynous god, the male-female, the positive, the negative, uh, the old uh, oriental thing of the, uh, the yin and the yang, mm-hmm. and uh, so on and so forth. It, 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 uh, well, in this drawing on page 252, we don't have to get into all that. Yeah, I agree with you what you're saying. The purpose I'm bringing this to your attention for is just to show you that most Masons don't understand what this means. They don't understand anything. They're listening to this program with their jaw dropped down on their chest saying, how come I never heard those people? Now, here we've got what appears to be a king on the top part and his re- 
satisfaction on the bottom part. Everything is the exact opposite. The king looks on the top part. He's looking straight at you with his uh, with his eyes. He seems to be a rather old or aged man with a long, scraggy beard. He's looking straight at you. Uh, his shirt is black. He's got a wrapping around his uh, his uh, neck. When you flip the picture over and look at the, his supposed reflection, which means you've actually got to turn it, mm -hmm. it is not the reflection of the same king. It's a demon. And this is what we're telling you about the Masons. They are acknowledging that we don't examine the truth, that they conceal the truth in mysteries. The person who sees this picture has actually got to flip it around to see it. And most Masons would probably see this and not even ignore it. Mm -hmm. The truth of what this is telling you is that this is the, the truth of the Masonic Lodge. We see the King and the God, and it's really not him at all. It's the demon. And that's what this picture shows. It's on page 252 of the uh, Bridge to Life. Here's another quote from the externalization of the hierarchy by uh, Alice Bailey. She says, The new era is coming. The new ideals, the new civilization, the new modes of life, of education, of religious presentation, and of government are slowly precipitating and not, cons oh, wait a minute, not can stop them. They can, however, be delayed by the reactionary types of people. I think <laughs> only this is the way they talking about me. Yes. <laughs> so they could be delayed by the reactionary types of people, by the ultra-conservative and closed minds. They're the ones who could, who can, and do hold back the hour of liberation. Do you know what they base that upon? They base it upon the human failing, the flaw in all of us, that everybody wants a life of extreme pleasure for every moment, and they misinterpret pleasure, they really believe that pleasure is happiness, and that's not the case at all. Okay, let's continue with this thought that this new world order is coming. These are, as I said, once again, pretty random, but here's a quote from uh, uh, Benjamin Cream in his book entitled the, the Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom. It's on page 184. Here's what we saw. He's asking the question, and the interviewer is asking Mr. Cream the question, and Mr. Cream responds. The question is, what about the breakdown of family life? So Mr. Cream, this new age expert, is now going to speak on that subject. He says, everything is breaking down. Oh, there goes the bull lightning again. All the old institutions and the family is also one of the institutions are breaking down. The new time is to do with the restructuring of our relationships, the extending of our allegiance and our identification from the family to a larger group, from the larger group to the community, from the community to the community of nations. It is always a greater and greater expansion of identification. It is relatively easy to love one's family, well easier to love one's family than to love the world. What he's saying is that the destruction of the family is all being planned. Absolutely. It's not by accident. They're out to destroy the family so we can turn our allegiance to the world, the love of the world and the, the world community of the family. So what is the love of the world? Go ahead. That, that the love of the world is the material side of the human nature and not the spiritual side at all. It is, what he's describing there, is a communism where everything belongs to everyone and the sacrifice of the individual is made for the good of the many. Mm -hmm. Where in this country it was founded upon the precept, the principle, the ideal, that the individual is important and unless we protect the rights of the individual, the many will suffer. Exactly. You don't protect my right as an individual. You don't have the right. You do yours. That's That's correct. It is a Version of everything that is right. Okay. And that's exactly what they are. They are a perversion. Benjamin Cream goes on to, in his book uh, called The Reappearance of the Christ. He says, The new religion will manifest, for instance, through organizations like Masonry. In Freemasonry is embedded the core of the secret heart of the occult mysteries. What is the core of the secret heart of the occult mysteries? The worship of Lucifer. Of Lucifer. Right. By the way, God, I want to make this so that people can, can walk away with one sentence. You and I are exposing an ancient worship of Lucifer that's 6,000 years old. That's correct. Yeah. It's been concealed from us, and it's involved in every aspect of our life, including the Masonic Lodge. The Masonic calendar begins in 4000 B.C. and ends in 2000 A.D. It begins when Lucifer fell to this earth and took the rulership of the material world and ends, according to them, when Lucifer will win the battle against God and appear as the 
as the ruler of the heavens for all mankind to see, and that will be the beginning of their new world order. And that is supposed to occur in the year 2000. We won't get into what that means, but I just want to bring that home because you were talking about the 6,000 years uh, age of this religion, and that's it's all based upon the calendar. Now, we know, Bill, that, that the falling of the Iron Curtain was not planned, right? That was an act of uh, coincidence, right? <laughs> the, the fact that someday the United States and Soviet Union might merge together, that's not planned. It's all coincidence. I want to read going back to Alice Bailey again. We believe she wrote in the 1920s. She said this, Great Britain, the United States of America, and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, meaning the USSR, are working out the principle of federation, of relation, and of the fusion of bodies in the concentrated holes. That's correct. That's and 70 that, years old. That's right. This is not something new that George Bush thought of. Not something new at all. In fact, the, 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 the Bolshevik revolution was financed and created by people in New York and London. Yeah. Here's another quote from uh, Alice Bailey. She said, the ideal of this new world order is divorce from all nationalistic concepts and aspirations. That's right. And you and I say, oh, no, it can't happen here. There is no one world government coming. We just read it from 1920. Well, on Monday night, they, they heard me read newspaper articles verbatim describing the new world order that was coming. And these newspaper articles were printed in 1942, 1943, even before the war was over, before the United Nations was even thought of or formed. They were talking about the United Nations that had already been formed in secret. That's right. Okay, once again, uh, Benjamin Cream, The Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom, page 69. Now, let, let's make a clarification here. When they talk about Christ, it's not the Christ that we talk about. No, but that's, but that, that's a good point. But let's talk about that. Let's make sure that these people understand. When Benjamin Cream talks about, in his book, The Reappearance of the Christ, he's not talking about the return of Jesus. That's the right. one that's prophesied in the Bible. Their Christ is an ascended man. Master, mean Jesus. Nothing to do with the Christ of the Bible. Actually, they take it farther than that. It's not even an ascended master or a person. It's an office that can be held by anyone. Okay. And in fact, they teach in the New Age that you too can become Christed. Yeah. You can become a Christ. Well, what he's saying, though, is that I understand. I want the Christians to feel that we're promoting that Benjamin Cruz oh, says they know, that. They know what we're talking about. <laughs> okay, here we go now. This is the New World Order, according to Benjamin Green, the New Ager. For the poor, undernourished, and exploited masses of the world, the return of the Christ and hierarchy, once again, notice he's not coming back by himself, will be the beginning of true living. For the first time in recorded history, the produce of the world will be shared among all men. For the advanced developed nations of the West, that third of the world, which today grabs, exploits, and wastes most of the food, raw materials, and energy of the world, a new experience, the wilderness experience, will become necessary. We will have to learn to live more simply. Now this is the this is the age old dream of communism that they've proven to themselves over and over again doesn't work, but they will let go of it. Why? Why do they cling to this failed idea that everywhere it's ever been tried is just crumbled in front of their faces? It doesn't work. What makes them cling to this silly uh, philosophy? No way to answer that as we ask them, but let's just go. And, 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 and there's something else too. When he makes that statement, he doesn't mention that it is them who have kept the people poor exactly. and who have exploited them throughout history. See, that's what he's saying. He's saying it's the, he's not saying that. I agree with and then they use the, the, the condition that, that they brought about as justification for the enslavement of humanity in the future. What he's saying here is that the West, we have exploited and wasted and grabbed the wealth of the world. And the solution to that is, as Karl Marx wrote, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. By the way, a new Marxist just said that a couple of months ago. His name is Bill Clinton. That's right. <laughs> what, what, what did Bill Clinton say? We're going to tax the rich to share the cost of the burdens. The middle class will not to pay these taxes. We're yeah. going to take from the rich to give to the poor. Mm -hmm. That's called Marxist communism. Yeah. It's not Americanism. It's not moral. It's not constitutional. It is Bill Clinton. And where did Clinton get the idea from? From Karl Marx who wrote about it. And now we've got even uh, Benjamin Cream saying the same thing. 
Well, I hate to cut you off, Ralph, but this is a good time to do it. It's time for our break. Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back after this very, very short pause. Well, I know that many of you are sitting out there, and you know what I'm going to say, and you still haven't called Swiss America Trading yet. What's holding you up? How can you look your family in the eye and tell them that you've got your investments in paper assets? What's the matter with you? Don't you learn from history? Now, for those of you who have already made your inquiries and made your decisions, I'm not talking to you. You go about your business. However, those of you who have not called Swiss American Trading yet need to get up right now, go to your phone, because there's going to be a little music here. I'm deciding what it's going to be yet, but you're going to get some music before we go back to the rest of the program. And that will give you some time to call Swiss American Trading and leave your phone number and your name and address so that they can send you information and somebody can call you and talk to you about the investments that they have that can help you save your assets against the coming economic trauma. And all of us have worked pretty hard throughout our life, and it's pretty devastating to see someone who has literally lost everything. Now, if you want to see what you're facing, folks, look at those people who have just experienced the floods in the Mississippi Valley, up along the Missouri River, the droughts in the southern states and some of the other states in the Midwest. These people have lost everything. Now, if you don't want to find yourself in the same situation, you need to do something right now to protect your assets against what's coming. The best, the best protection throughout the history of the world has been precious metals in its various forms. Some forms are better than others. That's why you need to talk to the experts at Swiss America Trading. Some of you may want to get into high-priced numismatic coins, a coin where there is a $50 by weight of measure value of gold in the coin, and you might pay three, dollars $4,000 for that coin. Now, I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm telling you that in our research, we found that against what's coming in the future, a total and complete economic collapse, there's not going to be too many people sitting around collecting coins that are going to give you what you think a coin like that is worth. So call Swiss America Trading right now and talk to the experts there. Ask them some good, hard questions. Ask them to tell you about all of their different forms of investment that will protect your assets against inflation, depression, all of the things that we know may be coming in the future. And do it now. And for those of you who say inflation, depression, those are two opposite ends of the stick, you're absolutely right. But we're going to face... We're going to face... Right now, inflation of the dollar, and it's going to be a tremendous amount of inflation. And where do I get this? From the mouth of Mr. Greenspan himself on C-SPAN not too long ago. Following that, we're expecting a complete collapse, total depression of the monetary system in this country and around the world. We've covered this many times and many hours of the hour of the time. The only protection that you have is in hard assets. Non-confiscatable, non-reportable hard assets. Call now. Swiss America Trading, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Don't procrastinate. Don't wait until it's too late. I don't want to see you sitting on the corner crying because you've lost everything that you worked all your life for. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. For the first 200 callers, you'll receive Harry Figgy's report entitled, Tackle the Debt. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. While you're at it, mention my name, William Cooper. Tell them how much you appreciate their sponsoring the hour of the time, and you'll receive a free newsletter on protecting your future. Call now 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. By protecting your future, you'll be protecting the future of this program, the hour of the time, and freedom for the world. So call now, folks. Do it right now. 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. And you'll be glad 
that you did. Ralph, where did we leave off? <laughs> right in the middle of this thing, Bill, I believe. I think it might be good now to, uh, for those of the, uh, the audience that uh, they are meat eaters, uh, they may not enjoy this particular quote out of the reappearance of the Christ and the Master of the Risen by Benjamin Cream. Uh, that those are the days of eating meat are changing. It says, in every day, it's on page 193 of his book. I got the level of problems. Can you scoot your chair up oh, to the mic? There you go. Okay, inevitably, out of this change will come generally a vegetarian diet for mankind. This will be the norm. At some point along that evolutionary path, vegetarianism does become necessary. Just about two weeks ago here uh, in Tucson, not here in Tucson, but in Tucson, I saw a couple of young people standing in front of a, a hamburger stand with a sign saying, don't eat meat. It's already started. They're already starting to pressure us, and we can't eat these living things that belong to the uh, gay, uh, the, uh, the earth goddess. It's gone farther than that. They're trying to destroy the cattle industry by driving them off of the, the grazing land that they've traditionally uh, been able to use. And uh, this has been in the works for a long time. Of course, they've got their legal uh, uh, associations, and they're fighting back. And so far, they're holding their own. Um, but let's, let's continue. Okay. This is from the, uh, from, uh, the book entitled The, uh, the Bridge to Light by Rex, Hurst, uh, Rex Hutchins. He says this on uh, page 96. If perfection is not attainable, for what does the Mason strive? You know, he can become perfect inside the Masonic Lodge. Did you know that? <laughs> well, I haven't met anybody in my whole life who was perfect. And I'll tell you something, the biggest crooks that I've ever met in my life were Freemasons, are Freemasons. <laughs> and if they continue to believe and act like they are, then they will continue to be the biggest crooks and the most despicable characters uh, in the history of the world. Okay, Manny Palmer Hall, in his book entitled The Secret Destiny of America, talks about this conspiracy on page 23. He said, years of research has convinced me that there exists in the world today and has existed for thousands of years a body of enlightened humans united in what might be termed an order of the quest. It is composed of those whose intellectual and spiritual perceptions have revealed to them that civilization has a secret destiny. Secret, I say, because this high purpose is not realized by the many. Does Mr. Manly P. Hall believe there's a conspiracy? Of course he does. It's called the Order of the Quest. He went on to say on page 134 that Ben Franklin spoke for the Order of the Quest, and most of the men who worked with him in the early days of the American Revolution were also members. I know you talked about that on the uh, on the program, Bill. Yeah, you. quite a bit. I've come under a lot of flack, a lot of fire from a lot of people when I dare to say that our forefathers belonged to this secret organization and did not really establish this country to set man free or to give us uh, the best nation in the world. In fact, they established it as a great experiment. One of the purposes of the United States of America was to topple the crown heads of Europe from their thrones, and the second was to establish in the future that man could not rule himself, would contract away his rights for some benefits from the state, and would give up his responsibilities and, in fact, revert back to a state of uh, indenturedness or slavery. And that's exactly what's happened. And our forefathers all knew this mm -hmm. and talked about it and discussed it in their writings and, 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 and everything. Well, they did it in a concealed way, of course, <coughs> because we, the uh, average Americans, believe that the that the uh, founding fathers were god fears in the belief in the God of the Bible. And, uh, yet well, that's only because we were taught. When, yeah. when you really look into it, you find out that they weren't at all. Okay, Lord Matre is coming, and according to Benjamin Cream, his past, on page 37 of his book, The Re Reappearance of the Masters, of the Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters, he said, His task and that of his disciples, the Masters of the Wisdom, will be to inaugurate the Age of Reason. Um, uh, Albert Pike wrote, Masonry propagates no creed except its own most simple and sublime one, that universal re religion taught by nature and by reason. He said that on page, uh, I don't have the page marked right now, there's one on page 737, to believe in the reason of God and in the God of reason is to make atheism impossible. The absolute is reason. He said this on page 810. Human reason leaps into the throne of God and waves her torch over the ruins of the universe. Again, what book was that? Well, this particular one is on page 810 of Morals and Dogma. Thank you. Notice what he's saying here, Bill, that the God of the universe has messed it up. 
and that reason will leap into the throne of God and wave her torch over the ruins of the universe. That's right. So what he's saying is that the victory belongs to Lucifer. And he said that over and over again inside his book. Uh, here's the uh, uh, page 720, 773 of Morals and Dogma. The philosophical goal in religion is the absolute and supreme reason, invisible nature, the sun. It is for this that the pursuit of the great work is called the search for the absolute, and the work itself, the work of the sun. Here's an interesting thought. The sun spelled S-U-N, not S-O-N, as some of you may be out there thinking. And it's also spelled with a capital S. That's right. They're, they're, they're calling the sun, what we see in the sky, a god. It's the god known as the sun. Yeah, they're looking for another one to come along. Here's another quote from Albert Pike in his book called Legenda, I guess. Legenda, I don't know how to pronounce that. Legenda. Legenda. He says this on page 168, 169. Albert Pike wrote, Men are good. Evil institutions alone have made them bad, and it is the duty of masonry and of every knight to lead to aid in leading them back to the truth. That's knight spelled K N I G H T. Knight, that's right. With the capital K meaning the knight's temper, the mason. Notice what he's saying is that the that religion has messed men up, and masonry will lead us back to the truth, which is the belief in mystery. Here's another quote on page 817 to show, him that, to show the world that he does indeed believe that the world, uh, we the people, will demand that the Masons rule us. He said this, page 817, the world will soon come to us for its sovereigns and products. We shall constitute the equilibrium of the universe and be rulers over the masters of the world. Yep, that's right. So all you guys have been wanting both rights to be president, you might get your wish come true, and then you're going you're gonna to wish you had another wish, I'll guarantee you that. Now, for those in the world who believe, in the Masonic world, that the God that they worship inside the lodge is the God of the Bible, I'm going to prove that's not true from the words of the Morals of Dogma. Right. This particular quote is on page 254. He's talking about the Sun God, capital S, U-N, capital G, G-O-D. The sun god created nothing. Now, the god that I believe... Go ahead. The god that I believe in... I'm sorry, you switched something here. The god that I believe in created the universe. The master creator. Uh -huh. The master builder was the god of the Bible. So, they're saying he's not the god of the Bible because this god that they worship inside the lodge created nothing. N-O-T-H-I-N-G. Here's another quote from page 281 about the same God. The supreme being of the Egyptians was Amon, the secret and concealed God. He creates nothing. So the sun God is not a creator God. Now let's take one last thought. Now this is my view, not to something that's been in the, in the literature of the Masonic Lodge. They call their God inside the Lodge the grand or the great architect of the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, the, an architect does not create out of nothing. An architect creates out of something. That's right. So something had to be there before the architect could use it to build with. Mm -hmm. So when they call their God the great architect, they're admitting he's not the creator God of the universe. Because if they did, they'd call him the creator God. Now, let me and tell you something else that I've learned, and, and this, this is right in line with what you're saying. What I've learned is that they call him amongst themselves in the utmost secret. They call him the destroyer. Destroyer, okay. What he creates is chaos. Okay. And from out of chaos comes order. And this is the motto of the 33rd degree of Freemasonry, Ordo Ab Chaos. It's also on the 32nd degree of the, the, the acknowledgement is becoming a 32nd degree. That's right. Okay, back to Morals and Dogma, uh, page 366. Uh, Albert Pike wrote, Our lodges are said to be due east and west because the master represents the rising sun. 6,000 years of worship of the sun uh, is worldwide. It's, um, it's uh, universal and it's uh, also universal and worldwide and it's uh, through all cultures. Okay, on page 592, this is very, very revealing. Please pay attention, Masons. This might startle you. To all Masons, the north, capital N north, it's the direction known as the north, has immemorially been the place of darkness, and of the great lights of the lodge, none is in the north. 
the reason for that is mentioned in the New in the Old Testament because the north is where the Creator God lives. His mountain, his temple, is in the north. His throne is in the north. And here we have an admission that the, the north is in the lodge, the place of the darkness, which means that they are, as we've always seen, they've admitted that the God of the Bible is the God of darkness. Now we know that that's where he has his throne, according to the Bible in the north, and that's where they keep none of their lives. Thousands of years ago, on page 77 of Moral's Dogma, men worshipped the sun. Originally, they looked beyond the orb to the invisible God. They personify him as Brahma, Amun, Osiris, Bel, Adonis, Malkart, Mithras, and Apollo. So here we see that once why that worldwide uh, universal belief in the sun god Lucifer. Uh, let's see. That one's not necessary. Oh, here's an interesting quote from uh, Alice Bailey, who wrote this in the 20s. I guess uh, she, uh, maybe she would have this afterwards because she talks about the United Nations through which the hierarchy has been working. She said that on page 481 of the externalization hierarchy. The United Nations fighting for the forces of life, capital L life, on behalf of, United, uh, uh, on behalf of human freedom. Well, they have a meditation room at the United Nations which has all the symbology of the hidden mystery religion of pyramid and, and uh, the symbols are on the wall in this meditation room. And the only religion that they have recognized officially in the United Nations has been the religion promoted by the loosest trust, which is theosophy. Yes, that's correct. Right. Okay, now, for those who say, no, no, Rob, you can't be right, because we know that the God of the Bible is going to conquer everything. Let me tell you what they say in their own literature. I'm going to give you two quotes, actually three quotes, two of which are from ben uh, Alice Bailey in her book, this one's on page 689 of the externalization hierarchy. She says, these forces of evil face sure defeat. And she's talking about the forces of evil, meaning the uh, creator God in his book, uh, in Christianity. Then on page 275 of Morals and Dogma, Albert Pike spoke to the same issue. He said, light, capital L, light, will finally overcome darkness, good conquer evil. When he means light, he means Lucifer. Well, everything when they talk about it, it's like looking in, 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 through a looking in a mirror. Everything is backwards. And when they talk about the light, they really mean the darkness. When they talk about the darkness, they really mean the light. When they talk about the enemy, they're talking about Christianity, the God of the Bible. They're talking about the God of the Prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. They're talking about uh, all of the traditional uh, gods that, that we have followed and looked to. They talk about the scripture. In fact, ben, uh, Thomas, Jeff, talking about our forefathers, Thomas Jefferson was known for carrying passages and pages out of the Bible and throwing them away because he didn't like them. That's right. and, <laughs> and this is no joke. I mean, you can find this for yourself. But they actually hate Christians, don't they? That's true. And what we saw happen in Waco, Texas, is, is like a, a walk in the park by a Sunday school class uh, in, in light of what they wish that they could do to Christians. Well, if, if, if you wouldn't mind, let's spend a minute on that. Let's talk about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, in my book, The Unseen Hand, I get into the evidence that those bombs, the atomic bombs dropped on those two cities, did not have to be dropped at all. That's correct. Right. They were dropped on a, on a nation that wanted to surrender, and Harry Truman and Franklin Roosevelt, who died about this very same time, both knew that. And that Japan had already sued for peace, and their only condition was that they did not want the emperor thrown in jail or, or prosecuted or hurt in any way, mm -hmm. that they were willing to allow the emperor to give up his power, but they wanted the emperor to be preserved as the, as the, uh, the, the symbolic head of Japan. And we said, no, unconditional surrender. We dropped the bombs, and then we did the exact same thing that they asked for to begin with. Mm -hmm. Well, let's continue with that thought about, about the dropping of the bombs. Those bombs were dropped on Christians. Hiroshima and Nagasaki had the highest percentage of Christians in Japan. That's correct. After the bombs were dropped. that's not known by people. In, in my video, I'm going to show you an article that was published in our own local newspaper that confirmed that. Uh, associated Press article about the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. They were, in fact, the oldest and largest centers of Christianity in the entire nation of Japan. And after the bombs were dropped on Christians, Harry Truman became a 33rd degree Mason. He was not at the time the bombs were dropped. 
Well, I don't know if he was or not, but I do know that he was a Freemason of a high degree, and he had been, in fact, the Grand Master of his lodge in the state of Missouri. I show a picture in my video of him in his Masonic attire, but I'm telling you, he did not become a 33rd. Well, I'm not arguing. I just made a statement I didn't know that. I, I knew that he was a high degree. He dropped the bombs on the Christians, and then Harry King became a 33rd degree Mason. And I do know that uh, he was, in fact, before he died, a 33rd. Yes. Here we go, page 216, another quote from Benjamin Cream about who's going to win this battle between light and darkness. He talks about the victory of the forces of light. These people believe they're going to win. Here's another quote, this is from Alice Bailey about the same thing. The rule, end the rule of evil and bring war to an end through the victory of the forces of light recognized and aided by humanity. Just so you know, I, we've got about, you've got five minutes exactly. Now let's do this. Uh, let me see if I can find There was one more. I guess that's about it. I think that's probably enough. Uh, uh, these all these others. Uh, yeah, we should, well, let's, do this. let's spend a few minutes on this book by, and then we'll end with the, if you want to mention my catalog, just to get that out so that people are aware of what they can do to read and study about this. Okay. This is a book written by Terry Cole Whitaker. We'll just go with this as long as we have, Bill. And then, uh, uh, Whitaker. Do you know her? Do you know of her? I know of her. I've seen her on television. I know what she was teaching. And uh, go ahead. Well, she's written a book entitled The Inner Path from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be by Terry Cole Whitaker. We're going to read some of these quotes just at random from one page to another, and then when we run out of time, we'll just stop. She said this, This is the age, this is the time of awakening, this is the time of the light, capital L light. Now, when I speak about the Christ, do not confuse it with Christianity, okay, she says. She says, Others are right to live, others are right to live as they choose. As they choose. There is no one single right way and no one single truth. Everybody's truth is right for them. So here's this woman by situation ethics, the same thing taught by the Masons, taught by the New Age religion. This is what makes millionaires. If I wanted to be a millionaire, I know how to do it. All I got to do is sit here at this microphone and tell people what they want to hear. Make them just feel wonderful. Promise them that they too can become a god and that they can do whatever they want uh, and uh, the money will just flow in into my hands. But I can't do that in world but that's exactly what this woman is doing, isn't it? Correct. And she goes on to page 72 and says, It's all right to do whatever brings you happiness. If you want to kill, murder, really, you know. Page 70 and 94, she says, The end of religion. There will be no more God of vengeance for us to fear, and therefore no more God-fearing people. Everyone will have found God within. Opposition and belief on page 89 will have a similar lack of effect in the new world, which so many on this planet now envision. Those who will hold on, Americans, this talking about us. Those who don't want this new world order, those who oppose such a vision, will in fact simply disappear. Just you know, when she says simply disappear, what she really means is we will be exterminated. This is this beautiful, by the way, I have to be fair, this is a very beautiful woman, as Terry Colwick's great history attracted. This mild little woman, blonde and pretty and happy, is just admitting she's going to accept murdering of millions of people who don't agree with her. She goes on to say, those who oppose such a vision will in fact simply disappear, just as those who oppose other visions and visionaries long since have returned to dust, while the visions they so vehemently attack lived on. She talks about the end of government. Everyone will govern themselves. There will be no more tyrants. <laughs> we, yeah, this, this is great. You know, folks, go outside and look at your neighbor and then come back and tell me that everybody's going to govern themselves and you're going to live with no fear. Yeah. There will be no more tyrants and no more organizations to tell us what is good for us and what is bad. We will govern ourselves, she said. The good news is that sin is nonsense, she said. Do you believe that? See, once again, there is no moral law. There is no moral absolute. There are no moral absolute. This is nothing. We all, each, each of us, decides what is right and wrong. Uh, one more quote, and I think that's probably closer yeah. to get to it. Uh, before you do that, I want to uh, make a statement. I believe sincerely within my heart that the human race must mature and that we must grow up and that we don't lead, need leaders. And I believe that there will come a day when we don't need governments. But that day is not today. And without a moral law to keep us, to keep the, the imperfections which exist in every man and every woman on this earth in check, there can never be that day. Okay. Here's the last quote we'll read, then we can summarize, and then if you want to, we'll uh, wrap up with a comment about Kayla. She wrote this on page 168. You are guiltless. None of what you have done is wrong in the highest sense. 
There is no such thing as wrong in God's world, and there is, therefore, no one who will judge you. Do you understand that? Oh, I understand it. Perfectly. He is saying that there are no moral actions. There, are, there is nothing but what you decide is right. Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And that is the law taught in morals and dogma, Albert Pike. That's right. We didn't find the quote during our, our review today in the last four or five days, but Albert Pike taught the same thing. There is no moral absolute. That's what the morals of Moral's Garden is all about. And that is the secret religion that brings forth this philosophy. Quote, A nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent. Unquote. And there's the truth about how their new world utopia will be, folks. They are, in fact, they are, in fact, parasites. They are the scum of the earth. They are the people who have brought about all the misery throughout all the history of the world through their deceit, manipulations, and lies. And they fully intend to destroy all existing religions, all nation states, and they intend to enslave the rest of humanity that do not fit in with their concepts of what you should be. And that means you and I, folks, are going to be slaves in the New World Order if we don't wise up. Now I want you to send for Ralph's catalog. And remember, every time you purchase something from Ralph's catalog, please uh, specify that you heard about this on the hour of the time, and he will share a portion of his good fortune uh, with us so that we can continue uh, the hour of the time, our research, and uh, purchase some much-needed equipment here. So send a self-addressed stamped number 10 envelope to Ralph. Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. This will be on the hotline in case you didn't get it this time around. Send it again to Ralph, Post Office Box 536, Tucson, Arizona, 85702. Mr. Ralph Epperson, thank you so much for being such a good and wonderful guest and sharing so much of the information that you've spent so many years working together with me and my audience. Thank you, Bill. Good night, and God bless you all. <laughs>